Hypocrisy. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I am your host, Nick Riccada of Riccada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. Welcome to Rumble, to anybody who is new here. And welcome, of course, to my very special guest, Mr. Stephen Gozny. It's actually Gosney, but Gosney? Like, yeah. oh, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> I Almost don't care. a flawless intro. <laughs> when I was in high school, I got called a lot worse. <laughs> no, yeah, me too, shockingly. <laughs> well, welcome to the show, sir. Uh, we've got um, so this is a little bit of an interesting uh show for me and an interesting show for you to be a guest on because um <laughs> The, the show is normally on YouTube, and obviously tonight it is, it is not, and uh, likely will not be for quite a while. But we are on Rumble, uh, and, and we'll be seeing how, how this plays out. So right. welcome well, to I, the I've chat. been watching your, and interacting with some of your guests on your chat, and they are all burning to know why, what's, who got the strike, why it's the strike, what's going on. So they don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from you. Over this way. <laughs> so um, what's going on with this YouTube strike thing? Uh, well, YouTube has this um, YouTube has a feature in it and it's called cuckoldry. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's quite the name, but let's go. Is, let's go with it. It is it tonight. <laughs> it is tonight. Uh, that's where that's where YouTube sits around and watches other people make YouTube a bunch of money. Uh, and then what they do is uh, make decisions with some loose set of terms, uh, and they make them mostly arbitrarily and often incorrectly that someone has somehow violated those terms. For me, in this case, I am not yet aware of what exactly I have done wrong. So you're on um, I, double secret probation. Yeah, th well, this is actually the norm. So uh, I, I want to bring people into this world of like YouTube content creation specifically. Mm -hmm. The normal part of this is you will receive some sort of discipline from YouTube and they won't actually tell you the exact reason. What they'll do is they'll say this particular video violates some segment of this policy. And for mine, let me pull it up. I, and I have an I have an idea of what this is about but I don't know what specific thing uh, it is. And so I was, I was talking to a friend of mine today about and trying to like explain this. This is like when you get pulled over by the cop, right? And they say, do you know why I pulled you over? Which <laughs> you're familiar with this question. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, so right now, um, YouTube asks you to, well, they give you the opportunity to appeal the thing, but they've only given you a general sort of, category of infractions that you may have may have done so in this case it was harassment threats and cyberbullying policy which covers quite a broad scope of activity none of which i have done by the way to be very clear uh, i have not harassed anyone i don't know how i could harass someone who voluntarily comes to watch my content now is this initiated by some third party like like Mr. Duncan that you had on the other day that I had the painful experience of actually <laughs> watching. Uh, it is, they do not tell us. They do not tell us. I so was an anonymous report on a vague law that, that you don't understand that you've based your business model on and you've invested time and effort to produce content and mm -hmm. they are taking, re removing your ability to earn money and do a business with no notice, no due process, nothing right the the process comes on the back end in which i will appeal to a faceless entity with no ability to actually converse or explain anything uh no ability to provide context for any particular idioms uh or or hyperbole that may have been used or jokes or anything uh and and hope that they speak english like like not to be crude but youtube fishes out part of their community guidelines enforcement to a third party or to third party companies, some of which 
I would probably say most of which are probably not based in the United States. And, uh, and so that poses a particular problem when we come to the use of the English language um, or any language, right? Like if I were reviewing Brazilian content and I just had a Portuguese dictionary, it wouldn't do me very good if there was some sort of turn of phrase that was unique. what kind of Portuguese content you're looking at. Well, only the best Portuguese <laughs> <Yeah>. content. <laughs> But but they they have this review process and then the appeal process. And so you never know who is reviewing or appealing anything. And you mentioned that it's an anonymous report. It may have been a report. I think in this case, it was likely thousands of them, um, likely thousands of reports organized by a particular fucking weirdo on uh, Twitter um, to in an effort to remove my ability to speak because they didn't like what I had to say. Now, about, you know, and I'm just acting as a consumer of this type of information and seeing the potential for Internet to be a great free speech platform where people like yourself and anybody else can can set up businesses, talk and, and generate basically compete with the lamestream media. Right. And provide alternative and thoughtful and voices or maybe not. Maybe you can be an idiot voice, but you're a voice in the Internet and people come or like it or don't. But my question is, is, and I, I'm, I've been out of civil law for way too long, and I, I know how limited the law is, but it seems to me there's some sort of contractual obligation on the part of Google or YouTube to that they, that they are giving you a promise by saying you, you get onto our platform, provide content, and that they, can, they take that business right out from under you. It seems like you've built a business on it. There's some sort of reliance interest, some sort of contractual obligation that would subject them to some sort of injunctive action, some sort of damages action. I don't know. I'm just thinking, what, what is, nope. educate me on this. I love the way you think because I think the same way the problem is, uh, and we're going to have to do a proper introduction of you in just a second. But, okay, uh, as, but everybody uh, wants to hear about what's happening <laughs> with you. So we'll get to me as I'm I'm here, you know? Right, right, right. But the, So the problem is all of this, uh, all of technology has been basically dictated by end user license agreements and uh, in terms of service, which are, terms are adhesion contracts. I mean, they can put whatever they want in piles and piles and phone books full of paper that yep. nobody reads. So the, to me, that's, there's a consumer level. Now, whether you're a consumer or not, I mean, you know, I know that's a factor because are you a business mm -hmm. or a consumer? You know, in some ways you're a consumer of this right. product that they're yeah. offering and that gives you added rights and adhesion contracts are not enforceable under certain state laws. Now, I'm not sure you're Minnesota, right? Right, but all this is under California state law, I believe. Well, even uh, more lefty and liberal and consumer friendly, I would think. <laughs> You'd think, but see, there, there's, they're also very protective of tech because tech is where all their money comes from to fund the courthouses. But, but you've got long arm jurisdiction statutes. You can sue them from wherever you want in the jurisdiction of your choice. It would seem to me, possibly. Now, I don't know if I'm the right guy to sue or or whatever. But what what I think is this: you you pointed out something very important. These are adhesion contracts. Now. Uh, for the benefit of the chat, an adhesion contract is a contract by which someone dictates one side unilaterally dictates the terms and it's a take it or leave it sort of option. You can contract with us if you do this. You don't you have maybe the illusion of negotiation, but no real negotiation power. You can't go to YouTube and say, I want a 20 percent or I want you to take 20 percent of your super chats, and not 30 percent. They just won't ever modify the contract. So right. you come up, you agree to their list and then you come in and, and they're actually kind of non-discerning on that now adhesion contracts are supposedly disfavored i mean that's what the law says that's what the supreme court says they're disfavored contracts that should always be read against the drafting sophisticated party in this case that would be youtube youtube has billions and billions of dollars everybody coming to the contract comes as they are most of them are not billionaires so they come in as unequal parties, and that's why it's supposed to be read favorably. When you combine this with there's another theory of contract law uh, that some states have, and I believe California has one. It's an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Mm -hmm. I have not seen the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing wielded as a sword against a big tech company in any meaningful capacity yet. But I am waiting for the time when some enterprising lawyer of some sort decides to go to town on this adhesion contract 
with the good faith and fair dealing clause, uh, uh, implied clause of good faith and fair dealing and says the courts need to start enforcing these contracts as if they are promises from the tech companies because they do make a promise. You can use our platform. You can participate in our service if you do these things. Then they get all of the power of enforcement. There's no arm. They, they get a unilateral decision that you, you didn't do it. There's no arbitration. There's no neutral mediator. There's nothing that is normally present in a business contract. Because if, if you're in a business contract, a traditional commercial contract, and someone uh, breaches, you don't get to just decide that they breach and stop performance. I mean, you can, but they could, in theory, sue you for your lack of performance. You have to sue them or you have to negotiate and, and do more business, which is often the proper solution. YouTube and these other tech companies don't have that. And I'm waiting to find some way in which we can uh, get that. And, and I have a feeling that when that lawsuit happens, when the right one occurs and someone actually prevails, it'll be because of good faith and fair dealing. That's what and I think. There's, I've got lots of, see, one of my problems is that I'm a creative guy. I'm very high on the creativity. You ever watch uh, Jordan Peterson on the big five personality traits? Yeah. Um, my, my main trait is I'm like 99% disagreeable. <laughs> and I know also, this one. <laughs> and I'm also 99% conscientiousness. So I'm extreme lines and conscientiousness generally determines person or political sting. So I'm very conservative, but I'm also 80% openness. So I'm, sure. I'm, I tend to be extremely creative and lawyers generally are not creative. And so I have a trouble sometimes communicating my creativity in some way that, <laughs> that is effective, right? Because I, I'm seeing all these ways that you could come at them like a declaratory judgment action an injunctive relief, something like that. Like your business is being affected now, you go for emergency injunctive relief based on something. I don't know, I'm just, and you get a forum, a friendly forum and a state forum rather than going to their palm turf. Right. Um, and you know, I'm just, I've got lots of ideas, but anyway, I'm just throwing stuff out and I, and do you have any other information for the chatters? Because they, they wanna hear from me, they don't, or they wanna hear from you, not me on this topic. So is there any other information that we haven't been disclosed that you can disclose? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll say uh, I'll say exactly. I've I've told you guys what I know about the strike. I will also say the strike was on the video that I did pull down. I had preemptively pulled it down, um, but YouTube does does actually allow strikes on videos that have been removed. If they've been uploaded to the platform, they are susceptible to strikes. I don't know. Who or if anyone has reported the stream or not, I would assume thousands have due to the uh, due to the online um, what can, target. Can, can you just generally describe that video, what it was that you, you took down and why? Do you, do you know oh, it was, uh, it was a long live stream. And, and there's a point in question where people on Twitter have suggested that I said I sh or that I said someone should be put up against the wall and shot in the head. Oh, okay, that I was the one that Duncan was complaining about for right. so long, and and you were saying that didn't happen and all right. Correct. I got you. I, and I don't know. I mean, who, yeah. to me, and there's a, there's a big free speech issue here. You know, in right. I'm a criminal lawyer. Assault. You need to have the present ability to imminent to immediately enforce that threat. So if you say. Nick, I'm gonna go kill. I'm gonna kill you right now. Well, I'm in Florida. <laughs> you know, that's right. Like, it's not a. That's not a real assault because I have no present ability to carry well, out that threat. Maybe you borrowed one of Trump's nukes, though. <laughs> <laughs> I have the nuclear codes, right? I haven't changed. They're beautiful codes. They're wonderful codes. Wonderful. Joe doesn't know what to do with them. No. Um. No. You're right. And and I want to be very clear though, because this this gets lost, and this can often get lost in the free speech. Uh, especially from a criminal defense attorney, and and I did criminal defense of terroristic threats as well. Um, I never actually made that threat though. Like I, I want to be very right. clear, it's not even close. There was never any. First of all, even the the the, if we went with the quote that they used, where it said that they should be shot in the head, that's not a threat. That's a statement. But I never said that anyone should be shot in the head because I don't actually believe in political violence in any way. Uh, I think people should be, um, you know, dealt with by proper authorities when they violate laws. But that's that's really the extent of it. Okay. Um, so that that being said, I don't know if that's actually what the strike is over. It is entirely possible 
that That's YouTube has to. That's all, what kind of what kind right. of business is this? It's, See, it's, in, a, it's you know what it is. It's a, it, it's a monopoly. And here's another idea because to me, there's treble damages in attorneys' fees and not in antitrust actions, and states have antitrust statutes. So to me, Google and YouTube is a, a trust, and ultimately, not only am I for a anti vigorous antitrust enforcement against big tech, <laughs> I'm also for. Um, and private suits, which people haven't gotten wind of. I don't know why. There's treble damages and attorney's fees. I mean, come on. That should be like flies coming to, you know the, what? I think, um, I think YouTube or Google is a scary target. Um, in the same way that I think like Amazon or Microsoft, depending on your infrastructure, can be a very scary target. Because if you think about it this way, um, what Google has done to some people, uh, never in retaliation for a lawsuit that I'm aware of, but I'm sure that that's never happened. Uh, Google has not only suspended like, you know, a YouTube account, but they will go ahead and disable a Gmail uh, account. Then they'll just delete it and remove remove someone's uh, archived Gmail account. They'll they'll they can delist their businesses. Um, from search, they can they the amount of power that Google actually has over a commercial enterprise is rather staggering. Um, right. Law well, firms, and, it's, and also I really think another if if they aren't broken up as a as a antitrust enforcement action, either private or government, I also believe the government should regulate them as a utility. Because, for example, they don't like you because you're a conservative, right? Right. So, so does that mean you can't have a phone? Can you? It, can they cut your electric off? Can they cut your water off? If they can cut you off of speaking to people and interacting with citizens, fellow citizens, that to me is a utility function, and they should be regulated just like a utility. I mean, and that, that's kind of my thoughts. I've been I've been thinking about this stuff for a lot, and I don't have any great solutions, but but this unchecked corporate power over the citizenry, you know, and one of the, we haven't talked. I guess we can go into introductions, but politically. You know, I'm very much a believer in the individual. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and uh, Republicans say, well, we're for big business or Democrats, we're for big government. I'm for none of that. I'm against <laughs> big government and big business. I'm for the individual rights. I'm called a classical liberal, the constitutional right. rights and this sort of thing. And when you've got big corporations and big entities threatening individual freedom, to me, individual freedom should govern and the entity should fail. I agree. And one of one of the one of the really good solutions I've seen posited by a, someone who's fairly smart, Clarence Thomas. Um yeah, I have lots of stories. You know, I've met him several times. Really? Yeah, yeah. He's uh he's well I, I know him actually I'm I, his I don't know. I his son is a it was a friend of mine. Oh, okay. We went to um it's kind of it's kind of complicated. My my best friend uh -huh. Who's in the Secret Service went to VMI with Jamal, and uh, they were friends. And so we used to have dinner all the time. And uh, Jamal and Sakina, it's his wife, are beautiful people. And uh, and so I got to know him, and I got to meet his dad a couple times. And and to me, that guy has had more influence on me than any other jurist. And it's mm -hmm. funny because we had Rehnquist speaking at our graduation. I don't remember anything he said, but 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 Thomas said just some some things to me that I just always resonate with me and really form my views on a lot of things and a brilliant guy great autobiography by the way um but and a funny guy very down to earth very humorous and um and so anyway yes I, i'm a big clarence thomas probably one of the greatest jurists we've had on the supreme court yes yeah, you know, he's he's phenomenal. He used to get so much flack for being quiet, which is interesting because they really got mad when he started talking. Um, <laughs> but one of one of oh, the things he did is talking in in writing, right? And he writes yeah. very very well, very well, um, very thoughtful, and he's very <laughs> interesting, interesting thinker. Yeah. And one of those interesting thoughts came up about um, about this subject actually, and and uh, I guess. Uh, in, in regards to like this section 230 and and the ability of corporations to shut people down and to censor speech, this might have been in um, I can't remember what case this was from, but it was pretty recent. And uh, what what he suggested was that there may need to be a time where we do some where we apply a standard similar to the common carrier standard. Right. And no, for sure. And common carriers is beautiful thing. 
where uh, we as a government, in exchange for some sort of uh, protection for a business, demand something from the business. We go, okay, we will protect you from defamation lawsuits. This is a common carriers, uh, or, or no, this is what they did for telegrams was we will protect you from defamation lawsuits by saying you can deliver defamatory messages. So as long as you don't know the message is particularly defamatory, you don't have actual knowledge of it. We will eliminate constructive knowledge of defamation. You would have to know this is defamatory. Typically that would mean there's a court order on this language of some sort, some sort of lawsuit that someone could provide proof. And in exchange for that, Anybody who walks through the door, you have to do business with them. You don't get to determine what speech you're sending. You transmit their speech and we will protect you from that. And the interesting thing is back in 96, we actually did that for the internet without the obligation of them to provide, uh, to provide for every customer. And that was foolish of the government, but it's easily remedied, easily remedied by any act of Congress to just go, Okay, if you want that Section 230 protection, uh, you must service all customers. And if you don't service all customers, you're not getting 230 protection, which means that you don't get to ban people for the type of speech that they post. Uh, and and that uh, outside of particularly illegal speech, child pornography, of course, we don't want people posting child pornography, even though they do on Twitter all the time. Uh, <laughs> Twitter is really? successful. Twitter's Twitter and Facebook are the two largest purveyors of child pornography outside of the FBI. Yeah, right. So, right. right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, well, um, <laughs> the FBI does it for sting operations, but oh, I mean, I... the FBI, they hand out child pornography like it's candy. It's kind of gross. It's really oh, gross. I don't know. I don't deal federal. I don't deal in uh, federal criminal law. I do state criminal law. But if you ever want to lose your soul, just uh, <laughs> like go on the sex offender registry, find someone with a federal child pornography charge or whatever, and then read the, you know, like the the affidavit. Uh, oh no, no, no! no. Believe me, stuff. I've had to believe. Oh, you me. probably had... yeah. You, I'm sure you've dealt with this a lot. Let's introduce you. Oh my God, Steve <laughs> Gosney, right? Steve God, Gosney. Yeah. Yes. You are a public defender in the most dangerous state in the world, it, according to the newspaper. <laughs> it's well, there's not. It's not too far off. We are. Uh, yes, I'm in Daytona Beach. Although I work for appeals in um, 13 counties of the fifth district, so there's five district courts in Florida. So Florida's split up into five population groups. So we have 13 counties of that. That includes Orlando. Melbourne, Seminole. Now they've just realigned coming up. This is care. Nobody cares about this, but they're, they're going to make a sixth district and I'm going to, we're going to trade Orlando for Jacksonville. So um, is that a good yeah. trade? I don't know. It's all the same <laughs> to me. I don't care. You know? It's, okay. So you, but you do public defense at the trial court level and you also do public defense appeals, which are two kind of separate things. Um, both equally important, uh, equally interesting. And, I do want to actually talk about public defense um, and, uh, and and what it means and and kind of like the system because it gets maligned a lot. Uh, public right, defenders yeah. get maligned quite a bit. And there are reasons for that that make sense. But a lot of times it's irrespective of the quality of attorney that is a public defender. A lot of the complaints come from the system and and just the amount of work, the volume of work that's there. Well, um, well, I say first of all, I'm I'm board certified criminal trial lawyer, so my I, I actually did. Here's my my legal career. I actually yeah. worked for a living before I became a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a real job, which was I was CEO of our local home builders association. So we had Volusia County Home Builders Association. So I did that, and so I worked in nonprofit association management for seven years, and then I was CEO there. So it was dealing with all our local builders and advocating. And then I went to law school at Washington and Lee in Virginia. And then, um, and then uh, let's see, then I went into private practice and I was a dirt lawyer. I did commercial litigation, civil litigation involving um, real property and probate for six years um, for the oldest firm in Florida, actually right here in DeLand. And then, um, and then I, I wasn't getting trials. I was a litigator. I'm a fighter, <laughs> I'm a disagreeable right. guy. And so I said, well, I, and I started kind of getting afraid of the courtroom. And you can't have that if you're a litigator. 
Right. So I said, well, where am I going to get trial? So I went to the state attorney's office and I did prosecution for six years. And then there was an election change and the new guy came in and decided I was incompetent. <laughs> so he he let me go. But I but thankfully, we have a good public defender. and They hired me within the week. And I went, to, I went to work for there and I was doing trials there. And then I went to appeals and I've been doing appeals for 12 years. So I kind of, but I also, I will say, even though I'm doing appeals and I'm actually recently certified capital appeals. So I do death penalty appeals also. Ooh. Um, but wait a the, minute. Are you going to get the case from my favorite Florida defendant of all time? Who's that? <laughs> that, uh, what's his name? Oh gosh. The guy who represented himself and was like screaming at the jury. Oh. Oh, I don't know. I've seen those cases. I, I, I don't really pay much attention to like news because it's like I, I you know, I go to Disney World or Fantasyland if I want to get it because my life is hell on real. <laughs> um, chat, chat. Who remembers? What's the guy's name? Uh, the, the evidence will show. He's like screaming at the jury. He's got like his hair in these like cool cone things. Somebody in the chat remembers. I, I can't, his name is eluding me. Um, he was uh, Ronnie Jackson. Is that was his name? Uh, Ronnie. Yeah. The, I don't know if it was Jackson, but um, yeah, his name was Ronnie. He was he was just he was insane, man. And he uh, he <laughs> defended himself. His he was accused of like murdering his wife and daughter, I think, and then uh, a severely disabled daughter. And then he stabbed, but did not end up killing his son um but he he claimed it was in self-defense ronnie o'neill the third there we go ronnie o'neill the third that what, was his name what county is that in that's what i need to know i don't know let me find it uh we have it we have a capital team it's um i'm part of Tampa. three we have three attorneys that do capital so um in appeals capital appeals now i also do and the other part of that is i also help out the trial division and i train I train the appellate off uh, new appellate attorneys when they come in. I put them through a boot camp, show them how to do appeals, and yeah. I also train trial attorneys. And I also second chair trials for um, when for various reasons, like if it's a new attorney or if there's a judge that needs discipline. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. And needs somebody to come in and be the jerk. I'm <laughs> perfect. And then, uh, and then, or if there's some special legal issue. And then also I do, um, and I'm trained also to do capital jury selection, which is a whole nother thing that we could talk. I got a lot, I could believe me, we could talk all night, which I'm, I'm, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to hang with you, <laughs> but I do have, you got, some, I have that? this, I brought oh. it just for you because I know what it, what a man you are. This so what is do we got? Taylor Fladgate, 10 year old Tawny Port. Oh, okay. A nice port. With this? No, I've never had that one, but I like a good port. This is the best. Now, I will tell you, this port, I'm going to, this is in your honor here. Oh, thank you. Look at that. Look at that right there. Mm. See there? It's almost chocolate. Oh, it's, this is the best stuff. I'm telling you, you got to try Taylor Flaggate 10 year old port. I will, uh, I will try and find it. I'm, I'm drinking something a little harsher. I've got Alamo Distilling Company Black Label Bourbon. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. We don't have to start, but I'm just saying I, I felt your pain. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. Mm. Ah, mm. Makes you want to smoke a cigar, but, you know, well, once we every can, 10 years, I'll smoke a cigar. Once every 10 years? Yes. Uh, I should. <laughs> Someone gave me a 22 inch cigar. <laughs> it's, like this long. it's great but no uh that would be so wait you said you're in daytona yes. area okay my my parents live over in tampa or the tampa area st pete's more precisely but popcorn uh, murder trial <laughs> yeah yes curtis reeves that was great you that's the first time you were on the show right we were talking the curtis reeves trial uh right. it was me you and uh mr bronca right well, uh, and, oh in fact i need to grift you're oh, the i grifter. do too we okay. both do well, let's grift because I, I am not a grifter. My wife, I'm such a head in the cloud. I don't know how to make money off this stuff at all. I have nothing to promote ever. <laughs> but today I do. Yes. Yes. Bronca. And I'm promoting the same exact thing you are. So okay. Well, let's do it, baby. Yeah. You want to do it? You want me to do it? Well, come on. Let's yeah, go. I want to I see grift. what you got. 
Okay, well, and I don't see I'm gonna screw it up though because I don't know how to grift. Okay, Bronca <laughs> has hired me to teach his law his criminal law class. Yes. So so I'm gonna be starting September 7th, which is my birthday. I will be doing the first class of law of self-defense law school, and I will be teaching criminal law. And it's no no BS politics, no leftist indoctrination, real criminal law, real examples. And we were going to talk about this appeal because my client has given me permission to talk about it. And it was a big victory and all. We don't have to. Oh, there it is. Look. There it oh, is. What a, you are awesome. <laughs> and I look, got it. here's how you sign up. Lawofselfdefense.com slash Nick. That's right, guys. Uh, so I, I mentioned this on the other stream, uh, the stream yesterday that was on that was on. YouTube bagpipes play in the background. Uh, I mentioned it there, but um, it's uh, every day up until the, the official launch is Saturday. Uh, but every day they're releasing another video, kind of a promotional video at lawofselfdefense.com forward slash Nick. You can check it out, get more info as things progress on Saturday. Everything goes live. You can sign up. These are, these are real courses in law as they would be taught at a law school with way less pretentiousness, way less lunacy <laughs> and, and way less politics injected into them. This is where you can go and just kind of get those fundamentals of law. If you, if you're interested in this field, you can learn them and learn them uh, in, in a way that will not cripple your, your ability to uh, produce income and will not cripple your income. Cause I don't know if you guys know this, but if you go to law school, they limit the number of hours that you can work while you're in law school too. So they make it even harder to pay for it uh, because you can't work at the same time. But with this, this is just for kind of for real people to go and get those fundamentals and learn the language of law, learn the study and practice of law in a way that is uh, that if, if you're not looking to become a lawyer, uh, you can you can kind of build your knowledge base here and it'll help you understand the legal system for yourself. It'll help you understand the legal system. If one of your friends or loved ones gets into trouble, you can say, hey, I've I've heard something about that. You probably want to seek out a lawyer or maybe, you know, uh, <laughs> give them a little bit of a heads up on what they're expecting. All of that stuff that everybody wants to do. And everybody asks me, how do I do this? Where do I get these resources here from people who aren't lame? So well, go. This is, this is also more. It's this is much more advanced than almost anything. It's a basically designed to be a real criminal law class, as first year lawyers will take. But even better, because yes. you're not going to get the politics. I'm going to teach it, and it's going to be based on practical examples. I'm focusing on the things that matter, the things that maybe matter to you as a consumer, but also. The people that are interested in trials that watch your channel that might that want to watch like criminal law trials and we're commentating on stuff, we're they're going to get real in depth on some very interesting issues. Like we've I've done a whole segment on the right to remain silent and the Fifth Amendment and Miranda with examples, of real life examples, and uh, and going through it in a methodical way in ways that I don't even reveal to anybody except our little office because it's so high top secret stuff because if i if i let out what i have to teach on this the if i could the state would get it and they'd bomb me you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. because i have a way of like here's the 13 different ways that you can lose miranda rights and i have it right. all started out well i don't put that out to most people because i don't want the state to get that and know how to beat my arguments right Right. But you're going to get it in this course. You're going to find out exactly how useless Miranda is. <laughs> it's it's so like it it is comically useless. It's comically it's great. Useless, yes, there's um, so many ways to blow it and lose it and get out of it. It's it's practically useless. As most of our rights have been whittled down to the point they're practically useless. But mm -hmm. I will give you a lot of it's it's consumer level stuff, but it's it's high level. It's not going to be. I'm not going to be treated. There's going to be a test at the end. You get a certificate. This is full 14 modules and it's going to be packed. So I, I tend to like educate with a fire hose. Yes. You know I mean, like, you know, take it as fast as you can, but it, it's great stuff. And it's all sorts of, I can talk forever and you're going to hear at least 14 modules worth in this one. <laughs> so there you go, guys. That's uh, that's, and you're just one course. I think they're launching with four, right? 
I'm, I'm not sure what else he's doing. I'm grifting on my sign up for my criminal law class. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so sign up for the criminal law class. Criminal law is the most interesting. Are you going to skimp on sexual assault? Probably. No, it'll probably, <laughs> it'll probably be focused. I, I've got a, a whole thing, a sequence going from overview, how to read a case, how to read statutes, how to apply that in real fact scenarios. Um, we're going to go through a case step by step from arrest to indictment, to mm. trial, opening, closing statements, to appeals, in, uh, this, including this Kelly case, which we're, we could talk about. Um, we're going to go through crimes of violence. We're going to go through murder. We're going to talk about the death penalty. We're going to go through, it's going to be a whole arc of fascinating topics. Now that sounds that sounds fantastic. So there you go, guys. Lawofselfdefense.com forward slash Nick. Like I said, every day, uh, this week, they're putting out another video, more information about it on Saturday. The full thing goes live. That's when enrollment is, uh, Bronca's classes tend to fill up pretty well. So make sure if you're interested in it, you check it out right away. Um, I know Steve is teaching a course. I don't know if the other courses are now or if they're coming. I do know that there's more than just criminal law that is going to be offered, but I'm not sure what the sequence of that is. Right. I'm not sure. He, I know he was looking at getting a con law professor to talk. Oh, and Andrew's going to come in on the stuff that one of the reasons he brought me in is because I'm sort of a generalist trainer on criminal law and I do trials and appeals and everything else. Um, and so he was thinking maybe I'll be more of a generalist, but when it of course comes to self-defense issues, uh, he's going to come in. In fact, we've even had a discussion because there's a, uh, a video, YouTube video about why you should never talk to the police. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and that's one of my homework assignments. And he's like, I have comments on that. So I said, well, come on in and you, you can comment on it in, on the, in the class. So, so he can already hear his now. comments. I can hear him. It's like, well, you know, most of the time, this is most right. However, time, in a right. self-defense situation, like, <laughs> no, but it's, it, that, that video you're talking about is from Rutgers University. It's a great video. Everybody should watch. It's, it's like one of the best hour and a half to two hours of video you can watch on the law that exists. But that being said, as with everything on the law, that video is incomplete. So having someone like Andrew come in and offer a little bit of clarification and explanation in his areas of expertise is going to be great. I know th this is the best part. Like Andrew is hiring the people. Andrew's a good dude. You're a good dude. You know, the people teaching this class are going to be interesting, experienced and smart people. And you know that because he said that at some point in the future, I could teach a class. And I politely said, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> what would be your area of expertise to study? <laughs> Grifting online. <laughs> Could you do Here's a, how to do, do a, YouTube law. <laughs> yeah, suing YouTube. My experience. Oh my goodness. No, I would like if I was going to teach a class, it would legitimately the the class I would probably teach would be limited to uh, Fourth Amendment specifically. I would I would teach a Fourth Amendment um, constitutional criminal procedure class probably, and I would focus heavily on uh, Fourth Amendment in the modern age. It'd be an elective. I wouldn't want to teach like. Uh, a, a general class because they're too big and I have too much ADD, but on that issue <laughs> on privacy, on how we lose privacy immediately in everything that we do on the uneven application of privacy laws. Uh, when we talk about criminal stuff and, Oh, well you talk to a bank once in your life, therefore we can get everything you've ever done financially. That's fine. But uh, in these other areas, you have privacy, no matter how many other people you rope in, it's really weird. That's the type of stuff I would want to talk about. That's kind of, that was my uh, final, my long writing project as a, as a law student. And I still have so much interest in the field of, in particular things like digital surveillance, because uh, what, what used to happen is a police officer had to follow you around or, or track you in some way. And now uh, then they had to get search warrants to put crap on your car, like a GPS tag. Now they don't even really need to do that because they have all these other systems. They have cameras just placed around town that take pictures of your license plate and make a digital ledger of where you go at what time. And, and I like to me, if I did that to someone I would be stalking them. You, you want to hear the, the latest? What I heard today, I was actually training our misdemeanor trial division today. Um, and I'm doing it today. And then next Thursday, we are doing like uh, trial boot camps, what I call them. And uh, so then, of course, all the misdemeanor attorneys come and ask me questions. And then I mm -hmm. deal with them. 
Listen to this one for the latest, greatest cutting edge of criminal law. Oh, yeah. We got a, a charge against a client uh -huh. charged with loitering and prowling. Loitering and prowling. Okay. Loitering and prowling. Based on a surveillance video. So all we have is police reviewed a surveillance video and filed charges on our client for loitering and prowling based on the surveillance video. Could you imagine DC and all the feds up there in their big FBI building looking at all the surveillance videos that they have available to it and filing loitering and prowling charges on everybody that they think is loitering and prowling? Yeah, what, what, where does it become loitering and prowling? Like uh, what, what criminal Cop point? It's loitering and prowling. He file, he sends the yeah. ticket. It, I mean, that's that's insane. So so you're watching a surveillance video. Someone happens to be in this video for 25 minutes. That's suddenly loitering. Like, we don't know what the length of time is. If it's time lapse, did they leave and come back? We have no idea. Well, they the guy working? looks suspicious. Yeah. Somebody, <laughs> yeah I'm, so I'm, I'm telling you that this is true. I mean, you know, we lot. I hear you like war stories. And I got so many. Oh, I stories. love them. Yeah. But, uh, you know. That that one was shocking to me, and we were, you know, I'd never heard of such a thing. Now, you know, in Florida, and I'm a Florida lawyer, so I have to base it on my experience of what I know. Mm -hmm. uh, if loitering and prowling requires, it's it's a misdemeanor, so it has to be an on-site arrest. Right. So the police have to be asked. So we were leveraging that for a motion to dismiss. But you know, motion to dismiss, judges don't like to weigh in on anything. Sounds no. like a jury question to me, you know? And <laughs> Wait, so the cop not being there to make the arrest as required by misdemeanor citation is a jury question, <laughs> judge? I'm just telling you, this is, <laughs> yeah. look, this is what we got to deal with in the public defender's office. Yeah, it's it's wild. Uh, and, and so that's, and this is the, guys, this is the type of stuff. Uh, whatever anyone says about public defenders, I will say this you will rarely find a more experienced trial attorney than a public defender. Um, they, oh, I, oh, I got another grift. Oh, I got another oh, grift. You come on here, you're like, oh, I don't know how to grift. I, I, got, never I had got one. Here's one, but now I've got two? Two? You are a grifter. What are we talking about here? Well, I'm just telling you, if you want to get the best training, if you're a, a, a third-year law student and you want to learn how to be a real lawyer, come to our office because we've got we've got the best office in Florida. Um, we really do. And we we um, we have the, the highest retention rate of any law office of any. We've got great administration. And we have an A team of trial lawyers and appellate lawyers that are second to none. And we provide training. We provide support, camaraderie, low pay. <laughs> 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 and uh, but it's it's a great way. You, it's fun. Misdemeanor. And I, I, my theory is that misdemeanor public defender is the best job in all of law. Yeah, it. it uh, th yeah, that one because it's not so soul crushing. Yes. Um, with, you pick uh, your cases. You get to surprise attack the state. You get to have jury trials. If you lose, it's like, oh, what's the worst that can happen? And you can try stuff, crazy stuff out. And it's it's fat funny. The facts are usually quite entertaining, right? And uh, you know, it's common people. You're defending people who really need help, and uh, who aren't monsters, right? That's that. Then that's when you kick you <laughs> out of felony, and then it's like, okay, no, welcome to reality, right? And and in felony case, a lot of felony cases of people aren't monsters. The the crazy no. thing is, even murderers, in a lot of cases, aren't monsters. You you Most will have. Yes, most of our clients and most people say, "How can you?" Work? Most people are not monsters. What they what they generally are is they're stupid, they're poor, mm -hmm. they're lower class, yeah, or and or, <laughs> or they're just um, they had a really bad fucking day. <laughs> yeah, well, it's 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 a combination of those things. I mean, we really grind the bottom end of our society. You know, yeah. if you are illiterate. And you don't have a lot of skills. You've got a mental illness. You've got a drug problem. You're in big trouble in our society because the system grinds you down. And you know, I'm I'm as I'm as hard right as they come, right? But you also, as a Christian, I believe in the the we have an obligation to protect our brothers, right? And yeah. our people within us. And you know, the person that gets nothing, the person that gets no sympathy in this society, is. A, a late middle aged white guy living on the street who's drunk and he's homeless. Nobody cares. There's no resources. There's nothing. 
That's me in 15 years. <laughs> well, there but by the <laughs> grace of God go I. I'll drink to that, right? No, but so I I've, I've said this uh I've said this similar theme before though is um you know d- first of all there's that great book three felonies a day or whatever right, that, right. Uh, which is which is true but but also like really just about everybody is a couple bad days away from real potential for life ruining decision making um often involving alcohol drugs some sort of temporary or permanent depression some sort of set of events gets you to your low, the low that you didn't think you could get to all of a sudden there you are. Now, how do you cope with those? How do you cope with those things? Lots of people drink, they'll turn to drugs, they'll turn to some sort of other illegal activity like prostitution or something to try and get away from the situation they're in. And then that brings them into various dangers where they can they can be driving a car and run over someone. They can uh, they can get involved in some sort of violent fight over a drug deal. All sorts of weird stuff happens when you get at your lowest. And the people that I've run into who have committed some pretty bad crimes, most of them, really, this is the circumstance. They got desperate. They got in a bad place. And then a thing happened. But then, I mean, there are truly horrific people as well. <laughs> like yeah, that's, let's that's not that's rule a very, them out. That's a rare exception. I mean, most yeah. of our people are, and there's a street kind of thing. I mean, like I couldn't live on a street. I wouldn't last a minute, you know, but I, I can operate in the courtroom and I can operate in society. But a lot of our clients, you know, they're, they're right on, you know, if they're living on the street, you have a lot of interaction with the police yep. and the police generate crime. I mean, they, they're like, oh, you're under arrest and you, you know, like <laughs> you're, you're interacting with the cop, you're facing going to jail. I mean, we had, I had first appearances a while back. We got, we have to cover first appearances like twice a year. Right. Hate that duty. But anyway, but it's kind of interesting because they're all lined up and they just been arrested and they're all coming down off whatever they've been doing, coming on down on. And a lot of people are just homeless, especially in Daytona. When bike week comes around or race week, they sweep the streets from the homeless people and they all get arrested for trespass. And so they're all lined up. Well, we had a guy arrested for trespass and he's in with his buddy and they're both homeless, middle-aged white guys, drunk. And um, and the guy got well. You want to plea out, plead a trespass, get five days in jail, right? Right. Just to get you through the the uh, tourist season. <laughs> and then and then his buddy comes up. He's like, he had a worse record, and so he says, I'll give you ten days in jail, right? Or actually, it was the guy got the first guy who got the ten days. So the second guy comes up. He says, Oh, my buddy got ten days. I don't want five days. I want ten days because I want to get out with my buddy. <laughs> yeah put me with him we're yeah, just, we're I mean, it's like obviously this isn't much of a deterrence <laughs> right no and, it, and it, it for a lot of people it's not a deterrence and some for some people it's an upgrade uh or or it's an option for an upgrade when they choose it right if you're on the street for a long time sometimes being in county can be kind of nice because you don't have to fight to get food right. um but yeah, yeah it's it's an interesting place to be and people should definitely again if if you're a third year law student looking to do some good uh internship check out uh check out steve's office because that's a place where you can get a lot of really good experience really quickly um and and it's you you won't get it anywhere else i mean you go to you go to a private law firm and sure there's all sorts of cool benefits to being being a private lawyer but one of the hardest nastiest parts of it is generating leads and then not just generating leads but collecting on money and if yes. you're doing petty you crime a mega grifter and i am not a grifter and i i never was i was like you're either a rainmaker or you're a worker bee that when the phone rings at 2 a.m. in the morning on sunday you're up you're working on your motion right yep and I, and I, and, or, and you're putting in 2,500 hours a year. Right. I mean, and I've never been good at either one of those things, but I, I love, I love I'm passionate and I believe in the, I believe in individual rights and yeah. in, in our system and really the fundamental flaw across the system. And let's just be honest here is the reasonableness of people across the board. And I think we have lost our society or is losing a handle on educating people to be reasonable citizens. And so that it reflects itself in juries, in state attorneys, in judges, in everybody in the system and the citizen, the people who are arrested, everybody populates the system. And all of a sudden they're ideologues or they're not rational or they're unreasonable. 
the system will not function. The system will fall apart when the citizenry gets to that level. And I, I mean, we see that a lot. And it, it, that's uh, that's what scares me. Although, you know, who knows? I'm, I'm just observing from my little keyhole, right? <laughs> which is which is sometimes all we can do. Um, let me address a question from the chat. I've seen it pop up a few times. Guys, uh, I, I'm streaming exclusively to Rumble today. Sort of a, a test slash experiment I'm doing. I will be back up on Odyssey, Rumble and Odyssey on Monday's stream. Just a reminder that tomorrow I'll be out with my family. Uh, we are going to camp for the weekend. We go every Labor Day and uh, and have a good time at, uh, at a Bible camp. And that's where we'll be. So um, tomorrow night I will not be streaming. Monday will likely be the next stream. That should be up on Rumble and Odyssey. I'm just trying a Rumble exclusive stream for the night to see how that goes, see what that looks like, and, and see kind of the, what the reaction is. But I'm hoping as the, the 14 days, the 14 days that YouTube determines I cannot work uh, progresses, that I will have uh, more and more people coming into the check out Rumble, check out Odyssey. We'll see how that goes. But for tonight, it's Rumble only um, as the the first stream of my band. I, well, I'm, last... on, I'm, a, I'm the first guy to be exclusive Rumble. You are. You well, are. I, and I, I hate Google, so I'm perfectly happy. <laughs> with that. And in Google fact, I deserves you, it. And I, you asked me about like, should you want to cancel? But I'm like, look, uh, I like doing this stuff and I'll come on again if you would have me. But the other thing is, is that I don't think that Google should enforce on who you have on your channel. You know, if I'm going to say, well, I don't want to be on here because, you know, you know, how are you going to grow a channel like Rumble if you don't actively feed it? Right. Right. Well, and that's uh, that's that's what's coming. Um, I'd been I'd been kind of holding off for various reasons on on doing Rumble stuff. And I know there's a bunch of people who are really smart. Uh, who have talked about growing a channel, but there's there's practical realities to having a channel the size that I have and then promoting alternative technologies. And let me just suggest very simply, it's always about money because my the broadcast thing that I do is a business. It's how it's my primary income. It's how I make money. It's how I feed my family. And so all of my decisions have to be around that. And so what you don't do, and I'm, I'll be very candid about all this, you don't just give to Rumble what they want unless Rumble will give you something back when you have leverage to negotiate. So, uh, but with that said, I'm also getting really fucking tired of YouTube censorships. So regardless of what happens with the YouTube strike, regardless of what happens with Rumble, there's more Rumble exclusive content coming and, uh, and less YouTube uh, prime as a primary content coming um, because uh, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of being jerked well, around. I think the closer we get to elections and the, I mean, the, the leftist censorship uh it's going up. Uh, it's going to go up. Yep. Is 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 just going. It's getting. It's rolling. It's starting to get worse and worse. And uh, that's they don't want to hear what you have to say. They want to shut you down. And conservatives, we want like we want to hear more speech. It's like okay, go watch the Biden speech. In fact, you should you should be made to watch that Biden speech, right? Where he's standing Although, in front of Marines and the, the red one he just did. Uh, I haven't I haven't watched it yet. I heard it's fucking insane yes. um and i can't wait the the one thing i am looking forward to is election season on rumble that's <laughs> what i'm really looking forward to because my election season on youtube was full of uh full of potholes right oh, be very very careful walking around you wouldn't want to bend an axle saying the wrong thing supporting the wrong person or the wrong idea and uh i'm i'm fully willing and fully ready to uh to start talking about all these weirdos uh, with 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 unhinged language, <laughs> Steve. Uh, I'm a I'm a fan of unhinged and unrestrained language. <laughs> I, I've heard this, and I've, I've watched some of your unhinged rants, and they're quite entertaining. Although <laughs> I must say that as a public servant, I can't participate quite as much in the ranting no. as you. Nor I would nor never ask really, you to. I had I a very good friend of mine who passed away. Who was um, who was he was such a good man. And I will just pass. And he said, and I will give this to you, pass this wisdom to you. And he says, um, and like I, I cursed a lot in law school in my undergrad, in my pre 
Catholic years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he would look at me, and every time he curse, he'd get pain. He'd go, oh, and then he'd say, you know, Steve, I'm very concerned. You know, you're you're cursing a lot, and I'm really concerned about your soul. Now, if I said that, I people would be like, what are you talking about? Who do you think you are telling me what to say? Right. But he had this way of being so loving. My friend Derek was such a wonderful man. And so he he told me this, and I, and so I really have tried, I really try to to because that is a flaw in my own mind. <laughs> I think it, but just because I am thinking it doesn't mean I need to say it. I'm for me, it's a feature, not a bug. Um, right. well, and, and obviously, the chats love it, and people love it, but it also might also draw strikes. So, yeah, you it's you, that the problem, and and see, my problem, and and I think I think maybe you you would have the same sort of concept is there's the reality of what is right. Like you got, if you get offensive with language, you do have to deal with potentially some fallout, but then I go to the idealist and say, but you shouldn't, right. You shouldn't ever have to deal with any, anything other than someone going, I don't want to listen to you. You're an idiot and walking away. But you believe in free speech, right? I the left very does not much believe in free speech. That's true. And That's so true. they're going to use your, cursing as a as a weapon because now it's like are you gonna, well re remember when they canceled uh, alex jones yes right? all the conservatives were like well we don't want to defend alex jones because he's a little nuts right such cowards well i got you but that's what they because they targeted him first yep. because he was he had indefensible speech are you saying it's sandy hook or something right i don't really i mean i don't know he's i've watched him i think he's entertaining sometimes he's loony sometimes he's pretty rational right that's what makes him so entertaining it's yeah. like you never you don't know what alex jones you're getting you uh it's almost like have you heard of sam hyde mm -hmm. okay so sam hyde's a, a comedian um but a, he's like Okay, I know you've seen Sam Hyde, though, even though you don't know that you have. Um, every time there's a mass shooting event, <laughs> there is a picture shared of Sam Hyde as the potential shooter, as a, as a meme. Like, everybody, they'll, like, Photoshop him in to yeah, whatever the event. I don't know how disconnected from the world that I actually am. No, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that so much so that he has been reported by mainstream networks as potential shooters, as person of interest. He's been questioned by like the FBI on these things because so many like good photoshops come in of Sam Hyde, like driving away from a shooting scene or whatever. But anyway, so he's the, the, in my opinion, the peak comedy I've ever seen from him has happened twice. The first time was he did a Ted talk and he made an absolute mockery of Ted talks. So yeah, in the, I, I need to uh, write this down. So I'm going to go back and the Sam Hyde Ted talk is one of the funniest things I've ever seen because he starts, it, it's the most ludicrous discussion ever. And everybody sitting there is like, what is happening? Like they, they don't even know what to do. Cause it's not presented as comedy. It's a Ted talk. And he's talking about like time travel and all this weird stuff. And it's great. But the second thing was just the other night. Okay. So just the other night that they do these like e-celebrity boxing, like the Jake Paul and Logan Paul right, uh, right. things. Well, KSI had a fight in uh, Europe or whatever. And so they got some other celebrities and Sam Hyde was one of the people who did a boxing event and he won. He, uh, he won his boxing event. He, he trained, he got big and jacked and stuff and he beat the other guy by knockout. Uh, it was, it was awesome. And he gets done with the fight and uh are you familiar with hassan piker or the young turks have you heard of the young turks i've heard of them i i, I know enough not to watch them right okay so the main weirdo of the young turks is chunk chank uger right, right i've heard of him yeah his, he was into it was somebody i his nephew is hassan piker and okay. and hassan's a big live streamer on twitch millions of viewers and and stuff like that he's he's huge he bought like a three million dollar house he's also a communist so it doesn't make much sense but anyway so Sam Hyde is, he, he does the fight and he's in his post fight interview. You know, he's all sweaty and, and the guy's like, so is there anybody out there? You, you know, you want to call out like anybody? And he says, yes, Hassan Piker. It's in Ireland. So he's speaking in an Irish accent. Cause that's who he is. I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to kill you. And the guy's like, or come to Los Angeles and kill you. And the guy goes in the ring. No, at his house in real life. And he says this. And he's cracking up, right? Or like everybody's cracking up. He says he's going to wear his skin like a coat, like the <laughs> Irish used to do. 
So he says, this Oh, well, now why didn't thing. he get canceled? Oh, Sam Hyde's already been canceled off of everything. Okay. Uh, he's <laughs> no, no, but the guy that the, I'm going to query is, I'm that, just, yeah, yeah, that guy's our, the left never gets canceled or demonetized, you know? Oh, no, no. The guy, the guy who, uh, the leftist guy hasn't. He, he hadn't responded or anything. Sam Hyde, though, he's already been canceled so many times off of everything. So when he says, I'm going to come kill you or whatever, it's like there's nothing to cancel. But <laughs> but uh, I think Hassan has filed a restraining order against him. But anyway, so th- but, but I want to get to the commentary that someone said. The scariest thing about Sam Hyde is when he threatens to kill you, you don't know if, if it's a joke, if he's serious, or if he'll kill you as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> But but that's uh, that's that's language and that that's the whole like place that we've gotten to now is like it's pretty obvious that what Sam Hyde was doing was a complete joke. Like he's he's not threatening on all of the world stage to go murder someone at their house in Los Angeles while speaking in an Irish accent, suggesting he's going to wear their skin like a uh, like a coat like the Irish used to do or the Celts or whatever. Um, but. But Wasn't like that guy, it, that cabbie guy, red cabbie or copper cab or something. You ever copper seen cab. Yeah. Yeah. He, there's a, there's a guy that's kind of like that. Isn't he kind of nuts? You, you're like, I'm so detached from the world. You know about copper cab. <laughs> well, I, I watch um, what's his bald and bankrupt and Harold Balder, these travel vloggers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And so that guy was on there. I'm like, who's this guy? Cause he was so angry. So I don't, yeah. that's why I know there's some, and I did have, okay. a, I have an 18 year old son too. Like, we, in fact, I was teaching, you're talking about craziness. Um, I was teaching the, the, the misdemeanor trial attorneys and somebody, uh, somebody had fed me about the Chewbacca defense on oh, South right. Park. So yeah. I brought up because there's different, like the way I try a case, this is, I don't know, just random thoughts shooting in my head, right? That's all my show is. So, <laughs> okay. Well, and so he was talking, like, I like to focus on what is the issue? The issue is duress. And so you got some cop t- talking identity. You're like, no questions, no questions, no questions, right? Until you get to the issue that you care about. Then you're like, you pound them, right? You say, that's right. the issue. I don't care about any of this other stuff. Jury, pay attention to this issue. That's my. That's the way I try a case, right? But that, that's not the only way. There's other ways. And some of them, it's called the chaos theory. It's like, throw everything mm-hmm. up there and say, oh, there's reasonable doubt everywhere. I don't know. All, all this stuff. And then there's the Chewbacca defense, which is a subset of the chaos theory, which is a South Park reference. So right. I had to watch that. I looked it up and I'm like, oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> but the, yeah, the chaos theory is is remembering that you've got jurors who are normal people who who don't care about a lot of the the nuance of law and get bored. And well, they I get, get my, my friend, um, one of our attorneys in her office, Regina, she's a master of the chaos theory. You know, she comes in and she gets emotional. She's like, what's going on? This is crazy. And, and she, when I was prosecuting, she beat me more than any other defense attorney, you know, and I'm trying to keep, <laughs> cause it's like, I'm trying to put everything together like a, like a work of art and she's throwing sand in the gears and it's just messing everything up, you know? So, and you never know jurors, some, some jurors get confused and they get like, Oh, I don't know. And you'd also, you don't want to explain away your doubt because right. some people like if I have my theory, well, they've got their own theory and it may not agree with my theory. Right. Yep. So if I'm saying this is all you need to pay attention to it's like, well, I thought I had a doubt, but he said I need to pay attention. So you could talk yourself out of a not guilty. So, uh, you know, it's, you got to know yourself and, and work what works for you. Right. Right. And that works for you. You see, that's. That's the crazy thing about uh, litigating and, and is particularly with juries is um, I was I was trying to explain this to someone. Um, I, are you familiar with the case of Lucas Gerhard up in Michigan? Nope. <laughs> OK, I know it's way out of your jurisdiction, but uh, like I so, said, I, uh, blinders. Right. So three years ago, I just had Lucas on the show um, and, and he three years ago uh, was arrested for a Snapchat picture. His Snapchat picture. Oh, wait a second. No, no, no. I did. I watched. You did a whole show on this. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done a couple of I watched of them. a few of your shows before I came on, so I get kind of get a feel for what I'm going to enter into here. Right. And I watched <laughs> that one. It was very interesting. I had a case exactly like that in Florida on appeal. Okay. Exactly like that. Yeah. It's, it's a crazy problem. I mean, he spent 82 days in jail, and then uh, the, the remainder of three years after that on an ankle bracelet – and um, w- which was just insane. And the reality of the thing is, 
it should never have gone to trial. Like it should never have gotten past a pretrial motion. Clearly, this is protected First Amendment speech. There's no imminence to the threat. There's no actual threat. He said, I'm going to bring this bad boy up to watch the snowflakes melt. By snowflakes, I mean snow. He clarifies the idiom within the actual context of the of the post. So it's like, okay, where's the terroristic threat here? Where is his threat to shoot up a school or to shoot a particular person? He doesn't deliver it to particular people. He sends it to his friends. Other people can't even see it. Um, the person who reported him actually had to take a picture of someone else's phone because because of everything. So all around, like, this is a bad terroristic threats case. However, at the time he made it or or like right around then, you've got school shootings happening. Um, and, and we you typically we have just a couple news cycles between every major shooting event. And one of them's likely to be a school shooting just seems to be how depressing our country is lately. But he goes through all of this and uh, he ended up with a great deal. Uh, what, what we call it in Minnesota is a stay for dismissal. But um, so he has basically a year of probation. He but admits we would call that a, it's a um, it's a, a, a pretrial intervention agreement. It's basically if you you comply with a contract with the state attorney's office, if you complete it successfully, they dismiss the case. Right. And that that happens a lot. And that's a great win. They should if they had ethics, they just drop it flat. They should. But, but they but that affects their crime stats. And because you're, you know, you're guilty because we don't want to have stats that look bad to us. That's the way the prosecutor's office thinks. So that's what they're doing there. I had this exact case, but my guy was convicted and was, it was PCA on appeal, meaning it was affirmed without an opinion on appeal. And the law in Florida is just like that. And the guy, all he did was post a picture of his gun and said, it's going to, we're going to have a fun day on Monday. And he posted a picture of his AR and then. He's terroristic threat. And, you know, it's now like, he's what, convicted what felon. What threat? Where's the particular nature of the threat? Who's the target? It's if crazy. People, people and, and, are so paranoid about these school shootings. But, you know, but are we really serious about it? I mean, the thing is, is that the problem is mental health. Yes. And we can't have a discussion about mental health. It's no. like we fail on that in every regards. And, uh, and like, if, if there was a guy, you know, I really sad because I wish there was a good, um, I wish there were good leftists or maybe I say liberals, good liberals on the other side. I want a functioning too, because I'm, I'm not, I'm a Republican, but I'm like, I'm a conservative. I'm really a classical liberal. Right. And I, I have a lot of friends who are, I'd say on the liberal, liberal side, right. but the people, but the problem is, is we can't have a discussion about it's like, for example, what we do about mental health and guns, because you can't trust the other side to be dealing in good faith. And that, that so we all lose because we can't have these rational discussions. And that, and they're still trying to shut us down, right? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I'm ranting. You see, you're getting me ranting. You're get fired up. Get me fired up. <laughs> Start dropping <laughs> racial slurs. No, I'm just kidding. No, don't no, do no, that. no, no, no. That. <laughs> That's a joke. Race is no. a pointless thing to talk about because we're all genetic. Look. Let's talk about trans for a second. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> well, here, here, I got a point I wanted to make about that Duncan guy that was on your show. I don't know why you put him on there, but anyway, <laughs> I do. You did it. <laughs> I made a bunch of money. <laughs> well, okay, whatever, whatever the whatever your motivations were. Here's the thing: I do, I do murders. <laughs> you know, not, not personally, but you know, right? I represent <laughs> sure. They Not dig up public. the body six months. It's been buried in the ground and there's nothing but a skeleton. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you get in the autopsy report? It was a, it was a white female. They don't say it was a trans. Right. right? They don't say it was somebody who's bisexual or polyamorphous or anything. It's a male or female because you got X way chromosomes. And when they, when you dig up the body or the archeologists dig up the body, they identify the, the, the genetics of the XY chromosomes that goes down to every cell in your body. Uh huh. Sex is 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 ingrained in every cell. If I chop off the, the private parts and give myself hormone therapy, every cell of my body will still be screaming that I'm male. Sex ingrained in every cell is actually my Tinder handle. <laughs> <laughs> No, okay. you're you're hundred percent. Right. Well, I see. I knew uh, this was coming. You see, that's, <laughs> that's why I brought out the uh, the port. No, the, you're hundred percent right, and and it's like this. This is a thing. 
this is what's so crazy because I know that the the brigade against my channel, which um is is probably the cause of this the, the most likely cause of this recent strike, is because I'm framed as anti-trans, which I'm not. I don't care what you do to your like I will disagree. Right. And and maybe like if you asked me, like, you know what? Uh like Steve, you come up to me, you like, Nick, I think I'm a woman. I'm like, eh, I had a look at you. I'm pretty sure. You're not like I'm 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 pretty, pretty convinced that you're you're a guy, but maybe you're going through something. I don't know. Maybe you got something on your mind. If you come to me for counsel. I'll give you my opinion. But like if you go, no, I am. And you go, I'm going to go do bottom surgery. I'm going to get implants. I'm going to do all this stuff because this is my best life. I'm going to go. You know what, pal? I guess like I you whatever what you're going to do is what you're going to do. That's my theory cuz like you, I'm for the little guy. Well, and I'm for uh, if you are an adult. Yes, that's the key you right there. Chop off your 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 private parts. Yeah. Right? But the problem, you know, here here's here's another problem. <laughs> I I can think of tons of them and I love we to hear. We got them. lots of problems, right? <laughs> that but that's free but but children, if you were a parent and you said you take your son. I'm gonna. I want to chop off his arm, because I've always wanted to have an armless child. Yeah, that would be child abuse, right? And and the child should be taken away from you. But yep. if you come in and say I want to chop off his balls, you should also have your child. Taken you should away also from have you. your child taken away. Yeah. You know, and your job as a parent, and I can tell you're a parent, <laughs> because <laughs> is that is to give your child the best advice you can possibly give them. Tell yeah. them right from wrong. Give them guidance. You tell somebody you love them by telling them this is right and this is wrong. And I think what you're doing is wrong. And I don't want you to do that. That's how I love you. I love you, so I'm going to show you that. If you don't love somebody, you say, eh, I don't care what you do, right? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, if if you're, if you're, we can, we can take this out of the trans context as well. And, and go to just about any life altering decision. And I'm not talking like a drug or whatever, but, but seriously, if you're, if your eight year old came up to you and said, dad, I think I need to try heroin. I go, <laughs> Whoosh, no, you don't get heroin. What's wrong with you? You have to wait till you're 18. No. I'm just <laughs> well, even if they're 18, you're a parent, you'd still say don't do of, heroin because you know the consequences. You and so, they might still do it. And they if might, they but, do but it, your job, do you, but we don't endorse it. We don't celebrate right. it. Look, I'm going to, you know, you yeah. see these lefties out in California that are bringing, I'm so happy my child is trans. It, you know, and you talk about the DSM is another issue that I, that I have a bone to pick with Duncan <laughs> is <Yeah>. that, <laughs> is that uh, he talked about the DSM four and the DSM five. Okay. The DSM four defined uh, trans transgenderism or gender dysphoria it defined it as a mental mental health issue, right? Right. They yes. took it out of the DSM five. Okay. Well, how does that work? You know what that is? That's a bunch of lefty psychiatrists sitting around a room in a committee saying, "Let's decide to take this out for political reasons and shove it down everybody's throat because we're in a position of authority and we're in a group and now we're the big organization and you got to listen to us because we're the authorities and we wrote the book." And they are corrupting mental health because the DSM. So the DSM four was wrong all this time. It was wrong. It was just incorrect. It was just incorrect. And now we have all this you, wisdom that we've derived from where? It's just a committee that voted. Could I'm, you I'm imagine? I, I really, that DSM-5 is a political document. It was not vetted. It was not done properly. There's a lot of problems with the DSM-5. Oh, no, so, I, I fully I fully agree. But um, I, I think gender dysphoria is actually still in the DSM-5 as well. Like, I think he was wrong on that point. Um, they, but, they, but, did alter, they did alter the DSM, and I, I don't delve into that. So that's mostly trial division, sex offender stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> and I stay far away from the sex offender stuff as I can. Cause I, that's why, that's why I delve in murder and death. Yeah. Because I don't like doing sex stuff. No, um, it'd be like, it's, it's crazy that, um, dealing with people who chop someone up or eat someone's face or whatever is far less soul crushing than what you deal with in sex crimes. Well, you know what it is? It makes me very sad because as a parent, you want to protect these children and they're being put yes. in a situation where they're being victimized and not protected. And so my, your parental instinct, that's part of being a human being when you have to watch videos, it's horrible because you, your natural reaction is to want to protect them. 
Um, and that's horrible. But I, I'll tell you, murder stuff, all this stuff, we talk about public defender problems. It weighs on your mind, you know, having to watch crime scene videos and stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and I don't I, I try to limit my exposure to that as much as possible because those images live in your head forever. And yep. so the less images I can put in my head like that, I mean, there are things that it, right now we're talking. I'm thinking about some images that I had to look at in murder cases that will never go away. And some of them, I mean, really make me cry. It's very sad. The victims. Now, that doesn't mean that the, the accused murderer or the actual murderer isn't entitled to the, the fair trial and right. rights. And that's our job as defense attorneys to defend them. And that doesn't mean that means put the state to their burden of proof. Make sure they have a fair trial. Give them the rights they're due. But, you know, if the process works and pe guilty people get convicted all the time, no, you know, and this is a big mistake. And I, I'm going to I'm going to lay down a marker here with you. Yeah. <laughs> get it. <laughs> is that uh, people always talk about people got off on a technicality. That never happens, at least not in Florida. Now, um, no. maybe it does in some of these crazy lefty jurisdictions where Soros prosecutors. What happens? People get convicted on technicalities all the time. Yes. All the time. And, and people don't understand. They come in, they think, oh, you're just got some magic wand and trickery and they're going to get off on technicality. Like, you know what the percentage I did a paper on this? What the percentage of winning on appeal, getting winning means some meaningful relief on appeal in Florida, in my jurisdiction is. Uh, I think you sent it to me, so I'm going to not answer. Okay, well, but let's it's, look it's at that answer. It's abysmally low. It, what What do you think? That means some relief that would be some meaningful, like a new trial, a reduction in sentence on appeal. What is the chances? Let's get let's give some let's give them some chance to come back. And oh, I got some more stuff I wrote down. Oh, I, uh, I got a good case. You like good case stories? Real quick, I, I want to complete one analogy though. Okay, go um, ahead. In in regards to the trans thing, and again, like the like the duty of a parent. Mm -hmm. Um, are you familiar with a with a with an adult film actress named Sasha Gray? She was in the news a couple years ago, like in the normal news a couple years ago. Well, she my left wife would say no. <laughs> <laughs> okay so sasha gray is an adult film actress or was an adult film actress she was in the news because she tried to be a school teacher the problem was all the dads kept showing up and recognizing her um yeah having there was a lot of parent teacher conferences <laughs> yeah and they they like they recognized her and and they would make like comments that might border on inappropriate or or whatever um because of her prior career the reason i bring this up is because if you're Sasha Gray's dad and she's 16 years old and she says, you know what, dad, I kind of want to do stripping and porn when I turn 18. Your job is to say, no, that can ruin and impact your entire life. It can have long-term consequences. You might make good money now. You might make good money you know, when you turn 18 for the, for a couple years, but eventually like you'll leave that livelihood, but it will have lasting impacts on every other decision that you make, not to mention the physiological realities of uh, something like 99% of porn actresses and actors have an STD that can be a lifelong condition. Well, the problem is, is that people like, um, the, the happiness really comes, we're lying to people. The culture lies to people and says, yes. this is the key that money is going to give you this happiness or necessarily when you're ruining the real path to happiness, which is establishing a relationship, having children, having a family, living a good ethical life, this having is a very offensive. career. <laughs> right. I mean, those are the things what matter to me is that I got a great son who's going to college. And, and that I've been a good dad and I've got a good wife and I've got a happy family. I mean, uh, those are the things that matter to me. And I got a nice base. <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> we're going to answer some of your the questions on the percentage. The actual answer is 0.6%. That's six out of a thousand. Some of them knew that because they probably have seen me talk this elder. <laughs> and of the 1,700 cases that I looked at in that paper, there was one that went from guilty to not guilty. It's it's insane how That's hard in it is year, to win on a an year appeal. block of time in 13 counties in Florida and all the appeals that we had 1700 criminal appeals in our district one went from guilty to not guilty and that was because they were convicted of a credit card theft and it was or they had a gift card and they were using a credit card and it was some credit card statute or something that was on it was overbroad 
it was kind of, it was something that they were prosecuted on the wrong statute. Now that's why the Kelly case we're talking about is a it's a huge win because this is the first case I've ever had that actually walked somebody off of out of prison. Now we've actually had one of my office mates walk somebody off death row. Wow, which was unbelievable. Florida's number two in exonerations off death row, by the way. Oh they wow, well, who's number one in exonerations? Texas. Well, they're number one in killings too. Well, okay, well we can, you know <laughs> we, we go for something. I think we're probably number one in serial killers. So. Wisconsin's giving you a run for their money for your money though. Wisconsin's yeah. got Wisconsin's got a, a crazy murder crime. Like Wisconsin's I'll put the Florida, Florida the North. against Wisconsin any day on no, I'll, I'll give it to I'll give it to Florida. I'm just saying Wisconsin is like the protege. They're like watching Florida going, Oh yeah, how do we kill people in worse ways? Yeah, well, we're a good example. You know, we had Eileen Warnos was convicted. That was in our district. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we had Gerald Stano who was who killed maybe 60 people who kills people right across. I've had four murders Just within 60. eyesight of my office in the last five years. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you should find a fact, new office. I can <laughs> see if there's a double homicide we're defending right now that I can see the crime scene from our from my office window. <laughs> Damn. Uh, our, yeah. One of our one of our appellate attorneys witnessed a murder last week. In just right down the street. He was going to the 7-Eleven to get lunch. Yeah. And there was a murder happened right in front of him. Crazy. I know. So it's... I'll put our murder rate again. See, the problem is being a defense attorney is like my wife hates it because every like, oh, that's where that double homicide happened. And this is where this happened. You know where all these crimes occurred? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, we're going to stay at this hotel. Why? Ghost hunting? We had another guy get <laughs> run over by a car in our parking lot of our office. Yeah. Anyway, was that intentional or was that accidental? Oh yeah, yeah. It was well, there's a there's a bar there's a strip club bar area near our office. And oh my god, you you work in heaven. This is amazing. No, in the <laughs> daytime it's fine. At nighttime, what it passed about nine or two o'clock in the morning, right around now, people start funneling out and they've all been drugs and high and they've had all their interactions and unsupervised adult drug interactions and yeah. they they pour onto the street and get uh, nuts. I'm trying to get more of those. I'm going to come to your area and have a bunch of unsupervised drug interactions so you can defend me. <laughs> no, no. You don't want to, if I'm your lawyer, you're in big trouble. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause you're in the appeals side. So I've already yeah, lost yeah, yeah. at that point. Um, no, it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it is something, but the thing that, the thing that annoys my wife the most is when we're sitting there watching any TV show that has any legal stuff in it. And I'm like, Nope, Nope, Nope. Nope. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't watch it, it. It's so, and there's always like, they always have these cops and they're chewing bubble gum and the guy's sitting at the table and the the defense attorney's right next to him. He's like, just say you did it. Say you did it. And the defense attorney's like, excuse me. Objection is like, shut up. Yeah. Answer the question. Right. Yeah. I'm like, what is this? This is so stupid. <laughs> But my, she uh, likes it, so I let her watch it. But um. okay, what I need to do uh, because I've been derelict in this is let me hit some of these larger uh, Rumble rants or super chats or whatever they're Bring they're called on, Rumble man. rants here. This is and fun. I'm enjoying this quite a bit. Good, good. So we're gonna hit some of these and then we'll get back. I think we should talk about the Kelly case at least a little bit because it's a fascinating case and it's not like this guy murdered a village and this defense office got him off. It's sure. this is like a practical thing that uh that you that could happen and and the the technicality is a really critical element of criminal law when it comes to negligence that was completely ignored in a major case we watched here which was the kim potter trial and um that was the the uh was police the female officer, officer that the trigger, that tried yeah. to tried to pull the taser, taser, and pulled her taser. Gun and shot. yeah yeah and i i think that her uh her that she did not rise to the level of criminal culpable negligence under the law and under the evidence provided in the same way. I don't think she's going to get relief on appeal. Cause I don't think she's going to bother with the sentencing that was given to her, but, okay. uh, but your client got an insane sentence uh, from the judge. And, and so I, I do want to talk about that. I think it's, oh, a, let's a, do super chats first. Yeah, we will. What we it's will, not so. it's called rumble. What is it called here? Rumble rants. We got to do. Oh, that I like that better actually. So Rumble Rant, uh, we've got Mike Svoboda. He says, good to see you on tonight. Sad we have to put up with protectors of evil. YouTube management goes on the wall. 
right next to all the other pedophiles and groomers. <laughs> uh, Wait a second, that's not real. <laughs> what I, I can need laugh to- doesn't mean I'm agreeing. I'm just laughing. That's all I'm saying. If I start doing more shows on Rumble, maybe I'll have maybe I'll have F slur Friday where I answer every Rumble rant with an F slur just because <laughs> I don't know. I'm so tired of this. Like I'm so tired of the censorship and the the walking on eggshells thing and people getting so damn upset over a word that has no direction. Because that's the thing that kills me. Like if uh, I I was in an argument with someone because they were mad about something I said. And, and, uh, it was, it, they called it a slur, right? It was not a popular slur, but they, they called it a slur. And so I, and I was like, what is your problem? And they're like, anyone who uses slurs is racist, bigoted, whatever. And I said, okay, so anybody who uses a slur in any context, and I'm like, so Chris Rock is a bigot. And they're like, yes. I'm like, uh, uh, and like Dave Ra- Chappelle's racism a bigot. is so overused and so beat into the ground. It's basically meaningless. And, you know, right. I don't get offended by anything. I'm I'm very, very rarely am I offended. I mean, it it takes a lot because I mean, it's like, what are you going to say? Who do you, who I know who I am. I know what I am. And it's like, I don't, you know, whatever you say, that's your opinion. That's just your opinion, man. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, dang it. You reminded me of something. I'm going to say it in just a second, but yeah. So I, I, they're like, and I'm like, try this, just go outside with no one around and say the N word, just say it. No one around, no one listened to, not pointed at anybody, just say it. And are you a big, and they're like, I would never do that. I'm like, why? Like, you you clearly don't hate. You clearly don't mean anything. There's no one around to even hear it. So just saying the word cannot, by definition, you cannot be hateful doing this. You have, like, it's just the demand, a word. The demand exceeds the supply. The demand yes. of actual racist exceeds the supply, so they have to create. And it's also an effective slur within the political society. And all the politicians want to do is divide us from each other. And, and it's a weapon that's being used against the right right now. And anybody, and, and you can dismiss, oh, you're, I don't have to listen to you because you're a whatever. I'm going to put you in that box so I don't have to actually deal with your thoughts you know, because people got mm-hmm. lazy. It's just, I've been going to offload my thinking process to a- MSNBC. Right. I, and the, But the crazy thing is, I would take people putting me in the box so long as it's not a company or a government putting me in the box. Like, if if you want to, like, tons of people every day, I'm sure. They, who's we're in a box guy? right here, actually. Like, I'm <laughs> in the box. You know? We're framed up nicely. But I'm sure people <laughs> click on my show as I'm screaming about something and they're like, I'm going to put this guy in a box of people I don't want to listen to. That's fine. That that's what we all get. Yeah, to I don't, do. I don't listen to those shows. So maybe that's correct. But, yeah. but the fact is, is that I don't want to censor them. They can say what they want over in their world. Exactly. Because somebody else wants to hear it somewhere, maybe, or nobody does. It doesn't matter. Like all of this stuff is uh, all of these people are, are predicating their decisions on what people should want to hear with no consideration of what people do want to hear. And I want to hear, I want to hear the racist rant because that tells me who they are. Exactly. And maybe it's funny. (laughs) (laughs) Chris Rock is hilarious. He is is hilarious. I mean, those guys are funny and I would hate to have a world without humor. Me too. Me too. Well, cause I, I'd be on the wall then that's wrong. Infinitely base says engagement metrics for the engagement metrics. God, thank you. Brulahim, you were painting on stream, which is precisely the type of thing Hitler would do. <laughs> Susan was justified, sir. Hey, thank yeah, you. Hitler was a painter. <laughs> he was, he painted Warhammer minis. <laughs> he also, he also liked, uh, he was also a vegetarian. Do you know that? Oh no, I didn't know that. No. See well, there? I think Hitler ate some kind of meat. And he and he also, <laughs> and then also he was uh, he did love dogs too. So anybody that loves dogs must be just like Hitler. That's true. I think that's actually true. Actual boomer says, "How about some griff for the griff lord? Let's make this a profitable move for the whiskey drinking lawyer." Hey, thank you, actual boomer. I like that idea. I fully agree with it. I endorse the chat giving me money. Go for big guy nine one one. Welcome home, Nick. Did you catch Hitler reincarnate declaration that all MAGA is clear and present danger? What a wonderful time to be alive. That's the Joe Biden speech. I did not catch it yet. Someone right. sent I've it seen, to me. Have you seen the stills though? 
I I've only seen one picture from it, and it was not like a. It was like an incidental picture. It but wasn't it's like, like a good it's one. all red, and there's Marines behind him, which is weird in a political speech. And he, it's very, it's, it's very Lenny Riefenstahl, and it's also um, I, I, I'm, it's disturbing. But he is trying to instigate a backlash. He's yes. trying to create violence because they're going to lose these elections, and he's trying to say, "See, I told you, look." Those MAGA people, there was some assassination or something. They are they are asking for political violence. In fact, my my running political theory, whenever I rewatch the news and I listen to the left and what they're doing, trying to destroy basically they're trying to destroy the country by everything they're doing. And so I that's my running theory. So it's like, okay, he's trying to get he's trying to undermine the country, destroy the constitution, and this is one way to do it. That and it explains all the actions that they're doing. Why are you destroying yeah. the the the, uh, the dollar with the inflation? Well, you're trying to destroy the country. Okay, why, yeah, because... why are you creating racial divisions between people? Well, because you're trying to destroy the country. I mean, really, it, it fits almost everything that they do. Why are you bringing all the, what, letting the wall, can people just come in and uncheck borders? Trying to know. destroy the country. No, no, it's 100% right. And it's to to foment conflict amongst the, the mat, like the, this is we 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 have a system that is resistant to aristocracy and nobility but for the noble and aristocratic classes the quickest way to keep the masses from killing them was to get the masses to kill each other like that's right. that's how well, you do it and if they keep everybody stirred up then no, they can steal to their heart's content right. and nobody's going to be checking them if if the if the citizenry is together and has a clear vision of what's going on those people wouldn't be in power and right now we have a citizenry arguing over just how much like none of the neither of the main sides is saying that the 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 government should have significantly less power. The Republicans are arguing that the government should have incidentally less power and the the Democrats are saying they should have significantly more power. And that's the crazy thing is like no, how about we go back to where the government has effectively no power? other than very limited things that we gave them and wrote down. Like those things are what well, they get to do and all this other stuff they don't. Clarence Thomas, one of the things that you know, we talked about him earlier yeah. on, one of the things he said to me that I will never forget, and, and it's uh, it replies to this, and it was, um, this is really in the weeds lawyer stuff, but <laughs> it applies. Um, he, he he was at, we were at like this table and he there was like this little um, plastic, cover where you put the the wire goes through the table you know there's a little plastic cover mm -hmm. and he's like well just tell me so is that little plastic cover is that in the stream of commerce it's like so so if this is in the stream of commerce then the government can regulate that yes. and if that thing's in the stream of commerce everything's in the stream of commerce so the federal government has unlimited power through the a broad vision of this commerce clause yeah wickard versus philburn is my nightmare it's the are you familiar with Wickard versus Filburn? I'm, I'm not. A, I'm a criminal lawyer, but right. I, but I always think about that. About how it's like. So the government can regulate everything. Well, yeah, so Wick, it's in the stream of commerce. Wickard is the dormant, the creation of the dormant commerce clause, which which took the already ridiculous commerce clause and expanded it to things that aren't. Which so uh, Wickard was he was a guy. I think it was Wickard. He was the guy, and he was a farmer. And the, the government wanted to raise the price of wheat. Um, this is uh, this case is decided in 1929, maybe 19, maybe in the thir early 30s. It was right around the Depression. Government wanted to raise the price of wheat. It had fallen through the floor. And so they actually passed a law restricting how much wheat you could sell. They said, or how much wheat you could grow. You could only grow a thousand bushels of wheat, period. That was the the cap. And, and you couldn't have any more. Well, this guy grew his thousand bushels for trade, but he grew some extra wheat for himself, for his like horses and for uh, to grind into his own flour, for his own home use and stuff like that. Remembering this is back in the 20s when people still did stuff for themselves. And so he does this. The government finds out and they they fine him. They come, they confiscate the extra wheat. They burn it. They said, no, you get a thousand. And he says, but I'm not selling this wheat i'm not selling it at all and the court the, the supreme court ultimately said though 
he would never actually enter that segment of wheat into commerce because he would not have to purchase wheat for his own use from someone else. It was within the stream of commerce, which is, it's, it's mind blowing. I've created a thing so I don't have to buy something. Well, but then you're participating in commerce by actively not participating. Well, look at the crazy Obamacare decision. Now that was thought of as a tax, but it was originally thought as a stream of commerce. It, your yes. failure to purchase, your failure to act is acting. It's Which within, is based off regulate of your failure to act. So they can force you to act. Yep. Same thing like though they can force your speech to write something on a cake. And there's a similar case out in Portland, I think it is, or it's on the left coast somewhere, where they're where they're regulating um, that somebody's trying to gather rainwater in a tank because he's a survivalist and he wants to have a tank of rainwater. And they're regular; they won't let you. Do. You have to hook up to the utility. Right. You can't you, have your own. Form. You can't take that water from the watershed, which would then go it's into a, a river and, then... and the cloud goes from state to state, or what? You want to interfere with the riparian rights of like uh, Monsanto or whatever and their almond farms? <laughs> I mean, we are beyond crazy. We are, yeah, we are we're, the government, the society, we're so, the, the society is so full of lies, so full of dishonesty and and propaganda. And it's it's frightening right now, the state of the, this information that's out there. And, the, and they want to shut down people like yourself who are at least trying to engage with the truth. I mean, we don't have all the answers. We don't have half the answers. I don't even have a few of them, but we can see the problems and we can talk about them and try to discover them. And they don't want to have that discussion because it's like the emperor doesn't have clothes and this type of citizenry discussion gets is a threat to the emperor, right? Yeah, well, and it's it's right now, the, the crazy thing is people people do that. They'll, they'll say that to me a lot. Well, what's the answer? Do you have an answer? Are you just complaining? And it's like, we're not at answer level yet. Because right now, most people walking around today don't realize that there's a problem. They they legitimately don't recognize the fact that uh, that the government can force you to buy a product from a private company as a problem. They don't recognize the fact that Kilo versus the city of New London exists, where the government came in and took houses from people and gave the property to Pfizer. And then Pfizer never built the thing they were supposed to build. But, but the, they... the, the the large mass of, of leftist, basically ideologues that have taken over large institutions is a real threat because they, you know, like the collusion we're seeing that the government FBI went to Facebook and said, we want you to suppress this Hunter Biden story because it's insanity. That's insane. And it's and that's government action. It is basically banana republic stuff. And and people don't say, well, that's not a threat, but they but then they never heard about the Hunter Biden house. They don't know about the corruption. They don't know about, you know. So we're just suppressing the truth, right? We aren't letting the debate be free. Well, that and and it's, on YouTube, I had to say it this way, but uh, that was the stolen election. Like whatever the whatever the results of the any voting machines or anything. I don't know. I don't fucking care. Here, it was stolen. The vote machines took it all because YouTube can't stop me from saying it. Vote machines were stealing everything, stealing babies, stealing votes. They gave Joe Biden babies to sniff and an election to win. <laughs> so I don't know. But but the real theft, the real theft was precisely that Hunter Biden story. It was a collusive and collaborative effort by media entities to suppress this thing. And now we're finding out that the but government was just involved one in that. Story. It was the right. cavalcade of March of anti-Trump stuff and no, no shining a light on any kind of Democrat wrongdoing or any kind of he could hide in the basement and everything's given a pass. And everything that Trump would sneeze wrong, and he's a Hitlerian Nazi. I mean, he's a human being who has flaws, and he has policies. I don't have many I, flaws, but my flaws are truly tremendous. They're wonderful. <laughs> That's a pretty good impression, I must <laughs> say. I'm, I'm impressed. But, what, uh, have we got more Super Chats, or what's that? Uh... We we do, but but I just want to, like, the reason I bring up the Hunter Biden story as the crux is there was a, there was a survey done, uh, a nationwide survey, that showed that the Democrats who would have heard the Hunter Biden story, if, if they had heard it prior to voting, they would have not voted for Joe Biden. It doesn't mean they would vote for Trump. It just meant that they wouldn't have voted for Joe Biden. And it was a sufficient number 
in the swing states to change the election. Like that story was that story coming out according to this survey, which surveys have, you know, margins of error and everything, but outside of the margin of error for this survey, that was enough to, to completely change the outcome of the election. And it's like, and it was just, and now we're finding out that the government was involved in it, which makes, to me, I'm, I'm not sure why Facebook hasn't already been sued as a quasi-state actor. Uh, well, on, a lot on of big issue. law has been taken over by the left. That's and true. It takes, big law, it takes big law to sue. Most big law is hard left. And so you get th those entities don't want to sue big entities. It's big government is the friend of big business. And Republicans need to learn that big business is not their friend that individuals, liberty and freedom is the is our friend. And that's what we need to preserve. We don't need to preserve Bill Gates's $100 million house. And it's like, well, he earned it and all the, we have all these justifications. Yes, but when his power with his money and his influence over corporate media is such that it threatens individual freedom, then that needs to go. That power needs to go because right. individual freedom is way more important than some theoretical business control, the guy's going to be fine. He's not going to be hurt. Antitrust works and we need to be much more invigorated. Whenever I want to get friendly with a leftist, I talk about antitrust law because generally they're pro antitrust and we agree on these things. You know, a lot of liberals do not like big tech either or big business. So I think we have common cause on that ground. The problem I have is when liberals talk a lot about antitrust and then they don't, they, like they carve out YouTube, Facebook, Google, and well, Twitter not, and stuff. Not the ones I've talked to here. I, I mean, mean you've, I've, you've got blessed liberals then. <laughs> I've got what? Blessed liberals. Blessed <laughs> who, well, at least, you know. <laughs> who at least have a modicum of consistency because a lot of the ones I run into, they're like, suddenly they're the, they're the most free market capitalist things ever when it comes to censorship on big tech. They're like, no, private companies could do whatever they want. I'm like, no, they, no, we haven't had private companies able to do whatever they want since 1870. What are you talking about? You can't, you cannot... You cannot even come close to saying that anymore. Oh my God. Uh, and, and in some ways that's good, right? Like in, we, I don't want corporate towns anymore. Like I don't want that. You know, I, we have, well, we, we uh, let me just throw it. When I was in, um, I, I did, I did radio shows here for a while. Yeah. Um, we had a Mark Bernier show, which was a local, um, he came in after, after Limbaugh. And so I was a frequent guest there. I've actually. heard him before. Have you heard Limbaugh or have you heard uh, Mark Bernier? Yeah, I, I can't remember where I I think Daytona back when Beach. I was I think back when I was listening to Limbaugh, Mark Bernier filled in for him once or twice. Okay, could be. Anyway, I used to be a frequent guest with him. He was a friend of mine, and uh we used to do politics all the time. This is this mm -hmm. is fun because it's not just law, you know. But um and uh where was I going with that? Now I now I lost the train of thought. I mentioned corporate towns, oh, and that's no, what you no, I was up. gonna tell you one of the, the my my rules I developed with talking with listeners and, you know, we're communicating with people, they call in on the call in show is that if you're going to talk with somebody on the other side, there's got to be certain ground rules. You have to say, do you believe in truth? Do you believe in truth? Do you believe there's an objective truth? Is there a right? And is there a wrong? And is there truth? And is there falsity? Because if you don't believe in those things, then we can't communicate because you're playing a political game. And then also, are we both seeking the truth? Right. Right. And are we engaged in it? And then also don't engage in ad hominem attacks. So if you, oh, can I'd come, fail. You know, but if we can come up with those ground rules and we can talk across the aisle, but a lot of times people, they use, they use language as a weapon and they don't, they're not seeking the truth. They're seeking to win political points. And they're, they're also, they are also uh, this, they want to call you a name. They're looking to call you a name. Oh, you said a dirty word. You're a racist. You're a bigot. You're a homophobe right. or whatever. There's no productivity in talking with somebody in without that. And, uh, you know, a lot of the um, and also when I'm engaging with people from the left, um, a lot of have you ever read uh, C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man? No. Absolute must read. Um, it, it talks about this is a little where I'm getting, you know, this is ranting time, right? This, this is, is what this is about. This is what this is what the show the show. Like I have an idea of where it will go and then it goes like this and that's what I want in life because th th for me, uh, just as a personal thing, the the thing I find joy in is hearing people's stories and hearing people's thoughts. Um, and and so getting getting to that place where people are telling me about their life experience that I don't have 
or a story that makes me think about something in a different way. That's all I want to do. And, and so I, I love this. That's okay. Good. And I well, think that's what entertainment really is. is well, it's, it's not, but it's, it's also, this is meaningful stuff. When do you ever get to have moral discussions with anybody? Mm. You know, we live in this society Never anymore. Can't, can't talk about politics. My, my friend, Derek, who I love and who passed away, he used to say, I care about you. I love you as a human being. And those are important things. And it's my incumbent because I love you. I want you to be right in the moral sense. And I, we, those are important conversations. Oh, to have. Derek sounds very offensive. Oh, he was great. No, he was. Everybody <laughs> loved my friend. He said he was staunch Catholic. He was staunch Catholic. Oh, yeah. right. What was his? Do you do you know his uh, confirmation name? I do not. Oh, that's a good okay. question. Yeah. I don't. He was one. Are you, of wait, are you are you Catholic? I am. I'm a convert. Okay. Did you? I. So I was raised Catholic. Uh, mm -hmm. So I I don't know the convert thing. Did you do the sacrament of confirmation? Yes. Yes. I went through something called RCIA. Right. Which is, I don't even know what that stands for. I I was kind of raised nominally Protestant. Sure. And kind of was not really had a faith, didn't really have much faith. But during my exit from the state attorney's office, put me in a real hole. Yeah. And uh, it was a real there's a there's a it's a long story. I could tell that's a, another story for another day, maybe. But um, going in that hole, sometimes there's things that are bigger than you. And I needed help to get out of that hole, because when we're young, we think we rule the world. We don't we are strong and we need everything. But sometimes you got hate in your heart. And you got to let go of it, but you can't. And so I was brought out of that hole by a miracle or whatever, and God gave it to me. I says, "Well, this this is something's right here." So I went through uh, I went through the whole process and uh, became Catholic. So, but anyway, what's your confirmation about? name? It's, it's Stephen with a PH, and I did that okay. so that because not only is Saint Stephen the first the first guy with a head on the chopping block, which is me. But also, if they screw my name up, it's right either way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Mine's Ignatius. Oh, Saint wow. Ignatius. Ignatius. Now, patron Ignatius? saint of. Uh, he was a patron saint of taxi cab drivers and hearses. <laughs> Get out of here. Uh, he's actually like his story is phenomenal. Um, he walked with a limp because he had a he had a disfigured leg, and um, they tried to like saw it off, like saw it down. And he uh, he didn't do any like anesthetic. He just he just sucked it up like a man. <laughs> See, and you are a glutton for punishment. That thing. <laughs> some days, some well, days where, I am. Where are we going with? Oh, I know it's ab abolition of man. I wanted to get back because you yes, got to yes, read yes. abolition of man because what it talks about is basically we're all sort of there's a pyramid, kind of like a Maslow of hierarchy. But you have everybody's tribal, and we have yeah. our tribal allegiances, so, and that could be family, you know racial country whatever it is but that's sort of a foundational human thing that is all part of us and we defend our tribe if somebody attacks my tribe i defend my tribe well then as we evolved we grew into a a chest function which is a moral function and that's like i always think about a knight championing his maiden right and he's mm -hmm. looking at he's projecting no there's right and wrong in the world there's good and evil and i'm going to champion for good right and that's a chest function even if the good is against my tribe right so it's a it's a superior moral sense that governs over the tribe and then on the top is the intellectual the head and that's rational okay well, rationally this is what should happen and we think things right and we atomize right. everything and rationalize everything well so that's sort of an explanation of three levels of man, right? Mm -hmm. Well, C.S. Lewis's insight is that we have lost our moral sense with the, with the loss, loss of faith in our society and our country. We've lost our faith, and therefore we lost our moral sense and our chest sense. And so what you get is this, everybody is intellectual yeah. until they're confronted with something that, they can't, that, that disagrees with their intellectual framework, and they don't have a moral sense to fall, so they go right into tribalism. So yep. when you're talking with a, a, the lefty and all of a sudden you say, well, what about this? What about this? And all of a sudden it's like, you're, you're a bad guy. All of a sudden you're on the other team. And that's a tribal response because they devolve right from that. That's right out of C.S. Lewis. He wrote that in the four, late forties. And, and he's um, right. He's, he's 100 exactly right. right. And so the answer is when you're talking with people of who have lost their faith, don't address them on the intellectual front, address them in the moral front. Address them from right and wrong. Is this right or wrong? Is that good or bad? Is that right? You know, address it in, in a moral sense 
And that would then they because they don't have that. You need to develop that, bring it out of them. So that's the way you bring people into the world of good, right? I mean, this is yeah. I don't Which know. Is I'm, a just, tough I'm thing just giving to do. you a debate tactic for uh, t- talking with your and for the chatters and the watchers and all about how to deal with people who are you're disagreeing with. Well, because we have a different fa- set fact set. We've watched mm-hmm. Fox News or whatever, and they're watching MSNBC, and so we're disagreeing intellectually. But the, are we disagreeing morally? So yeah, flesh check. that out. Don't debate on this level because you're not going to, you know, it's like uh, Reagan said, it's not what they, it's, what is it? Um, it's not that they don't know anything. It's what the, it's so much of what they know is wrong. Yeah. For me, uh, checkmate, I don't watch anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like I just, my, my compass on this stuff is uh, in, in, in the United States is based on what they wrote down. And also, I have a I have a firm hatred for Marbury versus Madison, uh, which which bothers a lot of lawyers, which is good, and it always should. It, if I'm bothering lawyers, I'm in a good place. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, I I hate the fact that the founders gave us a way to amend the Constitution to suit our needs, and we just decided right away that judges would do it instead. That's what bothers me about Marbury versus Madison. We handed so much power to the Supreme Court to effectively write amendments into the law. I mean, look at Roe versus Wade and just how long it took to dismantle that absolute catastrophe of a decision. And I mean, it, it, it and w- I, I had a debate on this, uh, this guy named destiny stream. He, he reached out to me. Destiny's a, he was, he was a very big Twitch streamer. He got banned from Twitch for, for being transphobic, even though he's very left, but he, he's, he was taking issue with some of the trans uh, women in sports stuff. Um, but, uh, so he invited me onto a debate and he's like, uh, I've got three other lawyers. We're going to talk about Roe versus Wade. Do you want, you want in? I'm like, sure. <laughs> and so it's basically me versus two and a half is, is how it came out. Cause one guy was like half on the side of, of like babies actually maybe are protected by the constitution somewhere. And then the, the other, the others were not their ultimate argument as was the argument for Roe in general was, well, the Supreme court decided it in Roe, Therefore it's the correct decision that should remain. And it's like, and, and I, I brought up the ice uh, um, in the later part of the discussion. I'm like, stare decisis is informative, but should not be controlling because if a decision was bad when it was made, it should be reversed now out of hand if we determine that a decision was wrongfully decided it should just go and they're like what no the starry decisis factors say blah blah blah. and i'm like i don't care what the factors say i care about the fact that if something was opposed to the constitution when it was decided we should go this was opposed to the constitution and still is and just remove it rather than go well but is it convenient is it this is it that what are these no i don't care about a four part test well, you are if you are was... very much in the clarence thomas wing because he oh, doesn't yeah. believe in stereodecisis right it, that it, is right out of what he would say and that's um starry decisis is value to me and and i yeah i've seen this in his opinions too is that smart people figured this thing out in this way we should listen to what the smart people said, but smart people are wrong with frequency sufficient to say they might be wrong now. And if they're wrong, then they're just wrong. And well, that's and the Supreme that's court fine. has been wrong. The Supreme court has caused more problems than it's solved. They love to wave the flag of Brown versus support education and the, the whole racial uh, thing. But uh, you know, the they were Supreme wrong on court that issue been- forever has been a problem for a long time. In fact, it caused the civil war. Right. And you know, that's, that was directly as a result of, of a Supreme court Dred Scott. Mm -hmm. And if you want to read a, if you want to read a good decision (laughs) from the Supreme court, go read Taney's decision in in Dred Scott. I mean, boy, talk about a a judge who thinks he's going to solve the world's problems with his pen. Okay, I'm done with this slavery debate. I'm going to fix this once and for all, and I'm going to write. It's an air. It's the most arrogant decision, <laughs> typical black robe judge stuff. You know, this kind of goes back to something I deal with a lot. And uh, you know, one of the things as public defender, I'm also I represent them legally, but I also am their counselor. Right. And and so a lot of it is just you know, go forth and don't sin again, right? <laughs> but a lot of times I'll get people, I'll get my clients, and they'll call me. 
and they're, you know, I get the appeal and they've been convicted and they're in prison or whatever. And the family, the family will call me. And I have to say, they say, oh, I just, I just believe in the system. And I have faith in the system. And I'm like, I don't have faith in the system. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that is, that is idolatry. You are placing your faith in the wrong place. Faith is to be placed in God alone. And do not, the, the system is evil and flawed and filled with evil and flawed people. And it's corrupt and it's, it doesn't work. And I have, I mean, I don't have any faith in the system. I mean, and, I, and I, that's, that's terrible to say, you know, my mom likes to get, she gets on me all the time. She's like, how, you know, you're a lawyer. You should believe in the system. I'm like, I'm a I lawyer. And God. that's why I don't believe in the system. <laughs> <laughs> faith, faith is placed there. And a lot of our problem, another problem in our society, and we're going to solve all society's problems here tonight. Yes. Is, um, is idolatry. And idolatry is not a golden calf. You know, idolatry is placing your faith in something that where it should not be placed. A lot of times people place it in the government. They place it in science. They place it in rationality. They place it in power, in money. Those are all idolatrous places to put your, your faith. Your faith yes. is only one place you put the faith and you choose it. It's a, it's a leap of faith and you choose it, but it's ultimately irrational. And that's the chest function. They, the, and the rational brain hates that, but you cannot have morality without faith. And your faith is somewhere because you're making decisions at all times. And some you you have a there's a right and wrong decision making process in every right. decision you make. And that morality exists where you place it. You may not be if you're unconscious, then you need to examine yourself because it, you're putting it somewhere where it shouldn't be. If you I've chosen where I'm putting my faith, where have you chosen to put yours? That's my no, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great synopsis because people have this idea that, uh, that, well, I'm an atheist, therefore I make all of my decisions rationally. It's like, well, one, no, you don't for, first of all, I've met you. You don't make decisions <laughs> rationally at all. But second, you, we seek some guiding principle, whatever that may be. And you can call it rationality, but your rationality is always formulated by some set of what is correct. And, and you, you choose where that goes. That's hundred percent right there. There's this guy, his name is like Mike Hargood or something. He's super liberal. He's ultra mega gay in a lot of ways. Uh, not, not, not uh, sexual preference wise. He's just like, but they, he was on a podcast and God, I wish I knew what this podcast is called. The first season was so freaking good. And then it devolved into typical, typical, like super liberal stuff within church, which really bothers me. Like when it, when it gets overtly political within the church, either way, I get annoyed. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's a guy who's like a physicist. He's a scientist, super rational guy. And he cannot explain why he's a Christian. He can't do it. He's like, but uh, when he was at this really bad point in his life and he wrote a book about it, but he was sitting on a beach and he, he was just sitting on a beach meditating and the tide actually, like he kind of just zones out and the tide comes in and goes out and he wakes up on this beach and he was surrounded by like all this seaweed and stuff and everything, except for a circle around him. He was protected from the tide is is the the best way he's like i can't explain it every rational part of my brain has tried to figure this out i can't do it and so that's how he was brought to faith because he there is no rational explanation for this he does not rationally he cannot rationally figure out god or anything like that but he knows that he sat on that beach and he knows that nothing touched him for hours while he was tranced out meditating and he should have died. Like he should have drowned or been awakened or something. And it didn't happen. And uh, his book is called finding faith in the waves or finding God in the waves, which is a play on that incident plus his physics background. But, but like, that's, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that, that you're like talking about is that there, there is this thing that you cannot and will not be able to explain. That's faith. Well, and it's a mistake to think that you can prove God or is establish faith through rationality and that and the and the the mind and again C.S. Lewis talks about this 
the mind is jealous and the rational brain is very jealous of anything that it can't explain. Yes. And it likes to atomize faith. But faith is at a completely different level. You can't explain. Explain to me good. Explain to me evil. Explain to me love. If you have a child, you love your child. Well, that's not rational. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense. Because sometimes they're little bastards. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And they're crying and screaming and colicky babies. I mean, if your baby's colicky, boy, that's, I mean, you know, that's a very, it, it hits you at a primal level. That you can't yes. explain, and men are really bad. And I've had, oh God, this is, this is a problem with being a public defender. You know, it brings up bad memories about child abuse cases, yeah. about young men who kill babies. Um, you know, who are basically colicky. They're colicky babies, and they they don't have the mental ability. And I, that's a men male female difference, I think. I mean, I, females are much better at carrying it in, with infants. And and men and boys are not, and we and we get and that baby starts crying. And it's oh. like, what are you gonna do? And they shake them and they kill them. Yeah. And, it, and it's not. It's just. It's like they can't handle this. Like I mean, the, and what people need to learn is just walk away. You know, put the that's baby. What in I, the thing. Yeah. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. People people often. Hey, rackets. Uh, my wife and I are about to welcome our first baby. What advice do you have for new parents? I'm like I don't know, but I know this. I know this. Put the baby in the crib and walk away. The baby will be crying in your arms. You won't be able to figure out what's going on. Sometimes baby just needs to cry. If it's crying in your arms and it's going to be fine crying in your arms after 30 minutes, it's going to be fine crying in a crib after 30 minutes. Put it down. Go rest. Go get your, you got to collect yourself because otherwise. Because you're like, I've got it. This is a problem here and I need to solve it. And then what happens, and I mean, I've had multiple cases like this where young men are left with infants and they hurt or kill the baby because the baby's crying and they don't know that they can just walk away. If the baby's been changed, they've been fed, you've held them and they've cried and none of that's working, you can put, and you're starting to get angry, You gotta put, put it the down. baby down and walk away. Yeah, and it's, it's crazy because... Uh, people think of child abuse and they and and like child children getting injured and and even killed and they go these people are monsters and sometimes they really really are, but there are times when they really aren't. It's stress, it's lack of sleep, lack of education, lack of training, and then this baby will just not stop crying and you have to just put it down because all of this other stuff is working against you and it's like these people don't set out to hurt kids they have no desire to harm this baby oftentimes they really like it well and they're just this is bringing up another thought that i thought i'd share with your viewership (laughs) yeah (laughs) whoever wants to listen to me listen to rant is fine you know but um that's why we're here another observation and and you know i've done a lot of murder cases Mm -hmm. and um Almost all of them, and I, I might be able to, I might, if I thought about it real hard, I might be able to come up, but almost all of them come up with, I, I don't, I can't tell you why it happened. And, mm-hmm. and it's hard, you know, like if you watch a lot of me- media, it's always like the insurance policy and the person's wife and, you know, and they're trying to kill the witness and the thing. And that just never happens. I mean, it rarely, rarely happens. Most murders are primal. Most murders happen because it's a it's a territoriality thing. Somebody disrespected me. They got angry. It's just drugs, people out of their minds. I mean, it's it's very hard to explain. And then and it's a problem too because I, the families, the families come and they're like, they try to ascribe meaning to the death of their loved one. They're you know, and sometimes it's meaningless. And that's a very hard thing for people to understand. But the, the the answer here, and this is the, you know, well, what's what are you saying, guys? Are you saying death is meaningless? No, what's meaningful is what you do every day, how you conduct yourself every day, your life that you live, the life that you're given. We're all going to die. We're yeah. all headed there somewhere. How we die is relevant. Well, Mark Zuckerberg won't. He'll be uploaded to the metaverse. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> if he already isn't, you know. <laughs> Well, I, I actually, 
I have a theory that Mark Zuckerberg was actually killed a long time ago by his, <laughs> he's just by a, his computer, and it is three D plastic automaton. Yeah, it three D printed an endoskeleton and made him into a skin suit, and he just plugs into a USB port every night and charges and uploads the newest Facebook algorithm and uploads the entire world into Maybe him. He's canceling you in his metaverse upload. He is. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go fight that guy. I'm gonna bring a bathtub and a toaster, and Mark Zuckerberg is going down. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me get some more of these rants. Joe Schmo, one of three. Let's make brigading a positive force instead of mass reporting. How about mass rumble ranting or super chatting? Oh, I like that idea. Yes. <laughs> I have no personal interest in the outcome of that campaign, but if you mass rumble rant, I it'll be great. Mass, I don't know what that looks like, but I'll let you. Uh, I'll, what you're, it looks you're like. The, what Capitalism. it looks like is this. <laughs> <laughs> Colvay 2A says, when you say get on the wall, do you mean with gorilla tape? Because if they use scotch tape, they'd fall off and get hurt. We wouldn't want them to get a boo-boo. That's a good point. Alt Lag says, as promised, and to keep up your grift here in Rumble Land, I'm updating you on my journey to unfat myself. I'm almost 15 pounds down. So fuck YouTube, Keffels, and my excess me. Shame me for motivation. Alt Lag I'm so glad you're 15 pounds down, almost. The fact that you said almost tells me that you're probably up, you fatso. Maybe you should stop eating chili dogs. Maybe you could try eating a salad or better yet, just eat nothing and let your body eat itself until you're an appropriate weight, you giant piece of garbage. Go get it, brother. Just kidding. Uh, jo <laughs> I don't know. This is, this is one of those like family oh. conversations that there's like language being used that I'm just not clued in on. People, so. uh, people pay me. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing in my life. They pay me money to fat shame them. So they get skinnier. Okay. Whatever works. I'm, I'm well, I have it. a natural hatred of fat people, um, that I've had forever. Like if there is an ism that I that, like, I'm not racist, but I am fattest. I always have been. And well, that's and, not constitutionally protected class. So you're not worried. You know, should I, be worried. Exactly. I don't care about them. Nobody cares about fat people. <laughs> well, come on. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm not, I'm just on the show. Okay. I'm not <laughs> I'm just next to you. <laughs> uh, Jar Jar Kinks says knows I've been following you since the Vic trial love your content keep up the good work brother don't let them win also how do I join the discord you join the discord by joining me on locals ricadalaw.locals.com we're on rumble you don't even have to do anything there's a locals button right on there you click that it'll bring you right to my page locals it's, is rumble right they're rumble the same is. parent company on, like they're I Wh whoever is the parent company owns rumble and locals. Um, they're not quite the same, but they're very similar, but locals and rumble, they work hand in hand. There's a locals link on every rumble video. Uh, so you can click on that. It'll take you right to my locals page. Um, you can join that for five bucks a month. If you want, you can actually sign up for free though. And always know where I'm live streaming and when, because I always post on, uh, the link goes up on Rumble before or on Locals before anywhere else. And so if I get banned from YouTube and they prevent me from talking to you, uh, you can always find me on Locals. You can, you can find out what's going on. Locals is the only place I posted about my band before this show. Um, so you could you can see me. Uh, you can see everything there. It's completely free. Um, if you want to participate on Locals, that costs five bucks a month or more. There are different tiers with different access levels and that gets you into the discord that way so that's how you get into the discord don't go there the discord is the worst place on earth with the worst people on earth they don't belong in polite society they don't belong in rude society most of them deserve to be killed <laughs> don't go in my like seriously sign up for locals don't go in the discord ever i have warned you i am not lying to you this is not a griff this is not like a her her he's so funny he wanted he, he was challenging me to go don't go to the discord everybody on the discord should be shot in the head all of them they all belong in the ground they're hey, terrible i'm gonna go to the restroom real quick while you rant okay <laughs> they're they're the they're the worst people on earth oh my gosh if you find a Discord member somewhere in the wild, you should spray yourself with mace and go to a hospital to get away with them or away from them. They're awful. 
Do not go in there. I don't know how to tell people. People go in. They're like, ah, I'll la di da into Rikada's Discord. I am getting a damn complaint within five days without fail. Stop going in there. Don't go. Let it die. Let everyone die with it. Like the Titanic. If the Titanic were full of fucking child rapists and you're like, yeah, just go down. Just sink to the bottom and then get nuked. Sink in Japan. Oh, please just go away. That's the discord. That's it. Uh, I missed the rant. Thank it's good. <laughs> That's a good thing. Going on. I'm, just, I'm just here for the ride. Uh, Laura D1 says, keep up the good fight. Thank you. Peg, Peg MCK says, Nick, fight it. Hope this helps a little. I will be fighting the YouTube strike when I know exactly what it is. I can formulate my appeal. I've str- and I'll have strategized it at that point with, uh, with my board? partner manager. Uh, I, I have lawyers in reserve if necessary, but I would rather not resort to that because it's, uh, when you, I feel like when you sue YouTube, you're, you're off YouTube, no matter if you win or lose like that. Yeah, no, I get it. I look litigation is not a winning strategy. I mean, right. Litigation is when you've lost every other strategy, right? Your Gibson bakery and going mm-hmm. down, right? Go for big guy. Nine one one. Uh, happy birthday, Steven. Oh Wait. yeah. Um, well, it's, how does did I, that come up? My birthday is the seventh. Oh, happy birthday coming up! Very cool. Yes, on when uh, my first day of class at Bronca's Law Self. <laughs> maybe you mentioned it then. I okay, I don't yeah, remember probably. hearing it, but maybe maybe you did. Thank um, you. My birthday is Sunday the fourth. Hopefully, uh, have huge plans. I will be spending it with the weirdos of the Minnesota Re- Minnesota Renaissance Festival selling my goods. Wait, you you will? Oh, damn it. I'm going to be, I'm not going to, I can't go. I'm going to be a family camp. Um, are you going to be, go for big guy, 911. Are you going to be up there any other time? I've been debating. I'm like, Lady Ragged, should we go to the Renaissance Festival? We haven't been in like 10 years. And I really like going to Vegetable Justice because it's the last place I can hear someone make fun of someone based on obvious physical characteristics because you can't do that anymore. Uh, and, and she's like, I don't know, maybe we should so go. You, you and like, do we, Renaissance festivals. We used to go, not you like do Blackmore's them. night. No, you know, Black, I don't you know, do Blackmore, right? Okay. So I don't do any shows at Ren, Ren Fest. The only thing I do, I go and I buy a Turkey leg right next to the vegetable justice stand, which is where you throw tomatoes at someone who makes fun of people. Okay. Um, and that's, that's it. Like, I don't care. Like my wife will drag me around and spend all my money, which is fine. But all I want to do is buy a turkey leg and stand there and watch a guy make fun of everybody. Um, the last time I went, it, God, it, it, it's like it's this throwback to things you can't do anymore, right? Last time I went, we go. This is in Minnesota, okay? So you have to understand the context. This uh, this. Young kid goes up to throw the tomatoes and he is uh, of darker skin. Okay. And the vegetable justice guy says, Hey kid, I bet I can pick your dad out of the crowd. And it was like, come on. Why? <laughs> like, What? You? It was so shocking and jarring because you cannot say anything like that anywhere else. But this is, you a- know, isn't it sad that the speech has been, I mean, I, I grew up in the eighties. Me and, too. You know, yeah, it was, a, it was a wild and woolly world, but it was a free world. I mean, the fact yes. that everything's getting—you have to watch everything. Everybody's walking on eggshells. Like I said, I don't get offended by much. I mean, like I, I'm entertained by your show. You know, you you say a lot of stuff that's wacky and crazy and out there, and you're out there, and you're saying it and throwing it, and I respect that. It's like I'm not offended. What what are you being offended about? I, I don't. I don't really think anybody's really offended. I mean, this is kind of an operating right. theory, and maybe it's just me projecting my own self on the world, but I think people use it as a tool to weaponize to get their enemies, right? So it's like, I'm offended by this, and then they get off on their moral superiority. Yes. Are they really offended? No. Do you really know what it is to be offended? I, I don't know. I'm suspicious of the whole offense industry. No, the it, you're right. It's an industry, and it, it is... It is people who weaponize the potential for offense. 
Tell but you me know what how... offends me? I mean, when I see the, the crime, the criminal acts, and somebody gets hit in the head with a bat, that's mm -hmm. pretty offensive to me, you know? Yeah, that bothers me a lot. Yeah, or I see uh, drive-by shootings in the hood or, or you know, somebody's ripping some little old lady off of all their money. That's offensive. You know, you want to, why don't you get offensive at that? Why don't you get offensive at, like, you know, and there's so many things to be offended about. It ain't somebody's talking and saying a dirty word about somebody you don't like. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. That's so low level. Yeah. Well, the, at the same time when I was at the vegetable justice stand, this is my other the vegetable justice. The center. other favorite joke I had or that the guy said, uh, no one was paying. And so like if no one's paying, the guy's just sitting, he's basically in stocks, but there's a wall. Right. Okay, so right. all you can see is his face and his hands and you throw these tomatoes. No one hits this guy almost because it's, it's basically impossible uh, how they have it set up. Cause they don't want the guy to die. Uh, and they, they core out the tomatoes. So when they hit, they don't like, cause a tomato, a full tomato that's intact that hits you will hurt like shit. Cause it's, it's like a, it's like a little one pound rock. Um, and it's nasty, but they core them out. You throw them, they just splatter or whatever. And some people hit them, but most people don't. No one's up there throwing tomatoes. So he starts making fun of the crowd. Right. And he looks at me. Uh oh. And my wife was with our youngest son, who's probably like one at the time, just barely walking, a little over one. And he's, um, or he, no, he would have been almost two. He would have been almost two based on the dates. Uh, so he's almost two years old. And they're doing like a treasure hunt and slides and stuff. And they're not too far away. But my wife's cousin, who's a couple years younger than her, uh, was, was with me. And so she's probably 20. I don't know. And uh, the guy looks at me. He goes, hey, you. And I'm like, oh, right. I'm about to get torched. He says, what trailer park did you grab that one from? And I was like, in your face, you got roasted. I didn't. This is the greatest day of my life. I was so happy. All I want to do is go sit there and watch this guy heckle people with impunity. You can't cancel him oh it's great it's impossible yeah. because well, he's that's a why comedy is so great yeah comedy they're trying to cancel comedians i mean if we've gotten so far down on the list of things to be offended at that you're getting offended at comedians we well, our society's see, gone along too way too far on this whole train of offense but see you can still cancel a comedian because they some comedians make a lot of money and if the if the venue doesn't stand behind them if their production label or whatever doesn't stand behind them if their recording label if they're producing albums doesn't stand behind them then they can be canceled but this guy is an independent business owner who's a carny who travels around the country making fun of people based on nothing but how they look it's like it's if i can make a million dollars doing it, it'd be my dream job like i just sit there and mock people my entire life i would want nothing more than that oh my gosh it'd be in heaven that guy has figured it out and who's gonna stop him like is the i guess the ren fest could stop yeah, but, inviting him maybe well, you but say why that, would they you know but i um i don't know i'm i'm more cynical than you i i'm wow I'm yeah fearful i'm fearful for our country really on this stuff has gotten so far like um do you remember when the the rodeo clown wore the obama mask <laughs> nope yeah <laughs> but i wish i did <laughs> yeah. there was a rodeo clown back when obama was president he wore a rodeo mask and he got canceled the hatred came down on him like you wouldn't believe he's a rodeo oh, clown boy Ooh, you can't do that. You yeah. cannot do that. That's too far. Why that's, not? Come on. Because Steve, break. it's it, all all of this boils down to a couple things. Um, we can talk about like high level principles and stuff, but there's two guiding principles about about canceling. It's either too funny, or the person saying it may not be funny, but the person saying it is having too much fun. And you have to remember that these people are inoculated to fun. They don't have joy. And that's it's it's similar to what you were saying with C.S. Lewis, where we're talking about this morality and this chest thing. Well, along with morality, faith, and and the this chest feel comes something that that we strive for uh, typically as Christians, but I think people of all faiths is contentment. You have contentment knowing that there is some some higher purpose that 
that right. you are serving something that is bigger than you. And if you don't have that, you're you're worried constantly about your life. But if these people, they, they're joyless, like yeah, legitimately well, joyless. You know, and one of the things that really drives the left, and I've put a lot of thought in this too, but when I was on the radio, we used to talk about this too, is um, is it's a lot of people are driven on the left by jealousy, and it's and also guilt. Th mm -hmm. Those two things they have they they have, they're guilty for their relative success, and so they're not going to give up their money. So right. they say, "Well, I'm going to tax you, and I'm going to get cheap, unearned moral superiority by my ideological buy-in." And yep. then also, and there's a jealousy too. There's jealousy that gets, and there's also projection. These things all come together to create this toxic mess, right? And and I think the answer to that is humility, and uh, and faith. Mm -hmm. But no, you know, but is. jealousy is a terrible thing. Like you said, I mean, and and you deal with people like I'm always doing stuff and going out there. I get people that they they come at you, and it's like, well, they want to tear you down. Like, why do you want to tear me down? What's what's your problem, right? Well, because they don't want to work. They don't want to do anything more. You're a threat to them because you're doing something that they would like to do, but they can't, or they don't yes. want to do, or it costs them work. Or maybe they're not capable. I don't know. But what, for whatever reason, it's easier to tear you down than to actually do something positive for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm happy, and same thing, if I'm happy, which I'm very happy, I have a great son, great wife, I'm blessed, and I'm happy and I'm thankful. But somebody that's not happy, they're going to look to me instead of changing their life and saying, how do I get that happiness? You know, maybe I could give them some guidance. Here's here's mother, here's a sub path. Right. It's not always happy, but here's a way that you can get to make your life better. But that's that's hard because that requires internal change. It's easier to make you unhappy to change that. Right. Because that's making yeah. me confront my own unhappiness. Well, that's why I fat shame people to make them happy. <laughs> 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 no, I don't know. See, it's all, all right, goes, full circle there, doesn't it? Right? Yep, of course. Goes nine nine nine. I just got paid today and would like to say screw YouTube with a huge rumble rant. Thank you, goes nine nine nine. I really appreciate it. By the way, uh, guys, not that I'm grifting, but I'm always grifting. Uh, rumble actually gives me a bigger cut of rumble rants than YouTube does of super chats. So, uh, rumble rants are highly. Highly appreciated. And I have Rumble the same rants are better than super chats. They are. YouTube takes 30% uh, of a, of a super chat. Rumble takes 20%. That's, isn't the um, policy here that the guest gets half of this? Is this, uh, is that the policy? yeah. Yep. And it'll be paid through the public defender's office. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I always <laughs> thank people for paying their taxes in Florida. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, don't worry. I spend bunches of money down there. Um, <laughs> Because, like I said, my parents live in St. Pete's. What I, the reason I brought that up, by the way, I never completed the thought is next time I'm down at my parents' place for a while, uh, I might make a, uh, I might make a trip over to uh, might Daytona. Come visit, visit Daytona and all the murder capital of the world. Actually, you I know, went we're to not Daytona really. a couple years ago, right after the like a hurricane had wiped it out, and they just rebuilt the beaches. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was the first, that was the first Florida trip that I had done since I, I, we did Disney when I was much younger, but um, my wife and kids and I, we went down to Florida uh, to go meet my parents and we went to Legoland. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But we were driving. And so we made a pit stop in Daytona beach and stayed there for the night, which was, it was a much needed uh, well, you sort of respite. If you're going to come here, you need to know where to stay and what to do. The, there's really two sides of Daytona. There's the tourist yeah. side and there's the local side. And so you kind of have to know the inside because there's a lot of touristy kind of things. Um, but if you do that, tell me and I will give you the guidance. There's good hotels and there's a lot of bad ones. There's great restaurants, but there's a lot of bad ones. We just um, stayed at like a Hampton Inn right on the beach. It was, well, it was easy and safe. Yeah, that's safe. But if you really want to know the good, there's a good side of Daytona. Um, but you have to kind of know locals. Locals, we keep it quiet because we don't want the New Yorkers coming over here. No one wants New Yorkers anywhere. <laughs> you know, They're... Florida's the only place that you have to go. You go south and you're actually going north. <laughs> well the yeah the no i was saying the next time we're down though maybe maybe the wife and i'll leave the kids with my parents and and make a trip over because i have another friend who's an attorney in that area 
as well. Uh, a guy named Stephen Birch, he's a civil litigator and, um, and, and he, and, uh, I, we love visiting he and his wife as well. So, uh, I would, I would love to come out and I, I like leaving my kids with my parents and going and doing stuff. It's great. That's, that's liberating right there. <laughs> yeah. That's, well, actually, you know, I don't, I don't know if some of your, your guests may recognize that back here, there's no computer because my son went off to college. So my only son has left the nest. Oh no. And you so can, I am like, like, just, this you is just my like, Huh? I'm going to take like, I'm going to take, you can tell your wife, like, I'm going to take a Monday and a Friday, a Friday and a Monday off. And we're just going to go do something. Well, we're actually both suffering from empty nest syndrome in a pretty big way. Mm. So anyway, oh, so this I is, know I've hmm? got this solution. I'm going to bring you my kids and then I'll go do something else. And you can well, watch other five of these little kids models. are not the same. You know, my son is, a, <laughs> he's my gift to the world. You will see, he will be great. Um, He's a freshman starting. He's only, he's at Embry Riddle. So it's not like he's going far. He's in town. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. But he's studying engineering. I said, stay away from law. <laughs> oh, engineering is such like, yeah. If you, uh, you get a nice engineering degree and you can put, put lawyers to shame on income and well, uh, income life, and happiness, life, happiness. I, that was my next thing. Life happiness. <laughs> it's like, you don't have to watch, look at child sex videos and, murder scenes i mean gosh. oh god uh panda milk says i really don't know what problem youtube has with cartography and bolo posters me either i'm an i'm an excellent cartographer that's why maps go on walls john's goat as someone from the right how do you reconcile wokeism in the public defender's office as a oh. recent law grad i did internships with federal defenders and state uh, public defenders it was unbearable at times well, that's, that's a good, a question. good question. That's actually a very good question. Now, I will say that our office, we have a pretty high percentage of conservatives, I would think, compared to the state. Um, and and speaking just between you and me, don't tell anybody. Yeah, no one will no one will ever see this. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Nobody will see this. But uh, you know, we have death penalty conferences that I go to, and and um it's the percentage of the left that's in the death penalty group is very high, and it gets very political. And at sometimes I just really get sick of it. I mean, it's like, you know, DeSantis is the worst guy and he's, oh, they're all the Republicans. And it becomes, and, and so there is that, you know, and then the, like the racial thing, like we got to do this racial profiling and, and here's a motion to say that the system is rigged against the races and all this, you know, and, and I, I don't know, maybe this, how do I justify it as a conservative working in the public defender's office, right? Well, first of all, I think I'm doing my client a disservice if I'm putting one of those motions out on behalf of my client, because it's going to get laughed out of court. You are not representing your client. You're pushing your own personal agenda right. onto the world. You're not representing your client and putting forward your best arguments for your case or one that's effective or even within the realm of law. Instead, you're saying, I want to push the thing to prove that I'm right and my politics are right, and I want the court to agree with me. Because so, so you're using your client as a tool to promote your political thing. And I think that's a betrayal of your attorney-client yes. your attorney-client responsibilities. Just like if you're, I'm here to give that guy a fair trial, make sure he's got a fair trial. And I got a lot of problems. I'm very anti-death penalty, and that's we can get into that someday if you want. <laughs> I know. I'm. I, used, I, I I used to be pro-death penalty. I used now. to be fifty-fifty. Okay. And uh, I was actually, when I was at the prosecutor's office, I was actually in line for the Capitol prosecution team. Mm. I actually went to the Capitol prosecution team on the prosecution side on the, when I was a prosecutor. And I, I really, and this is a faith thing, excuse me for being a witness to my faith, but how, I really feel that God, you? I was happy doing a prosecution and I was pushing to be a Capitol prosecutor. And I think God did not want me in that role. Yeah. And he said, I want you on this side. I want you. And since I've been on this side, I've seen things that are like really open my eyes. Like I thought that everybody like when, for example, when I was prosecuting, you know, somebody, a lawyer, defense lawyer come to me and they'd say, OK, well, this is what we think happened. I'd say, well, we got witness. We got a factual disagreement or we got a legal disagreement. If it's a factual disagreement, you know, maybe I will have a trial. Right. Or if there's a legal disagreement, file your motion. And if you win, I'll drop the case, right? 
mm -hmm. let's talk facts and law. Well, I thought that's the way that law was practiced. That's the way you're supposed to do as a prosecutor, right? Coming over to the defense side, all of a sudden, none of that was discussed. I don't, I, yeah. I, I never remember. It's like, it's all about, if you do this and I'm going to t add charges, I'm going to ask for prison. If you do this, it's all about threats and intimidation and how much I can extract out of your client and extract a plea based on threats. Yep. And, and that is a betrayal gross. of law too. And it's, and, and you, you know this, uh, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, but half of that is based on the prosecutor's own ambition because they have a numbers page. They have a tally of, of wins. They have a conviction rate. And um, a lot of these people are motivated in some way and they can say, look, yeah. I'm running for governor. I'm running for attorney general. I'm running for house representative. I'm running for state house, state senate. And guess what? As a prosecutor, I was tough on crime. I did this. Look at my conviction rate. Look at what we did. And like a conviction rate is just a conviction. Japan has a 98% conviction rate. I wouldn't want to be in Japan's criminal justice well, system at all. What does conviction rate have to do with justice or fairness or truth or falsity or innocence or guilt? Not you know, a thing. it's like, so I'm, I've got a client and he's innocent and I go and the, and the prosecutor says, well, he's got a third degree felony. I'll let him plead to a misdemeanor, but he's innocent. He didn't do it. Well, I'm sorry. Statistically, we got to, we got to give him a plea. Yep. I, mean, I had the, I had the elected prosecutor tell me once, like I had a, a first degree felony and I was prosecuting it. This is the current prosecutor. <laughs> and uh -oh. he says, yeah. Uh, maybe I shouldn't tell his story, oh, but, of you, course know, you should. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm saying like, he, he he's, uh, I said, the guy's a witness and I dropped the case because he was a witness. He didn't do it. Yeah. He was a witness. Right. And it, but it's like, and it's like, why did you drop that case? You could have gotten him a misdemeanor at least. It's a conviction rate, right? Yeah. Why? Because he's innocent. He didn't do it. I got a, I have an ethical duty to drop a case. And that, and you say that to a prosecutor today, and it's like a lot yeah. of them. Now, not everybody. There's good people there, but the fact that the fact They're that it's hard even to find. a question. If somebody's not guilty, you have an ethical duty to drop the case. You don't plea it out to some misdemeanor because you can threaten them with a felony. So I had, uh, I've, I've talked about this case a lot on my show, but I, I had a case, it was a domestic violence case. And the victim hired me to represent the, the uh, accused. Um, the victim and the accused had been dating for a bunch of years. They were not married. And the, the victim, the purported victim, I should say, had a 16-year-old son from a prior marriage. Um, I, so I think they had been dating for 10 years. The son was 16 from a prior marriage. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the accused had come home, and this is the story. He found that the son was in a almost physical confrontation with the mom. And as the son advanced on the mom, he, he wrapped his arms around him just to hold him, just to restrain him from attacking, basically. The kid, uh, the 16 year old breaks free, free of the grip and runs outside. The mom and this guy both follow him outside. And when he gets outside, he gets hit in the face with a shovel, right? Out, just bam. Uh, and then the kid runs off, grabs rocks and starts throwing it. And so they retreat inside. Police arrest the kid for some other thing. And when they arrest the kid, he says that this guy beat, uh, beat him. So please show up. This guy's got like a knot on his face because he got hit in the face with a shovel. And uh, they arrest this guy and charge him with domestic assault of this kid. And so, you know, they they take him in. And the uh, the alleged victim, she's uh, Hispanic origin, doesn't speak great English. She handwrites a letter at my request. I'm like, handwrite a letter. Tell me everything. I'll present it to the prosecutor. We present this to the prosecutor. She will not be cooperative at all for the prosecution. She tells the story. She's like, this is exactly the story. He didn't, he has never hit me in 10 years. He has never been physical. He was not physical on this day. I do not want this. My, uh, my son, uh, my son hit him and, and, and my son has been arrested for other things. Present him the letter. He says, okay, I'll think about it. We get, we get to the pretrial uh, hearing that morning, right before our hearing, 
the son confesses to everything and says that he lied about being assaulted by the by the guy. He 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 says I made that up to deflect and try and get the cops off my case. I'm pleading guilty, takes full responsibility, drops everything. So I go in, I've got a big smile on my face talking to this prosecutor. I'm like, "All right, we going to drop this case?" He says, "No." Like you're you're joking. We've got a confession on record, retraction of the accusation. I've got a letter saying that it didn't happen from your only witness. He says she's been accused of a crime of dishonesty before. I'll get her testimony thrown out. He's being convicted. I'll get his testimony thrown out. I'm going after this guy. I'm like, why? Why are you doing this? Like, what the hell is your problem? You know he didn't hit this kid. He's like, no, I'm going for it. After a bunch of back and forth, he did drop the charges. But, but it see, took- people don't realize how much effort and work it takes to get to that point. You gotta yeah. you gotta kill it to get him like you got I I mean, oh the the, the pain <laughs> behind getting a prosecutor to actually drop a case. Yeah. You have to go so far, it's like you are guilty. And it's a betrayal. I wrote an article on this, actually. <laughs> I wrote, wrote an article. Actually, a, a lot of stuff. See, what I do, I, you know I write articles, academic yes. articles. And, and almost all of them come from real-world problems from the trial division that I've encountered that, like, that you get people saying, like, for example, what's the appellate rate? Because clients always say, well, I'm just going to appeal. <laughs> you know, and they think that that's like they could, oh, they're just going to appeal and everything. I'm like, they can do whatever and I'm just going to appeal. Or like one of them is prosecutors, prosecutorial misconduct and closing argument. I had a judge who's really brilliant, great criminal trial judge. Actually, mm-hmm. I work with him. He helped train me. I know the guy. He knows criminal law backwards and forwards. And we had a trial and the prosecutor was all over the place on their closing arguments over the line on multiple things. And he was not sustaining my objections. And he yep. was wrong. He didn't know the, the law of criminal justice when it comes to closing arguments. So I wrote this whole, I used to train the prosecutors too. And so I put on how a prosecutor should prosecute problems in closing arguments and then solution. That's a, that's one of my best articles actually is on closing arguments. You know, you on an SSRN page, right? Yes. I promote that, but no, it, I don't get any money for it. <laughs> no, you don't. It sucks. <laughs> but anyway, you can look up SSRN God. You should and, open and, a locals page and publish your papers on there, Actually, Brock, it, he gave me some advice to be a grifter. I'm trying to learn. <laughs> you got to learn. He said, I need to take all those articles and publish them in a book. Yeah. And then say, like, if you want to support me, buy my book for 20 bucks. There you go. That's a good I'm, I'm going to do that, but I've got to get through the law of self-defense course first, but <laughs> then I'll have something to sell because and a lot of people, I mean, you know, you've got, I, one thing I've noticed, there's a, there's so many good people in the world and it's yeah. so nice to be around like normal people. <laughs> I mean, like you got, you know, even the chatters are normal, even though they pretend to be crazy. And a well, lot of people normal really do want to support you. Like they want to support you, Nick. Because you are providing a voice for them that's not being heard. Mm-hmm. And so their support to you is almost like it's like their way of voting for you to get that voice heard. And so and I saw so I, you know, I need to be grifter more and have something that they can support me when I'm saying stuff. But speaking it'll of, probably be next year. <laughs> speaking of grifting, guys, remember grifties.com. To support the number one grifter, I'm winning. I'm the current world champion of the grifties for 2022. It's all in the right place to learn how to grift. You are in the right place. I am the master. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's wild. What you say one thing. So I I watched snippets, not the whole thing, but I watched a lot of the Chandler Halderson trial. This is a case up in Wisconsin where a kid uh, killed his parents, Mm -hmm. um, chopped them up and distributed them in various places and they only found parts of them. It was really a, a kind of an awful story in general. But, um, and I'm pretty sure Chandler did it. Like, I'm relatively convinced. Now, what what I think is, I think his girlfriend had a big part in it. Mm-hmm. And I think that the state was really just, like, kind of letting her slide on it. Now, the girlfriend was, is always the witness. They, I'm, they I'm, I think the girlfriend was the cook. Well, I understand that, but but I'm saying that as a prosecutor, it's much harder to convict a pretty young girl. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. The 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 uh, the V card is a a strong strong thing in criminal law. 
That well, does. and men are naturally protective of women, right. regardless of any political correctness. That is genetically inbred. And we are always, and, and especially in, that is just part of who you are. And so yep. when you have a, a young, pretty girl, people are going to want to protect that. And so those are the hardest clients and the hard or the hardest, if you're a prosecutor, the hardest ones to get. So what you do is you make them your witness. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And, and the, what tipped me off to this is in opening arguments, the prosecutor goes out of his way to say, and just to be clear, like there's some things that she kind of did, but she is not part of this. She is not guilty of this crime. She didn't do anything about, she was an unwilling participant, unwitting participant and all this stuff. And it's like, Oh, okay, buddy. I don't believe you at all right now. I'm pretty sure that she may have murdered them and he helped her clean up. And now he's getting pinned. Like that's how, that's how overt this guy's defense of her was. But the, the trial was pretty interesting. It was really vanilla and boring for most part. They had this guy from opening argument. I mean, they had plenty of evidence that he killed his parents. However, in closing argument, the prosecutor takes this moment, and he was really good throughout the whole – like, he was very able prosecutor. But in closing argument, he says, the defense attorney here – this is an unrebuttal even. The defense attorney – she was a public defender – is asking you to lie for Chandler Halderson. She is getting up here and telling you that you need to lie. And she's like, objection. objection? That's a disparaging defense. It, it was it was amazing. And it's like, I'm sitting there screaming like, this is a mistrial. Like this trial has been done. I, I actually think it was a mistrial because they allowed all the witnesses to testify in masks, which I think is a, an absolute- That's another uh, issue. That, yes, because those masks were really effective at presenting the preventing the spread of COVID. They were certainly effective at preventing your ability to discern whether someone was truthful or not, though. <laughs> That's and I, so I'm like I'm already freaking out about that. But like the conduct of the prosecution and the defense was relatively okay throughout the trial. I I thought he could have used a little bit better defense, but at the same time, it's like well, but he, he got a competent enough defense. And then when, when, but when that guy said that, I'm like, mistrial, this is, this is over. And the judge comes back and instructs the jury. He spends like three minutes doing this pained thing to like instruct the jury about how the prosecutor wasn't actually saying you, he's asking that they were asking you to lie. I'm like, he literally just said it. Like it was so crazy. And it's like prosecutorial misconduct. I that that article you need to read that because that that is really goes all into this about why prosecutors lie. It's unethical. They never get called on it. They never get punished, and it's it's a problem. It's a big problem. The system is unchecked power of the prosecutors. Yes, and um, I, I'm very. Uh, we we need to be more aggressive in calling it. Judges need to be more aggressive, but they're afraid because they can run against them and the power and they're anti-cop and blah, 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 blah. But prosecutorial cheating is a big, big, big problem. In fact, we're going to go over that in that class. <laughs> I would Plus love it. Uh, I'll, I'll find the link and send it to you. I would love to send you that moment in Chandler Halderson's oh, uh, closing I've, argument. I've, seen the, I've lived it. It's painful. <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, is that the state can get your guys legally and fairly and they have a duty because they represent the people like say of florida yeah your client is a citizen of florida they have a duty to follow the law and to play fair because my client is a citizen just like the victim and just like everybody else and when they cheat they are undermining the law which is their primary duty my job is to advocate their job is to follow the law and when they're not following the law, they are betraying their duty. And, and the thing is, they're going to get your guy anyway. This yes. is the thing. It's like it, it, a good prosecutor can keep a defense attorney in their seat. Yep. And you can kind of you could run a whole trial and never have an objection and nail the guy to the wall. Oh my gosh! You got the goods. In this if, case, that that same prosecutor, I'm telling you, he won at opening argument. It right. was so damn good. And he, he tells the story. It was, it was mastery. Like he tells a story and he goes, but that's not what happened. And then he twists it. I'm like, you son of a bitch. And then he twists it and he starts telling you, and then he lays out 
all this evidence and all of these things they have to put Chandler Halderson there. And I'm like, this guy just, I mean, he just won at opening argument. I don't know what witness you're going to get to come in and counteract this thing. And his, his defense's argument, his defense's closing argument and their opening, this guy tells like an hour long story. Their opening argument was, was 12 minutes or so. And right. it was basically like, well, but reasonable, but doubt does exist, though. Like, that that's all they had. When I was a prosecutor, we had a case once. I remember it was a second-degree felony. I had it to the jury. We picked a jury the day before. Started at 8.30 in the morning. I had it to the jury at 10.30. And they came back guilty before 11. Oh, so shit. it was like, you don't need to have. It's simple. It's yeah. not complicated. Play fair. Play the rules. And you're going to win. I mean, there's no magic trick. The reason that the system exists is to protect somebody's rights and protects their fair trial. And when they cheat, they undermine the law. And I I don't know how how you can get that across. But see, the the article explains why they cheat, because they want to win. And they think that get the winning is their object. And they become an advocate for guilt rather than an advocate for justice and an advocate for the law. Um, you know, the problem, the system, and the same thing happens with a judge. A judge needs to be an arbiter, a fair arbiter and application of the law. Whereas a defense attorney, you are an advocate for your client mm-hmm. and you are to put the state to their proof. The state's got to be an advocate for the law and the truth, theoretically, and the judge is an impartial arbiter. The system is not failing because defense attorneys are not advocates for the clients. The system fails when the judges and the prosecutors cheat in their responsibilities. And that's that's really we live in an adversarial process and it takes all three of those sides to be functioning. And mm-hmm. I've had a case. I had a horrible case, the worst case of my life, where we had an, an actually innocent person that went to prison for 10 years and we had full team effort, full to the bore. And but we had a judge and a prosecutor who didn't play by the rules. And when yep. they when you've got that combination, they can put innocent people away. Absolutely. And, you know, defense can't do anything when you have that combination. Um, uh, anyway, I'm just talking. What? What? No, what right. I wanted to bring up. Well, I got one other thing on my note. I was going to write down. Oh yeah. If you want? I, I was told. Bronca told me that that you like stories. And one I of my do. best stories, my best trial stories, was the was on World's Dumbest Criminals. I, <laughs> yeah. I oh, promise, no. Yeah. <laughs> I okay. prosecuted a guy named um, Milano, Joey Milano, also okay. known as Joey Calco. He was a mob. In fact, I, maybe I shouldn't talk about this. He was a mob hitman Uh-oh. who had killed at least three or four people up in New York and Damn. had con- been convicted of murder in New York, but turned against and turned state's evidence against the Bonomo crime family. And was living in Florida as in the witness protection program when he was involved in a pizzeria. He owned a pizzeria in Palm Coast, Florida. And in Palm Coast, some customer didn't get the calzone that they wanted. (laughs) And so he got into a fight with his customer over a bad calzone. Oh, anybody should fight over a bad calzone. Yeah, well, don't you know who you're talking to? I yeah. kill people, right? You're talking to me, right? I mean, this is the kind the guy I'll was fold right you up and put you in an oven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so there's this whole confrontation between Joey, the mob hitman, and these rednecks from the Benel. <laughs> and and so I had to prosecute this guy. And the, the interesting thing about that case was the um proving that this guy was who he was, because I had to prove for prior convictions that he was a convicted murderer. And the state, the, the feds wouldn't cooperate. They don't want to tell me he's in the witness protection program. So I had like all these tattoos and stuff. And, and I actually got to talk to the guy as a prosecutor. He wanted to talk to me. He was actually quite a nice guy, very charming guy. You know, he wanted us like, can we just talk? Can we just talk? He was like right out of a comic book. He's like, oh, yeah. Won't you give me a deal? You know, I'm a good guy. You're a good guy. He's trying to, you know, the, the defense attorney wanted him to convince me to give him a better deal. And I'm like, look, the boss says 10 years of the deal. Won't you give me eight? You know, it's between you and I'm like, I'd love to. I think you're cool, but you know, ten years is the offer. So he was right out of a comic book. And if you look it up on the internet, it's on YouTube. World's dumbest criminals, Joey Calco and the and the 
calzone attack. That was my case I prosecuted. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was quite an entertaining thing. And he was, he did, he did, we got him on some gun charges and some other stuff. And he ended up doing 10 years plus three years. Oh, and then they violated, of course, his, his convictions in Florida violated his federal probation, right? Right. Of course. For three murders. <laughs> you know how much he got for that? What? Six months. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane so he got 10 years out of florida and six months for the murder for the murder by probation violation I oh my gosh but he wrote a that's book and he, he wrote a book nonsense. in prison Talk about, that's the broken system right there oh uh, i don't know i don't i don't know anything about that all i know is we got him 10 years down here there you go uh by the way guys um the little plus button on the bottom left side below that's the likes i noticed where I'm I'm grifting here and you guys are slagging here with 883 likes on this video. We got to get over a thousand. What do you want me to do? What do you want? Do I have to drink military special tequila? Is that what I have to do? No, you know what? They're requesting you to read the breaded thing. I didn't want to do that with you on. I, I don't care. I'm I'm here for the long haul. I took a nap tonight. I took a nap today. Well, it's not about duration. It's about content. I know, but I'm just sitting here. I'll just okay. I'll just be a passive observer. I think it's hilarious. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was, just, I was because you know what's respectful. great about that is that yeah. that idiot got what he got his PhD. They hired this guy. Yes, and he's teaching students. Oh, this I know. is our public university system. Yeah, it's great. And not only that, like when he taught students, they had to go and they had to give everybody in his class A's. And then he uh, went know. back and changed him, right? Yeah, he kept he kept changing him so many times that they had to revoke his access to the system, give all the students A's, and then keep and then he was he was removed. He also sent homemade pornography to the hot chicks in class. <laughs> Cause well, I mean, that's what you do, really. Like they're at college age. It's okay at that point, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, let me read uh there's a couple more of the larger rumble rants. Let me read those and then we'll do unbreaded. We'll do that. Uh, they gotta do the like thing. What is it? Yeah, mean? wait a minute. You want me to read unbreaded? We better break at least a thousand pluses. That's what I'm saying. We break a thousand, you do the unbreaded thing. We you do a thousand pluses, I'll do unbreaded. You do fifteen hundred, and I'll take a shot of military special tequila. The the thing I hate most in life, other than Malort. So that's up to you, chat. You got a long way to go, and I'm 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 just here. So. <laughs> Okay, I'm here for the long. Like I said, I slept. I, I told my wife, I said, I'm coming on. This is outside of my zone. I don't yeah. stay up. This is like way past my bedtime. But but <laughs> I but I said, like, but Nick likes this late night stuff. And I'm in that different time zone. I'm two day two hours behind you, right? No, you're one hour ahead of me. One hour ahead of me. One hour? Minnesota? Yeah, we're just we're the next one over. Oh, okay. You're well, Eastern, a, then it's Central, then Mountain, then Pacific. What time do you get up in the morning? Morning. Do you get up in the morning? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, actually, a lot of times, so I go to bed uh, usually around 5 or 6 in the morning, and then I, I'm i usually up around noon to 1 uh, in the afternoon, unless we have something to do. Like the other night, I went to bed at 6, and I had to get up at 8. Uh, that was a That was a disaster. Um, but typically that was the Duncan night. Yeah. When I had the debate with that weirdo, uh, um, I was, I, don't know I was, why in, you, you should not have let that guy on. Don't give those people airtime. He's oh, an idiot. See, but it was, it was kind of funny though. I don't know. I, I, I did watch it. I must say, but I did only watched it because I see I was coming on your show and I'm like, I got to tune into these, this crowd, you know, and be kind of one with the guys. Did, we, yeah. did you ever talk music by any chance? Uh, yeah, we talk all kinds of music. Like I'm not a musician. I wish. He, okay. I'm going to tell you something. The chat's going to make you fun of me. I won't tell anybody. Don't tell the chat because they'll make fun of me and they're mean. Okay. Um, I love like karaoke and singing. Uh, I can't play an instrument. I would love to be able to, I can't play an instrument to save my damn life. I tried to teach myself piano a couple years ago and I just, then I started doing YouTube and ran out of time. Um, but uh, I can read notes, but I'm really slow at it. Um, but I, I have no talent for instruments. My kids play instruments like crazy. My oldest plays 
violin, guitar, uh, percussion, like uh, like a marimba or xylophone. He also plays drums and he plays, um, did I say piano? Piano. Uh, so he he's phenomenal. How uh, my old next, oldest? He's 14. And my next oldest, he's uh, 11. He plays piano, violin, and um, percussion. And then the next one plays piano and violin. The next one plays violin. She'll start piano next year or maybe this year. I think she's this year. Why the chat is saying you're gay. <laughs> well, it's coming. I also like, I, I like, so I like, uh, I love singing karaoke. I love like singing in general. And I also like to dance, um, which that's probably why they're calling me gay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bigots. Now we're, we're entering. Do you like show tunes? Uh, look, I've done, I've done musical theater. Uh, oh my gosh. I, well, now we're, okay. Sorry. We don't have to talk about music. No, no, I, now I am gay. No, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Steve, I've got a beard. Her name is lady rackets. No, it's <laughs> no, but, but I, that could just be a cover story. That's what I'm saying. That's uh, that she's my beard. Cause pretending oh, I'm oh, pretending I'm not gay. Is all the, you young kids in your new lingo. I'm I know. I know. No, but I, I, I love music. I love, uh, I, I like it like a lot. I just, I don't have the t like time to learn an instrument at this point. And I never learned well, as what a kid. Are you listening to? That's the thing. Like fanboy. I like, uh, I like everything. Like, I know that's well, a, I know I will just, a, one of the I reasons I don't I'm like the Beatles. How's that? I don't like the Beatles. Don't the Beatles like the can, no, they can catch on fire. I hate them. Okay. Well, I recognize what they did for music. I just don't really enjoy their music. Well, but no. I was just, but because Bronco was on, I don't know if, did you see this video that he did? It was like, it was really, because, you know, I'm, I'm watching, I don't know. It was some show he was watching, some shooting. What was it? Oh, no, it was the cops were beating this guy in the in the ground, right? Okay. And he was talking was about. Was it the recent one where they're yeah, like slamming recent. the guy's face into the pavement? Exactly. Jeez. And he goes and he starts the thing off and he's like, yeah, and I really want to tell you guys there's music involved here. You get audio and it's terrible. And I really apologize. And he, and he's going on for like three or four minutes about like how terrible the music is going to be. And he's apologizing, but it's important because they're going to say something and it's irrelevant. Right. So so I'm like getting ready for some like major league rap. Yeah. OK, <laughs> this, this is what I'm, I'm girded for that. And uh comes on it's master of puppets my metallica <laughs> and i'm like what so i found out that we don't have we don't relate on the musical level so what's and, your fanboy musician well i musical love group i like very broad i do not like rap and i don't like most really country you don't like wu-tang no i don't like rap there's, Check out I will my gravel. Only pit. very few things, but I I like almost everything else. I mean, I like classical, jazz. I like uh, electronic music. I'm a big metalhead, heavy metal. Not what about Sabaton? Do you like Sabaton? Sabaton's from Tampa, you know. Wait, Sabaton's no, they're oh, European. No, Sabaton, that's yeah. not heavy metal. That's pop. I didn't say Sabaton isn't pop. Yes, it's pop. Have you have you heard a band called Ginger? No, no, oh, you gotta you gotta see Ginger. Ginger, Wait, is, you're is, saying Sabaton, who you plays heard, like you metal about war, right? Like metal oh, about Meshuggah. war. You don't you don't I've, know what real metal is. I've heard of Meshuga, yes. Okay, I, I haven't them? heard them. I've heard of them. Well, Mastodon. I've heard of Mastodon. I don't listen, I don't listen to a lot of metal. Of course, I've heard Anthrax. Yeah, Megadeth. Yes, Testament. I've heard of them. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time listening to heavy metal, well, but I, I like it. It's, it's good. Okay. I know. Well, I love, uh, I love the, the melodies in metal. Like I really do like, cause at first, like you're just like, okay, this is loud or whatever. But then like, when you listen, the melodies in metal get really complex mm -hmm. and I love that. Uh, and, and they, they're, they're engaging and there's, um, well, I, I have a challenge for you. Okay. And you, you need to do this. Maybe we, you need to watch. And this is like, this is sort of almost cliche. And the, they're probably going to light me up in the chat because my favorite band right now is, is Ginger, which okay. is with a J, J I N J E R. Yeah. No, the chat's on your side. I'm, I'm the gay boy here. You're doing fine. Okay. Well, the, and the, the cliche is to watch a video by Ginger, not research them, but watch a video called Pisces and just react to it because. Okay. You will, it's a mind. I will tell you 
that's a great song, but I like everything they do. Their lyrics are poetic. They're from Ukraine and they're, right. they're a great metal band. It's one of the best metal bands I've heard in a long time, but their singer is outrageous. The band is outrageous. Um, you ever heard of animals as leaders? No, but have you heard of glory hammer? No. What? Look, I'm going to write. I'm going to write. I've heard, I've seen, I've listened to Sabaton. Not my thing. It's a little too poppy for me. A little too power metal. But no, I, I, so I love glory hammer because they're, uh, it's a, it's like a story. It's like a fantasy, like dark Gothic story that they're telling. I love okay. that. It's great. Um, uh, let's see. Hoots force is the, the song that comes up for me all the time. I like them. Um, on the metal side, uh, who else do I listen to? Oh, uh, do you do you ever listen to Brothers of Metal? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, I don't care about the rest of their songs at all, but there's one song by Brothers of Metal called Yggdrasil. It's Y-G-G-D-R-A-S-I-L. <laughs> they've got a spelling issue. No, it's uh, it's it's uh it's a Norse mythology. I think it's like a giant fucking tree in Norse mythology, the tree of Yggdrasil. Okay, I'll and check it out. See, is I, this is awesome. why I like talking music because I'm always open to new stuff. There's a guy named Lewis Cole. I don't know if you've heard Lewis Cole. Mm -mm. He's great, jazz guy from L.A. And uh, but he's but he's kind of like he's out there. Great drummer. Um, sure. And there's a there's a band called. Um, I mean, actually, a lot of this because my son, I think there's been a resurgence of music. There was like a wasteland of music for like a decade. And but and maybe it's just because I didn't have my son. He's gets gets me back in the mouth. Oh, I'll tell you. Here's a cool factoid. I, you, you you like stories? I love I'll all tell stories. you a quick story. Okay. I actually showcased the Roxy Theater with my rock band in college. We won a songwriting contest and won a trip to L.A., Nice. And played the Roxy Theater in front of a bunch of music executives. Spent a week in L.A., recorded our song, recorded in a studio right next to Billy Idol. Awesome. So in my younger years, I was quite the bass player. Okay, well, I went and saw Slipknot in concert. That's, that's pretty good. That's good. Now you're getting there. <laughs> no, my, my, favorite, uh, my favorite band, though, is Stone Temple Pilots. Always has been. Uh, love STP. Um, but, yeah, I used to I'm go kind of a, like I, I so. Mean, Zeppelin. I, Zeppelin is at the pinnacle. Police, Rush, you know those are great. Those are the greats. But you burn so you're them like, out so much. You you're like ten years stuff. older than me, I think. I'm I'm fifty. I'll be. Let's see. I was born in sixty-seven. Okay, you're a little bit more than ten years older than me. I was born in eighty-one. Well, I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. So that, but that that explains some of the musical differences. Because, like, so when I was in high school, I was going and seeing. Uh, Slipknot, uh, mm -hmm. White Zombie, uh, Power Man Five Thousand, um, uh, Static X, like uh, that. That's what that was kind of like my music scene in high school. After high school, like I completely brand uh, well that and punk, but I completely like branched out. Now I like a whole bunch of shit. I I like whatever. I like anything that makes me move. Like I can I can listen to an Ed Sheeran song and follow that up with uh, Dragon Force and be completely happy. Like Dragon I, Force, <laughs> yeah, that's a silly show. Oh, well, check out. I Ginger. love silly shit though. It's like I love that they've combined. It's too positive. It's too happy. I like Dragon dark. Force is too hop happy. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! How dark are you, sir? <laughs> If, I mean, uh, well, have you ever heard, have you ever heard Testament or, or Miss Sugar? <laughs> have you heard of, uh, have you heard Ghost at all? Do you like Ghost? No, not my thing. A little too doomy, too slow and doomy. I like the, I like their visual aesthetic. It makes me Yeah, happy. but they're also sort of like, you know, the, uh, we're devils, you know. Yeah, they're kind of weird. For uh, a Catholic, not, I get it. I get you it. Know, yeah, well, it's just, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's just, eh. I mean, it doesn't add. I mean, it, it, it's kind of ridiculous, and I mean, it's. I don't know. There, there's, no, I, there's, I have limits. There's, you know, there's really no accounting for taste. Actually, no. the reason I like talking music is I like to hear people. I've got some. I've got Glory Hammer and Brothers of Metal. Yes, so I'm always looking for suggestions of stuff that like somebody's really into, so I can check some stuff out. You know, I can listen to Yggdrasil over and over. It's so dumb. I don't even know why. I just love. I love that song. It's got all of the things that I like in it. Cause like I'm, 
uh, the thing I like, since I can't play music, I really care about vocals a lot. Um, and I love like, uh, I love either extremely competent duets, uh, make me really happy or really interesting duets. And that's what I like about Yggdrasil. So brothers of metal has like a female lead and a male lead and they're vastly different, but they work really well together. And, uh, and so that, like that makes me. I wish really I happy. could sit here and watch you react to Ginger because, <laughs> but um, what's it? Domi and DJ. I mean, so my my son has told me about this group. It's a it's a duet, a drummer and a keyboard player. Okay. Oh, Buckethead. Forgot about Buckethead. Is smoking. I've I've heard heard about some, Bucket. I've heard of Buckethead, but I, I don't listen. I've to seen him like eight times. I took our. We had some exchange students. My wife works for local colleges. And so we'd always, I'd, we'd always like mentor the exchange students. <laughs> I took yeah. one of our exchange students to see Buckethead. <laughs> Was not what's his the, thing. What's the greatest concert you've ever been to? Well, that's now you now see, this is the, I love this. Now we're talking, forget this law stuff. <laughs> yeah. Why were we talking about law for so long? It's stupid. What's this the best stupid. concert you've ever been to? Well, I'll, I've, I've got, I'll, I'll make, I got to expand it to a couple more. The first concert I ever saw was War. Okay. You know, why can't on the Why Can't We Be Friends tour? Yeah. They were in a Peabody Theater. The singer came out of the <laughs> came on came off the stage, came in the audience during Why Why Can't We Be Friends. I was like eight years old and had me sing Why Can't We Be Friends. I was like the only white people in the audience, you know. <laughs> and I was a little kid and I was like, Why can't we be friends? And that awesome. was that was pretty cool. Yes, I saw yes at Lakeland Civic Center during the 90210 album, whatever that was. And I was on the front row. That was amazing. Sure. I saw Tool with my son recently, and that oh. was a great show. Probably the best arena show I've ever seen other than Yes. I've heard Tool's really good live. I haven't Tool seen them live. Tool amazing. And then, um, and then I would say uh, I've seen Anthrax. So many. Oh, Animals as Leaders. We saw. I've seen Anthrax like 10 times. I've seen Megadeth 10 times. I saw Megadeth on the Rust in Peace tour in Daytona, right across the street at the bar that everybody gets killed at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they, played that, they played that show and during the Rust in Peace tour, which was, that was, the, although I don't remember it as much as I, but that was, that was a phenomenal show. But the other one is um, Animals as Leaders. That was the greatest mosh pit. Um, I like to get like right in the, like if you ever been to a metal show in a pit? Yeah. Okay, well, I've so, been to I've been to X Fest and Oz Fest and uh, and and Family Values tours. So yeah, I mean, I I, I guess I I don't know if they measure up to your level of metal, but sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you've got the stage, I like the way I like to do. Is there's a stage here. You'll get yeah. the people on the front, and then you'll get a circle pit going. Yeah, I like to get right behind the circle pit, okay. and the reason is because you get you get half the fun at a metal show is the crowd. So you right. get the pit going, you get to see all the entertainment in the pit and then the bands in front of them. So you get a visual sight of the front yeah. row, you get the right, the middle. So you get the stereo effect and you get the whole pit going. Right. So, you get to see everyone else get their ass kicked while also enjoying the show. Yeah. I've been in the pit a few times, but, <laughs> but it's, uh, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be in there at all. Uh, <laughs> So I was at, uh, I was at um, Pantera and, uh, and uh, I can't think of their name, uh, Slipknot, Pantera and Slipknot. Wow. And I think System of a Down was there. Um, God, it was a good show. And uh, so this is at the Target Center in Minneapolis, big arena and uh, Slipknot gets the entire floor. My buddy and I were actually not on the floor because we were getting a little older at this point. And uh, he get, they get the entire floor into a tornado. The whole floor was a giant cyclone of people just running around beating each other. It was it was so cool. Well, that was, the Animals of Leader show yeah. was almost like I'm, I wasn't really into I, well, I was sort of into him, but not really huge. And my son was sort of I know what he likes. He likes the extreme stuff. Yeah. Like what's a group called Death Grips he's into that I can't get into. Oh, but, Death Grips. I know Death Grips. You know, I can't get into them, but I, I appreciate it, but I'm not my thing, you know. But we went, we're going to go see Meshuggah in October, actually, in Orlando. 
but we went to this animals of leaders show and that was the best crowd the, the crowd was educated you know they they pogo at the right time they they'd sing the crowd they do the pit it was like that was the most educated crowd i've ever seen it was a great crowd orlando and ginger they're going to be coming back in december and i'm going to see them again in orlando that that band i'm telling you that's one of the best bands out there right now great metal band so recent show so the first show i ever went to was air supply oh gosh well you don't have to admit that you know <laughs> I was, now you're I was you know is that like show that's close to show tunes you know i was tiny like i'm i'm like like you like you were eight or whatever i was somewhere between six and nine i don't know how old i was uh, I barely remember. I don't remember the show. I remember coming back from the show and talking to my grandpa about it. Mm -hmm. And he was admonishing me because I was like, oh, this is a neat thing or whatever. And he's like, ah, it's because that's that rock and roll. And you like all those lasers. It's, it, this is air supply. He's talking about because he was he's like a Johnny Cash and guy, you know, he's like old country. And so he's like, you get a guy with a guitar, you put lasers around it'd be the same. You'd, you'd like him just as much. And I'm like, OK, OK, Jaja, that's great. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about at all. But um, so the first show I went to was Air Supply. But more recently, I've been to very refined shows. Uh, I saw Weird Al, which was oh, yeah. fantastic. Uh, I saw Kevin Costner's band. Kevin Costner has a band. Kevin Costner has a band. Who knew? <laughs> He's the guitarist and lead singer. It's exactly what you'd think it might be. Um, it's great, but I will say his his the the lead violinist because they don't have a lead guitarist. The lead violinist for Kevin Costner's band is so much better than the rest of the band that it's embarrassing. He's he's amazing. He's great. I saw uh, Steve Martin. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Steve Martin's bluegrass band. I, I know, I know of it and I respect, he's a great banjo player. So good. And their, their band is phenomenal. They're like, it was watching them. It was like, this is, this is music. Like these are people who have loved music and hung out together forever. They're great. Um, I saw Pat Benatar. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually I saw her recently at the, at the Peabody over here, which is in Daytona. She's and still she's got it. Still got it. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, I'll, I read, I, I like to read rock autobiographies sort of in my spare time. That's what I do. That's one of my like pleasure reading. And um, her biography wasn't the greatest. Um, I wasn't the worst is, uh, <laughs> you know, I feel a duty because I'm from Daytona and the Allman brothers are from Daytona. Yeah. When I went to high school, I went to high school at the same high school that the Allman brothers went to. And so all the teachers would tell us Allman brothers stories, you know? Right. And so I felt a duty to read this autobiography by Greg Allman. That is the worst autobiography. It was embarrassing. <laughs> it's horrible. Although Sting, and I'm a, Sting is like one of my all time. He's like my, I'm, see, that's my bass right back here. Yeah. Um, that he, Sting is like my, one of my favorite bass players. Sting, Steve Harris. And, and Davey 504. What's that? And Davey 504. Who's that? Oh, oh, Steve. Davey 504? You got to go on YouTube. And if you love bass, you got to type in Davey 504. Oh, is that that guy that's kind of like, he, he's a, he's Italian. He's okay, very, yeah. I, I know who you're talking about. I Everybody who plays bass knows who Davey is. <laughs> well, you know, what can I say? Well, I it was Sting and the police. I'd say the police, not so much Sting. But as Sting is a bass player and the police... Great yeah. player and Steve Harris, Iron Maiden. I can play everything by Maiden, everything by the police, everything by Rush. Those are like my go-to bands. And then why don't you do just do a YouTube channel? Lawyer plays Iron Maiden. <laughs> I've, I've just what, I get one viewer, first... right? Oh my god, no. You just got I just gave you your first like 40 videos of content. Like just do 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 do. It'd be awesome. Do it. Well, I have a real job. I'll come on your channel and do it and bore you guys. But what was it? Bore us? Oh, my God. That would be so cool. Oh, get, chat. Do you want to see public defense of base? Like, oh, my. Like, argh, that is to me, man. I, I I love it. You have no idea. Yeah, let me show oh, you. yes. Get it. <laughs> There's the uh, look at this baby. Oh, that's, that's so great. God. That beautiful. I have like six guitars in my house and nobody can play any of them. It's amazing. This is, 
This is called the Suspector. You know what it is, Specter? Specter Basses? No, I don't know anything about basses. Play us a riff, though. Well, let's see. This is, let's see, Iron Maiden, like Wrathchild. You ever heard that? No, I like, couldn't identify it. This. <laughs> something like that you know i wish i could do that you have no idea how much like you talked about jealousy earlier that like my entire body is green right now <laughs> you're really jealousy see actually now you're gonna see that i'm really wearing pajama pants that was my entire goal was to see if you were even wearing pants at all <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, that's that's um, I'm a big fan. I, I love instruments. Beautiful. I, you know, I used to play, but yeah. now I just love beautiful instruments. Spectre instruments are beautiful. They're just like um, there's a whole history of them. But that's you want to see my, my you want to see my craziest instrument? If you give me like 30 seconds, I'll go. Yeah, right let me see. It. I want to see. Something. Okay, I'll be right back. All right. This thing is weird. What if the chat knows what he's going to get? What is the chance? <laughs> the pants are like, yeah, yeah, naked time. It's not naked. It's um, somebody asked in the uh, chat about Tatiana playing with the other group. Yes, I saw that band. I, I saw that that clip. Tatiana's amazing. She's the lead singer for Ginger. The whole band is great. The bass player is smoking. Anyway, okay, just enough so. Ginger. I'm I'm such like I'm so sold on that band. Every song I love, and there's very few of those that I can. Uh, what, so let me see what you get. What is you got an instrument? I, I can't play that. I can't play anything. No, this is uh, so this is not like something super fancy or crazy. It's just weird. Um, this is a, a Tahitian ukulele <laughs> with eight strings, but it's actually it's like uh, they're doubled up. But the, the weird thing is they're all the same size string, so you have to tune them by tension. Uh, it's weird as fuck. I don't know how you play. My brother-in-law can play this. Um, okay. Because he's he's wild. Why do you have this? Why do you have this? Just because I was in Tahiti, and what do you do if you're in Tahiti other than buy a stupid Tahitian ukulele? I bought a Belalaika when I was in Russia, so I guess I guess that, <laughs> that I understand. Well, there was nothing to buy in Russia. I was in ninety. Oh right. shit! Yeah, <laughs> no, there's it, nothing there at all. It was like you had all this. We went there. We had all this cash, and it's like you go in a store, and there's nothing in the store. I right. bought all these watches. Yeah. They had watches for sale, and nothing. Yeah, my and grandpa had, couldn't get rid grandpa, of our rubles. My grandpa brought me a Russian watch in the '90s, be, probably because that was all he could buy. He was over there a lot because he was a chemical engineer, and he would build, uh, he would build oil refineries, mm. um, uh, design oil refineries. Other people would build them, I guess. Um, but, but yeah, that's what he did. But no, we, the, the only, the other thing I have, um, I have a, uh, I have a ukulele that was played by like a Hawaiian ukulele that was played by, um, who the fuck was, uh, Steven Tyler. Uh, but I can't, I can't get it out cause it needs heavy repairs. The back of it is, is thoroughly cracked. Um, and I have a guitar signed by Kevin Costner. <laughs> <laughs> i don't but think the, that adds much value actually it doesn't add any va yeah. well it added a whole lot of value from uh for the charity that i bought it from but we bought it for the charity we didn't buy it for the you know that was right. the whole I thing got you. no i'm with you but well, uh but yeah no i like my my wife loves uh she loves instruments we have them hanging like all over uh the house but they're mostly just kind of normal um you know, here, here's another one. I'm going to show you. This is yeah. A, this is a uh, Les Paul. Nice. Gibson Les Paul standard. This baby. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, this is a beautiful. See, I love, if you'll notice, there's a common theme here. I love guitars with beautiful maple tops and sunbursts like that. Yeah. There's something very beautiful about that, you know? at 89 but you can play that right like yeah yeah you know yeah that sort of stuff let me tell you the difference between you and my wife right my wife loves beautiful guitars and can't play them for shit she can't play anything at all 
and she's like so she comes she's like uh there's this really pretty guitar and we were both kind of looking at it uh and i uh she's like i want to learn how to play guitar and i'm like okay cool i'll buy you a guitar we'll just pick one out and so she'd been looking and incidentally or coincidentally i was looking at the same guitar for her and i i was i'd seen this thing at the music store for like a month and then I went to go buy it one day and they had just sold it that week. And I was like, damn it. I just, I waited too long. And she was like, oh, I really wanted that guitar. I was like, I knew you would. So we didn't buy it. So then the music store near us went out of business because they had been in business forever. They were just retiring. And um, we go in there and they have discounts on everything. And she's like, this is the guitar I want. And we go up and she's like, I want to buy this guitar. He's like, that's not a, that's not a guitar. That's a, that's a Baja Quinto. <laughs> right. And so she's like, oh, okay, well, this is just pretty. I'll just buy that. And I'm like, but you can't learn how to play guitar. That's a, It's not tuned the same. It's completely different. So then she buys, uh, uh, I think it's called a Baja Sexto or whatever, like the, the next one with the 12 strings. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? You can't even play regular guitar. You're not going to learn how to play. No one around here teaches mariachi. What? <laughs> yeah, it's rather limited in what it can do, right? Well, <laughs> like, one of, why I, are you buying this? One of the best jobs I ever had was selling guitars. I worked in a guitar store and sold guitars. And uh, that was that was so much fun. And I, that's what I have like a lot. I never earned any money. I mean, all my money went to buying guitars. <laughs> right. Yep. So it's kind of like, well, okay, but you really you got to be careful buying guitars. I mean, you know, that like what you're saying, it's pretty. I don't know. Got to be oh, careful yeah. of that. No, I know they they're they're awesome. And and you're like, oh, well, you know, I could put it on a wall somewhere. It'll st it'll look great wherever. Well, um, but, but you say that. But the problem is, if you don't buy the right guitar, you hang it on the wall. Then it's like the people, the real guitarists come in and say, that's eh, just a decoration decorator item. Yeah. Right. Oh, I know. You know, so you got to have a nice guitar, a beautiful guitar. You want to buy a guitar, you talk to me. I'll, I'll get, I'll hook you up with a pretty guitar. But oh, one I'm, that will be respected by guitar players. I legitimately will. And then I will make that woman learn guitar on it. <laughs> <laughs> like, you wanted to learn guitar? Here you fucking go. Play the guitar. Uh, play it for me at karaoke. No. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. play music. I, I need to get back into it. I haven't played for years. Um, but I actually brought them out because my son empty nest back there to see. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do with my empty nest here? I'm going to play some music and stuff. But I have a harp, Steve. A har really? Mm -hmm. No. Yep. I have a three foot harp. Uh, these are not rock and roll. Cause lady rackets was going to learn to play harp at one point. I'm like, who is going to teach you to play the harp? We live in the smallest town I've ever seen. There's no one around here who plays harp. This woman is insane. Harpist. That's fun. Well, you know, my I wife actually, is not, not into music at all. She's, I uh, accidentally bought the harp, though. Accident. How did you accidentally buy a harp? <laughs> so I was at the music store, and I'm like, uh, they, they had a harp or whatever. Or, no, they had like a little harp like a little, like a one foot, one octave harp. And I'm like, and I, I went up to the guy and, and I asked him, I'm like, do you guys sell like cases for harp? Like, what do you do with a harp? And like, oh yeah, we do. And, and I'm like, well, but this harp's like little, do you have like, I don't want to like a giant harp, but do you have like other harps? And they go, yeah, yeah, we can get other harps or whatever. Like there's three octave harps and four octave harps. I'm like, oh, that's neat. Cool. And so I leave. Right. Or no, they, they say, uh, do you want more information about harps? I'm like, sure. So they take my name and number down. And we, we were like leasing violins from these people forever for our kids. So they, they know us and stuff. They call me up a couple weeks later, by the way, your harp came in. Like, I, <laughs> I'm uh -oh. sorry. <laughs> what did you just say? Like your harp came in. I'm like, I didn't, I don't recall ordering harp. Oh yeah. You were in the other day talking about harps. We ordered the harp for you. So I, but I felt bad because they had ordered the harp. <laughs> Good salesman. So I was like, well, okay. So I, I have a harp. It it sits on a stand on one of our walls. So I have a harp. You need to get a real instrument. You know, I'll get you like a Martin. A Martin HD28. That's my dream acoustic guitar. No. You know what a Martin guitar is? I've heard of them. I don't know anything about them. Best guitars I ever played. It's a Martin HD28. They're rather pricey. You got to be committed. 
but I know a big rich what's lawyer rather like you. Price, what's rather price even mean anymore? Well, are they like two 25, grand? Twenty five hundred dollars. Okay, that's pretty pricey. Yeah, for guitar, because you can get like a you can get like a nice guitar with electric pickups for like six hundred bucks. Yeah, but but you do you want just a nice guitar, or do you want something worthy of the the wife that she'll be <laughs> proud of? Or if you hang it on the wall, somebody will actually say. There you go. Okay. No, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about a Martin guitar. Right. Uh, Martin guitars. That's what, like, if you, I said, well, I don't know. Maybe my, my guitar collecting days are over. <laughs> Public defender <laughs> land is not high paid land. You know, when I sell that book, when I start grifting, yes, I haven't grifted yet. I got to grift. You I got to do that. Grift. Yeah. You got to figure that out because like, and and I say that as a joke, but I say it as truth because um, to to get serious for a second, we've got so many people who uh, like getting to know you over the stream is great. We've got so many people who want to prevent people like us from ever being able to work anywhere. Like uh, just yeah. uh, just just your like nothing controversial. Just your political opinion means that somebody else thinks that not only should you not be a public defender, but you shouldn't be a, an anything. Um, how dare you, how dare you have a contrary opinion? And if we, no matter who you are, and that goes, it goes the other way too, but no matter who you are, like if we don't figure out how to participate, at least we don't have to participate, but if we don't figure out how to participate in parallel economies, any of us is on the chop chopping block at any point. You right. say one errant thing. You well, say, that's one of the reasons, like, you know, when you told me, you said that, you know, that you were having this YouTube problem mm -hmm. and like, you're only going to be on Rumble. I'm like, well, let's do Rumble, right? I mean, yeah. that's, I, I, I'm a big believer in alternative, the competition, right? Isn't that what capitalism is? It and is. I always try to say capitalism, free market economy, because capitalism was a co term coined by Marx, right? You know that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I always try to say free markets because people are for free markets and that's called freedom, right? And, and this this whole idea that some company I, now we're back on this topic, but what well, what topics have we not covered? Let's let's talk this. Have we we've talked religion, politics, um, music? music. Uh, I don't I don't know what what else is there? What else is there in life? Well, religion, there, politics, food. I guess food. My wife is the foodie. I like I like sushi. Do you like sushi? I do. I enjoy sushi quite a lot. I didn't used to, um, but I, I, I gain more and more appreciation for it every time I go. The problem I have now is when I, when I go out with someone who um, doesn't like good sushi, they just like the idea of sushi. Mm. And they're like, oh, let's go here. And it's really trash. And like, I'm not like a sushi kind of, I'm not like a snob or whatever, but you go to the, like a place with like where the sushi comes on like a belt like a, a treadmill and goes around like that is the, not good sushi boats. no 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 yeah no, actually there's a sushi restaurant in town that's it's local they, the guy only likes locals and yeah. he basically when the tourists come in town he shuts the store oh, there's sweet. no there's no sign on the the front and you go there and you know you can tell a good sushi restaurant by the asian percentage so you get <laughs> lots of asians in there <laughs> and so that's what you go in there and and so if you if you come in town, I'll show you where the good sushi place is. Like I said, Daytona's got two sides. Yeah. There's that touristy side that people see, and it's very blue collar. You know, the racers come in, the NASCAR people for the Daytona 500 and the big race week. We get the bikers in for the big bike weeks. We get the transients in for homeless week. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the transients and the Biden voters. No, I'm just the rest this. of the year. I don't know. I don't think they vote. Um <laughs> So we have we have these special events kind of driven thing, but then there's also this sort of other side where the locals kind of inhabit, um, and we you have to kind of know that in order to get anything decent. We've got some good places, but yeah, have there's you, a really uh, great sushi restaurant that actually they, they're right down from my office. He used to be open for lunch, and I would eat there every day, if five days a week. I'd eat sushi. Not only yes. is the best sushi, but it's the cheapest sushi. Nice. cheapest and best and so i'd eat there every day for lunch and then sometimes i'd go there for dinner with my wife so i'd be there every day you know but that's what he wanted to do he likes making sushi for the locals that he loves which is me. 
Have you ever so, eaten sushi off of a naked person? No, no. Did you I know that that I've was been a married thing? Twenty four years now, I think. Let's see, ninety nine. Oh, well, your wife could eat. I didn't say a naked woman. I said a naked person. What, you think I'm a, a naked guy? What do you think? <laughs> Look, I, I'm not a judge. I you I'm, were the gay one, not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, there's this movie. There's this really. There's this great movie. It's called Showdown in Little Tokyo. It's Dolph Lundgren and Brandon Lee. Okay, and, I thought uh, it was. I thought it was. Big Trouble in Little China. No, that was that's a different and much better movie. Okay. Um, no, Showdown Little Tokyo is Dolph Lundgren and Brandon Lee, uh, right? A little bit before Brandon Lee would film The Crow and Die, right? And uh, and part of the movie they they go into this place like they're tracking down these yakuza or whatever, of course, in America, and uh, and they're they're in a restaurant where they're eating sushi off of naked women or whatever. And um, Brandon Lee has this line, like, later in the movie, he's like, Dolph Lundgren's feeling down. He's like, no, we're going to go there. We're going to kill those guys. We're going to come back and eat raw fish off of naked chicks. And it's, <laughs> But then, like, these places opened as if this, like, some, <clears throat> some Americanized Japanese man came up with the most brilliant thing ever. He convinced a bunch of Americans that eating sushi off of naked people was like an ancient Japanese tradition, but it wasn't like it was just completely fabricated. And so then he started opening up this restaurant. Minis Minneapolis actually had one, but I didn't get there before it shut down. And the, the main reason I didn't go, it cost a fortune to eat there. But the main reason I didn't go is because you didn't know if your table was going to be male or female. Uh -oh. And it's like, like you said, it's like, Whoops, I grabbed the sausage with my chopsticks. No, thank you. I'm not into that. I'm I'm into fish. Uh, <laughs> okay, we've uh so it's time. It's time to do it's time to do the thing. Uh, I feel like to get the full Ricada experience, I need to at least be around. You can you can be around. I would never ask you to read any of this because I, you are I, a public and, and the thing is I would except the fact that it's, it's being recorded and I don't know yeah. if I can get, if I, if I made a mistake on a binger, it, I would never, you know, it could be haunt me for the rest of my life. So right. I, I'm not skilled enough at that type of binger substitution, but I'm, I respect the, the, the skill level that you, do. uh, you're displaying here. As a consummate professional, I will fall on this sword for you. Here we go. Here we go. I'm bread. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is <laughs> the Pope pad. <laughs> time for our daily unbreaded. Let me get out uh, God's decision maker here, the random number generator. Uh, here we go. How, how do you do that? Like, nominee at Patri et Fili et Sancti, or at Spiritus Sancti. No, wait, nominee at Patri et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. There we go. Uh, that's yeah. the. That's the Latin for it. Uh, here we go. Um, but I think it's a spirit to grifty, I think. So what do we got? What do we got today? 608. Let me check and make sure this isn't one of the crazy repetitive pages because those get. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, gosh. See, I'm in the full Ricada experience. This is the thing. This is your intro rumble. I can say I was on the inaugural rumble only show. And we you got to go the whole way and do the whole breaded experience, right? Yeah, I think I think so. And you know what? This is actually not the worst page as I'm looking at it. Okay. So here we go. There, I think there's only one binger on this page. Um, but here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Wait. All right. Tell me if you're ready. And I'm ready. Know. Let lay it on okay. me, baby. Die without forgiving a single cent. Die without forgiving a single lie. Die without forgiving her disobedience or betrayal. Die, no monkey girls. I am once in a demographic. I happen once in a kind. You can tell by the leather on his palms that he is less than human. If there is no division between men and women, then Uncle Tommy is just shitting inside his own people on behalf of the bike. I know my people are downtrodden because I cannot feel myself. I know my people are completely robbed because I cannot feel myself. I know my people are obliterated because I cannot feel 
bitches named Gabby are disgusting. Bone a petite, bone pain, bone app El Camino, bone apprentice, bone le pew pew, Pepe le pew, and familia as bona fide costra nostra f. Swarthmore hairy arms, Swarthmore hairy arms, dirt blooded sour patch lemon party, blood in the cancer. There's something wrong with bitches who partially shave their heads. Don't fuck with bitches who partially shave their heads. That means they are as bad as women who need brain surgery. If she shaves her head, she is broken and unstable. Is a compliment because there are far worse issues. It means she is lecherous and unfaithful to herself. It means she is going to use those who are kind to her to get revenge on someone else. It says she is already descended beneath what should be tolerated. She is lopsided and should be avoided like an infected tissue. Ava only gave good blowjobs because he put cigarettes out on her body. Some would call that a shortcut. You let the cracker enforce a dress code on your race, and you wonder why they call rappers sellouts. You are proud to wear a white man's name on your chest? Did I mention he's French? You think that makes it better? It makes me more like him. White? French? No, valuable and esteemed. Well, how do you ever catch up? But keeping up with each season of fashion. But that's already his name. You can't catch up to another man's name. You're saying even if I own the entire catalog, his name gets stronger the more you pay him to wear it. But I show sure look good in this here new outfit. All the ladies love me because I got the new hottest shit. You realize he defines the seasons based on what he feels like. It's better to murder him than to flatter him by obeying his dress code. Someone just said, capitalism is suicide well if binger don't kill the ones who robbed them before birth i guess they're complicit in there wait i was interrupted you act like you're the first to say it i think he said it so generally that it can be stretched to everything even himself maybe if i wasn't complicit my complaint would mean something no rapper ever then it dawns on you that the rapper who talks shit did it to have a seat at the table not to overthrow the summit then it dawns on you that he just wanted to join the problem it was never intended to be a solution he inoculated the enemies to his own presence less offended that he thinks he is something advanced this than or more that he is more advanced than me that's what it says. There you go. Happy birthday. I'm bread. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, your daily unbreaded. I like how it's it's numbered, you know? <laughs> like there's an the organization here, you know, like okay, that that thought. I'm going to move on to the next thought. And there's some coherent and and the other one is that anybody who might get offended by this I just want to say this was brought to you by higher education at UCLA. And where was this PhD from? Duke University. Duke University. Two so, of the most prestigious institutions in the United States. So we our ed, higher education system is in great hands. It's a healthy place. And this is proof positive of that. And I'm offended when anybody would get offended that you would read this. Because obviously they don't understand higher education. They do not. They do, they don't understand philosophy at its basic level. I love that we started that page on point three hundred and sixty six of that section. You know, it was it was a lot of work, and you know that you got to respect the guy's persistence. I can't write. I haven't written an eight hundred and three page book. Have you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> True, all your SSR and papers. Well, well, you know, but I will say that there's a little bit more coherence here. But can I can I also add whatever happened to this guy? Is he get I know he got arrested. He's awaiting or, trial. Okay, so he hasn't pled or anything. He hasn't pled. Um, I think they're still determining competence. I I expect um, that he's going to be determined to be incompetent. Yeah, so he's he's in uh he's in a jail in Denver, I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. um, waiting for his trial. Now, to be the, the the news when this story came out, they made it sound like the book was the problem because a popular like the manifesto was the news story. But the real news story, he did uh, send individual emails to professors at UCLA threatening to come shoot them because the first thing I did was I'm like, 
this book and I looked, I skimmed it. I didn't read all of it, but I skimmed it. I'm like, it's going to be really hard to construe this lunacy as a terroristic threat. Well, and I'm just maybe bringing in, putting the public defender hat, I guess we could talk this stuff, you know, God, I am what I am. Right. But when I, when I say this, I mean, there's clearly mental health problems here. Yeah. The defense attorney is going to be bringing that up. There are going to be mental health evaluations. And when he's determined incompetent or if he's found incompetent, <clears throat> they're committed to a mental institution. Yeah. Until they're, until they regain their sanity or their, uh, and I was like, a lot of people think, you know, like not guilty by reason of insanity, that that means they walk out of the courtroom. When mm -hmm. you're found not guilty by reason of insanity, you are committed to a criminal mental institution. Yes. Until, and that could be indefinitely. Right. So, um, so, and, and I really wish, like, there's a few things that I'd really like to change about the system. <laughs> a few, just a few. <laughs> short list. The short list. But An 803 list, page list. <laughs> on that short list, yeah, 800 page list. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, One of those things is it should be guilty but insane. Yeah. Because, um, because when the jury is given the thing not guilty by reason of insanity, they think, that they're going to walk out. And you can't tell them that as a defense attorney. You can't tell them, oh, no, if you find this, they're going to be committed to the mental institution because you're prevented about telling them about sanctions. So that's a real, you know, so we are forced to withhold the truth from the jury. I think it would be a better thing to have a plea of guilty but insane and have the same consequence but just change the name. Same thing with arraignments. And I hate it because every time there's an arraignment, the news media loves to report the guy pled not guilty. Mm -hmm. He shot up the thing and he was caught on videotape machine gunning everybody, right? And the media says, he and those guys out there and said not guilty, right? And you, you're you a liar public defender for saying that. But, you know, that is a wrong plea. And, and I, yes. I'd almost, what they should say is, well, we just got the case, Your Honor. We haven't looked at any of the evidence and we haven't talked to our client. So we need to pass this off. So enter a plea of we aren't ready yet. That would be the honest answer. But right. instead, it's it's not guilty because the state hasn't proven it beyond a reasonable doubt. And it sounds like you're lying. And it also tunes the judges because the judges, 99 out of 100 people say they're not guilty. And then they change their plea and say, oh, well, I'm guilty. Right. Yeah. Right. But then so then when the guy comes and says, hey, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. Oh, I've heard that 100 times. You're guilty, too. It, it yeah. And that this. This that matters system. at bond hearings quite a bit because, mm -hmm. uh, they're like, uh, that, that's one of the things <laughs> when, when I would get criminal clients and talk to them, one of the things you, they're like, what do I do at this first appearance? I'm like, you plead not guilty. They're like, well, but you know, that's, but right. I, this thing, and then I, you're sitting there saying, well, no, you got to plead. You're and they, they perceive that as you're telling them to lie. Now we understand from a legal standpoint that that just means that we aren't ready and that right. the state hasn't proven it. But it comes across to the public all the time, like you're defending the guilty guy and the guy is guilty. And and the system, people just, oh, well, they're just lying. And I don't, mm -hmm. I mean, I I'd almost and this is this is the kind of disruptor I can be. That's why I'm in appeals and not trials. <laughs> because I would just have a form that says, We aren't plea, enter the plea for me. We're not ready. I'm not I'm I'm standing silent under Fifth Amendment. And then have the judge, and I'd, I'd obviously talk to the judge, but I, I have a problem with kind of that lie. And people yes. say, you know, you're a paid liar. I mean, I never lie to the jury. It's one thing to say, it's one thing to say they didn't prove it or the evidence shouldn't be believed. But, you know, if the client wants to get up and say, because I wasn't there, the prosecutor wasn't there either. And so you're always viewing these cases through the lens of witnesses and evidence. And so how you construe that is different than, you know, like, do you really know what happened? I don't usually know what happened. And if, you know, and you're in the, the closer to the truth you are, the better off you are usually in a defense stance anyway. Right. Yeah. No, that, I mean, that, that's the, that's the key. The, the thing, <laughs> the thing that I spend teaching my clients is one, you don't actually know what happened. Yeah. You don't know. I mean, you have an idea of what you did, but you don't know that you're guilty or innocent yet because you aren't an expert on the law. And two, doing this plea is not saying anything other than we'll talk to you at the next hearing and the next year and maybe the next hearing and maybe the next one. Like you can change your plea uh, up until the time of trial. 
and and there's a reason for that is because maybe the state hasn't presented sufficient evidence to you. Maybe, maybe any number of things, maybe there's exculpatory evidence you don't know about. Maybe there's a witness you haven't heard of and we have to figure these things out before we get there. But, but no, I, and I, I fully agree on the, the insanity thing, not guilty by reason of insanity is, is actually the wrong phrasing. It's, right. it's guilty, but they're crazy. Like right. it's guilty, well, and, you know, but and, they from crazy. a legal technical standpoint, they are not guilty because the mens rea isn't there under, you know, the the, the mental, the intent part has right. been nullified by insanity. So theoretically, it is not guilty. But but when you're doing it, there's a consequence when you plead that not it, guilt, not guilty by reason of insanity is very rare. That's a that's one of the hardest defenses to pull over on people. Yes. And they they do not. People don't like it. They don't understand mental illness. Mental illness is really you know, all of our society problems get dumped into the criminal justice system. You know, all the drug problems dumped, mental illness problems gets dumped, homelessness, yep. every, all these problems, Pat, the fact that people are intellectually disabled or not really that smart. You know, there's a problem. I think Peterson, I'm, again, I'm a huge Jordan Peterson fan. I don't know if you ever watch him, mm -hmm. but you know, he I'm, talked about, uh, I'm familiar with Jordan Peterson. And his um oh, very see, smart he, advice. Yeah, <laughs> Kermit the Frog here. Um, <laughs> but he he talks about I think it's a huge percentage. Was it like fifteen percent? Fifteen percent of people have an IQ under eighty. Yeah, and that is not functional to even be in the military. No, or as a cannon fodder in the army, basically for drafting. And that's a big problem. And a lot of those people just end up in the in the criminal justice system. We ended up putting them in prison, you know, and, and it's because of stuff they do. But um, anyways, I'm just now I'm ranting again. No, it's but it's 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 worthy to think about, like, because everybody uh, people have this this predilection to picturing anyone else in their circumstance. So, like, you do something, some really dumb crime, like well, you mentioned world's dumbest criminals that is is what you're on but like in reality those aren't the world's dumbest criminals the world's no, dumbest no, that's criminals the are most entertaining criminals <laughs> right the dumbest criminals are actually horrifically sad stories yes. because they're people of such low IQ that they cannot function in the society that we live but we always like if your average person is 100 IQ everybody's picturing your criminal as a hundred IQ, but some of these people are like, they can't navigate basic life, which is why they're in the place that they are. And, and it's uh, yeah, very difficult. Like communicating one of the ones that's impossible to communicate to most of the people that I've talked to is felony murder rule. Yeah. Oh, felony murders. Like it's, I get it, but it it's a tough one. But you know, trying to explain that to your client, why they're guilty of murder. They're yeah, like, why why you're going to prison forever instead forever, of for like three years? Oh, I didn't kill anybody. Yeah, well, no, but that guy had a heart attack because he was really apprehensive about the knife you pulled out when you threatened the shopkeep. Or or the shopkeeper pulled his gun out and shot your buddy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you go to prison right. for felony murder. Yeah. Uh, or the cop shoots your buddy. <laughs> right. Did that that was a case not too long ago? There was a felony murder where the the officers or did they was that what they tried to charge like Brianna Taylor's boyfriend with or whatever? There was, there was one of these, uh, these no knock entries where there was gunfire exchange and one person died by the police. And then the other person was going to, was either going to be charged or was charged with felony murder for the, for the officer involved shooting. It's like, wait, motherfucker, you shoot my friend and I'm the one who has to go to prison for it forever because you busted into our place. That's crazy. One of the things I put I'm putting in the uh, the class we're doing. I was working on the theft module, yeah. And I don't know, I might delete the theft module because it's boring and it's <laughs> it's not exciting. But I was putting it together, and you have the rank orders of like you know petty theft is under a hundred dollars, right? Yeah. And then it goes up. Then there's first degree petty theft, which is a hundred to seven fifty now in Florida. Grand theft is over seven fifty, and then you get like then I was I was looking up some of the the cutoffs. And it goes, you know, to a thousand and then up to a hundred thousand, over a hundred thousand. And yeah. I was like, over a billion is government and it's completely legal. <laughs> 
Yep. Well, what's that that phrase? Kill one person, you're a murderer. Kill a thousand, you're a conqueror, or whatever. Right. From... Or, or kill a million, and it's a statistic. And, right. Yes. <laughs> well, I had a case. Here's another story for you. Talk about grinding people up. You'll you'll appreciate. It. I had a person on appeal that stole a can of spray paint from Walmart, got mm. 19 years in prison. 19 years? <laughs> what happened? PCA, they're still in prison. But I meant I meant like why 19 years? Like what was well, I like to I like to kind of fodder the field here because yeah. people, people don't understand how merciless the system can be, you know, because they, what happens is, and we're conservatives and we watch Fox News and they tell you about the Soros prosecutor in LA who lets all the people off on no bail the murders. That ain't happening here. Right. You know, it's yeah. the opposite. And, I, and I'll, I'll give you a little more context. And you'll understand this a little better because it, it seems ridiculous and it is ridiculous, but this is the law in Florida. Um, the person, when they were 18 and 19, did a string of robberies in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So they were they did 10 years in prison in Oklahoma. Sure. From 18 to 28. They get out of prison. Within a 10-year period before the theft of the spray can, yeah. they did a theft, a petty theft. They stole something from a food mart and got probation. Okay. They then commit another petty theft, which is enhanced by the earlier petty theft to a felony. Right. Yeah. So gotcha. it's felony petty theft. And because it's felony petty theft and they have a prior conviction within 10 years, that brings in the prior record. Their prior record came and hit them on the score sheet. They got 19 years in prison. God. It's like, I, I get, I get it, but come on, like, come on. 19 years it's, it's spray paint like someone should just stand by like here's your eight dollars yes i mean if i could have just go pay for it well it's kind of like the case that that uh Bron i think it was bronca talked about with the or it was the bodega shooting yeah 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 if i was behind the stabbing it, right yeah the stabbing i mean it's like here's this woman i'm like okay you want the the, the whatever goods here but here's a here's two bucks you know yeah. solve the problem Nobody has to die here. It's so I, fucking like one crazy. of my rules, we have a lot of homeless. Yeah. Is that I never turn somebody down who's homeless who asks for food. Mm -hmm. I never give them money. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, you need some food? Come on. Like, what do you want? You want a sandwich? I'll go in the store and buy you a sandwich, bring it out to you. But, you know, nine times out of 10, when you do that, when you come out with a sandwich, they're walking down the street. Yep. Because it's a scheme, but you know, it's your Christian duty to feed the peep the hungry, right? Right. Then but, I eat the sandwich. But I'm not giving them to feed their drug habit. Right. No, I gotcha. No, it's it's uh it's wild. And in the system, like they make these uh, the thing that I try to remind people of is every every law, and some laws make a lot of sense at first glance, but every law is enforced by a bullet. Uh, or in 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 a lot of in the more common case, every law is enforced by a jail sentence that's unreasonable. Um, not not that the jail sentence in the law itself is unreasonable, but that there's always something else that gets factored in. There's always some other element, some prior. There's something. The it's prior, like, you, you know, usually that's what because you, you're either dealing with really serious crimes, or you're dealing with petty a lot of petty crimes. Or right. like, or some serious crimes like in the back, and now you got some petty crime, and he's a bad guy, and we're gonna nail him on this crime here. Yeah. Um, like uh, the 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 woman that did the nineteen years got in nineteen years, she and she stole the can of spray paint. They even got the spray paint can back. She was forty eight <laughs> years old. Oh my god. Forty eight year old grandmother. Yeah, you're done. And 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 what do you do? Like you're gonna come out, you're gonna be you're gonna be 67 years old. As a taxpayer, it offends me. Yeah. That person is not a danger to community. I, I got a lot, I got so many stories you don't even know. <laughs> well, let me uh <laughs> let me finish these. We still haven't finished the the big super chats, and then I've got the rest of the super chats still. Okay, um, let's do let's grift. Let's do these. I'll and be then... expecting a big check. To the chat, I'm very <laughs> disappointed. We're we're still at 1117 rumbles, which means that's but the you did the bread thing. That was over a thousand, right? Yeah, we, we passed 100 reward. Have you ever heard of military special liquor? No. Uh, 
It looks like this. Military oh. special. This is tequila. You okay. can only buy this on a military base. It costs nothing. It's effectively free. Uh, and it tastes worse than anything you could imagine. This is the nastiest stuff on the planet. But if the chat wants me to drink this precious gem that my body, like I'm physically revulsed by this, just holding it. When I smell it, I might weep openly. If you want me to drink this, it's 1,500 likes on this video. We're, yeah, we're only at I don't know how much more Gosney can take. I'm telling you, this is way past my... So they got to start liking or... What is it? Is it likes that you need? I don't know what they call... I think they call them rumbles. Rumbles? Okay. Uh, we're at we're at 1,127. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to get there. Thank God. I don't want to drink that. I, I hate that. My, like my... When I say my body is revulsed by it, it's true. So I'm going to read the super <laughs> chats and we'll see where we get. Tech Priest Alex says, we all should worship the great four powers of chaos. Praise the chaos. Let the galaxy burn. I agree. Uh, but is this, Papa Nurgle what, what, is this special. Michael Moorcock on there? Or no, what? this is Warhammer. Warhammer 40K oh, okay. is what it is. Felwyn says, message you one of the Biden picks on Twitter from Mad Amos Malone. I looked at it and I saw the chancellor from V for Vendetta. Very terrifying. Go for big guy 911. I will be there the last weekend, September 30th through October 2nd. If you come on out, I would like to talk to you about some advertising opportunities with you. Uh, go for big guy. I'm going to, I'm going to try and convince lady raggets. We haven't been to Ren Fest in a long time. All we need is someone. I don't want to bring my damn kids to something fun. No, they can sit around at the house. Cause all they like to do is play on their iPads. Anyway, I want to take lady rackets and buy her like medieval dresses that are sexy. That's all I want to do. Uh, so I'm going to try and convince it that I'm like a girl, I'll buy you whatever you want. I'll do that. And we'll see if we can come out. Julia truth seeker says, I've watched you flip out on Duncan at the end of his part of the stream, like 10 times. Phenomenal. YouTube sucks. Anyway, rumble is the future. There you go. Thank you, Julia. Uh, crown target would be interested in a stream with a list of these big hitter cases and a short quip of why they matter. Arm the audience to teach the masses. Help change the way government law works long term for the moral. I think he's talking about like stuff like Wickard versus Filburn. Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah. but you know, the law is not what governs your life. It really these isn't. Are, these are just conflict. I mean, the the law. We really need to, to, the solution to all this conflict in politics is to devolve the power back to the people and the local level, because the 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 great the national debates are basically solving nothing you know if you, everybody agrees like that the road needs paving you know those, those are the things so devolving that power but the centralization of power nothing gets solved at the federal level and nor does the supreme court answer anything you know it i don't even care like marriage why did why is government even involved in my marriage that doesn't thank count. god yes you know Stop. to me I'm married because my church says I'm married and because I'm committed with my wife, right? That's who, that's who I care about. Yep. The fact that the government have to go and get a license, I mean, why do they even, I don't want that. I understand there's tax reasons and all that, but like, if you want to get but married, there, should gay, there be, that's between you and your church, your spouse and your contracts. You can contract any marital right with a spouse, right? Yep. I, I don't understand. You actually, like, if you think about it, it may be better to specifically contract marital rights because the marriage system that the government has imposed and all of the implications that marriage has in family court are so like askew and, and uh, the determinations about everything are so out of, out of proportion, we'll say that maybe it would be better if we all just privately contracted the things that we wanted to and didn't contract the rest but why why is in what place is our government been delegated the power to talk about marriage at all a marriage is between a man and a woman as far as i'm concerned yeah and or or if it's you between your your boyfriend and you or your whatever you're rocking you why is that my concern I, I don't i don't get that i mean it's between me my spouse and god right well, and, and of course, the uh, the assumption of marriage, this is why I, I don't like marriage as a term for government anyway. I prefer civil unions um, because like I can see plenty of instances where two people who are in a non-sexual relationship share resources and income 
<clears throat> and and then also take less resources and income because they share a place or whatever. Like let's say people who are best friends and roommates for 20 years, but they never they never touch genitals. Like why don't those people get similar tax benefits? Why don't they get uh, rental breaks or whatever you're going to get? Like why? The, the government is way too involved in personal stuff that they have no business being involved in. I mean, that, yeah. that's the bottom line. I mean, well, sorry, we, I, that, well, that was a chat, wasn't it? We got ranting on a chat. This is how my life is. Uh, I've wrestler... heard that you, I, by the way, I also heard, I've done my research on you, my oh, friend. Oh, God. So you don't know who I am. So yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a researcher. <laughs> okay. I've heard you play fairies in D&D. &D. <laughs> is this true? Uh, you admit to the crime? I, I play a five foot one fairy uh, who summons tentacles and um, wears leather. Yes. See, this yes, is true. Okay. Well, it's a real thing. I used to be a dungeon master back in. Oh, there. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, so I, I'm in a current campaign. It's the series. See these people, Steve. So it's the <laughs> Geeks and Gamers tabletop channel. And they invited me for a serious campaign for people who have played D and D before, like not like new players. That's very meme driven. They're like we want you for a serious campaign. So I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. Like two weeks later, I'm messaging the DM. Do you mind if I play a fairy? <laughs> like, Cause I wanted to know if he's okay with the flying aspect of it. Cause flying trivializes encounters if the DM's not ready for it. So I didn't want to drop that on him. I said, I'm going to play a fairy. Uh, also a warlock that summons tentacles and wears leather. Are you okay with this? He's like, dear God, <laughs> what have you Who done? Am I inviting into my game? Yep. It was just a, it was, um, it was a mess and, uh, he's paying the punishment for it. Actually. Yeah. You wouldn't uh, last long in my dungeon. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, that was everyone says in, that. <laughs> that was back in the day. Now it was funny. We have, um, I, I don't know. Dun I just remembered that you were a D and D player because you you referred to a four sided die at one point. I'm like only a D and D player. Would know what a <laughs> no, I I like playing D and D. It's it, so many things like as you uh, especially with kids, like the amount of time that I don't have to do all of these fun things. Um, but YouTube has opened up more opportunities because like now I can I can't like commit to playing a D and D game. But if that D and D game is part of my business model, then I actually can. And so, <laughs> so now like monetize it. <laughs> the, well, see, this is you're ranking the grifter scales going up again. You see? Yeah. Are you well, a but, board gamer at all? Do you like board games? I board games have gotten so crazy now. Like you, you go and like you buy like a three hundred dollar board game with eight thousand plastic minis. Yeah, I love them. They're great. It's like a video game. That's a board game. They take years to finish. <laughs> well, it depends which board games. I have a right. friend who does board games. She's a lawyer up in West Virginia, uh -huh. and she's fantastic. A fantastic, also fellow Washington and Lee alum. And uh, you know that I'm an honorary hillbilly too, by the way. Oh, perfect. Yes, West West Virginia. I love West Virginia. And um, did the country roads take you home? They do. They do. They they've <laughs> got a cabin up in the woods with no power. I go up there and just check out. And oh, she plays great. board games and she is so good. She'll go to a tournament and have never played a game before and go there and win the tournament and win like tickets to the national tournament. Mm -hmm. I forget what game it was. She did that one time. She won the national tournament on a game she'd never played before. <laughs> Damn. She's just a brilliant, her, her mind. She's a, she's a gamer mind. Yeah. And she plays these board games. Like I think it was Catan. That she did oh, okay. That but, See, I'm not uh, like <laughs> I don't have a gamer mind. Uh, I have a gay more mind for for playing <laughs> these games. All I do is I try and make the most ridiculous thing yes, happen. You're the annoying player, right? That has no. to be disciplined. No, 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 I've never had to be disciplined. I play, but see, all of my playing is performative for YouTube or or whatever. So the I played a campaign with a DM who's a friend of mine, Inver. And she, um, I didn't have, I didn't make my character. She did, but she made me a tabaxi, which is a cat girl. She made me a cat girl sorceress 
Dragonborn, who is a pyromaniac. See, this is so, not real D and D, man. You are, you are. This is definitely generational. Now we're talking generational differences. Oh, back but see, in the day, yes, yes. I I love second edition D and D, like I really do. But for streaming purposes, <laughs> fifth edition is really nice because it's really fast. It's really efficient, uh, and it's not so number crunch heavy. So for like, because I. Like I grew up playing second edition D and D, loved it. It's really crazy and uh, and and very intense. And you have Thaco and all the fun stuff. But like for streams, it's like fifth edition is really simple um, and dumb. And and you, so I've like, never played fifth edition, so I can't say. I mean, I'm talking don't. about original Monster Manual. I remember Deities and Demigods came out, and it had the Melnibonian mythos in it that got deleted later. You know about that? Mm -mm. wait from first edition i don't i don't know what edition i'm just talking because i had i had, had the, the players uh, they had the dungeon master master's manual and the monster manual that's what we yeah. had and then the deities and demigods came out right and it was like this is cool yes you know what that is right deities well i i don't know so in second edition forgotten realms they had a faith in avatars book and they had a i think the deities and demigods uh was was or heroes it was it was faiths and uh, avatars and heroes and demigods. Maybe I don't know, but but yeah, you might be talking about first edition. It, but it was the one that came out. Everybody was saying it was satanic and we're summoning devils That's and best. worshiping worshiping characters. But it had the whole Elric series in it, and it also had the Cthulhu mythos, right? You know the okay, Lovecraft, yeah. yeah. And those both were copyrighted, and so they got deleted in later editions. Sure. Yeah, that makes so. sense. No, I, I, I love the older D and D. I really do. But like for, again, for streaming, which is pretty much the only way I can play now, um, having the fifth edition is nice. Cause it's, it's just truncated and, and fast. And so my, the first campaign I did online was, yeah, I was a cat girl sorceress who was a pyromaniac, which like, I don't know why the DM did this. Cause I literally just reacted by fireballing everything I found and just killing everything <laughs> constantly. And she kept getting mad at me. And I'm like, you made me a fire sorceress who is a cat, which cats jump at everything. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> My next character was a, uh, was an un, uh, an undying warlock, uh, which was, uh, his name was Sil Blinton and he was pledged to the arc lich Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> and my my job in the party was to convince the paladin that kobold slavery was good. Um, and well, so that that's all I did was I used I used uh, deception and I just kept convincing the paladin that we had excellent social program for these kobold youths. <laughs> so, and they aren't quite human. They're really only three fifths of a human, right? It was, so, it was terrible. And so, yeah, my current character is a is a lawful evil fairy warlock that summons tentacles and uh and well, I'm, I, I'm sorry that i asked about this because now you know it's been outed it's it's okay it's okay it's done in public it's fine everything it's done, done in public, public is fine well like i said i did have a little clue that this might have been in your in your radar screen you know <laughs> had another commonality here I no, I I love D and D because it's it's just it's free when you have people who are fun to play with it's free uh, to you, you get to explore and do dumb things and, and, and have a blast. And of course people are trying to stop that now too. Right. Cause people have too much fun with D and D. It's like, well, you don't have any wheelchair bound cripple wizards in your group. It's like, that's the, you know, like my, my, I used to play this world of Warcraft, which is basically uh D and D you ever played world of Warcraft. No, I see. I played EverQuest before world of Warcraft. Okay. Came out. And, and now I played, you're the I young was actually man. the top gnome. I played, you know, kind of like your character. I played a little gnome fire wizard. Yeah. And I always said, like, okay, so if you get you know, in, so there's combat, there's like players can come and nail you for just no reason, just out of nowhere. Right. But I'm like, oh, big strong knight beating up on a little gnome. Right. Right. <laughs> so right. I always had that, that card. But I actually turned out to be the top gnome, alliance gnome on the server. But it became it was ridiculous because then this like panda edition came out of the Knights of Pandera or something. Yeah, that was weird. That was weird. And then like all my great characters all got outdated, and I'm like, how much time am I going to have to put in to all move these guys up five more levels? 
you know, it was ridiculous. And so I just completely cold turkeyed it, you know, yeah. <laughs> but um, well, that that's what I, I had to do that in college. Cause I was playing EverQuest, uh, which was, which uh, uh, actually worlds of Warcraft has a whole bunch of lore um, about the developers and development. And a lot of them were hired from the top guilds of EverQuest, for example. And then they would be like the one guy who's named in the blizzard lawsuit uh the the one about all the employee misconduct or whatever that was a that was an everquest player mm -hmm. um but anyway so uh but yeah i was playing it so much in college that i just wasn't ever going to class so i had to <laughs> i had to sell my character and um and quit and and, and you're right like it you have to do cold turkey because it's not like well i'll play a little bit you won't ever play a little bit no, um, it's you'll built, just it's designed. Well, I've got yeah. a good, uh, there's one thing I want to tell you about the chicken story, but the other thing, about, <laughs> the, the other story, story is, um, you know, the, the political correctness got injected into those games. Like mm -hmm. you got to play the, you know, oh, look, there's this gay character that's super powerful. You know, I mean, like, why are you putting that in this game? Stop it. It's yeah. stupid, you know, and it just completely, I remember I was playing, there was some other game. It's like, cut in, but you know, what's that game? It's the, um, oh gosh, I can't remember. It's another Blizzard game, but Blizzard just got completely wrecked. Oh, StarCraft? StarCraft, yeah. Yeah. Completely wrecked by political correctness. No, I was going to tell you that this is an interesting, I have a professor friend of mine who I'm working on a paper with, actually, who's brilliant. Um, where he works on, he's in Alabama, who's a UCF criminal justice professor. But he had this really interesting topic about gambling and addiction. And why is gambling addictive? Mm. And it's an interesting question, right? Well, there was he. This really helps because I'm not I'm not really an addictive personality, and so I don't quite understand it. And it's it's an interesting question, right? Well, what they did is they found these chickens and they put like a chicken thing where they'd hit the button, and yeah. every ten buttons punched there'd be a pellet. So they hit ten times and the pellet come they'd eat, right? Well, when they did that, the chicken would peck. And they'd eat until they were sated, and then they would be not hungry anymore, and they'd stop pecking. Right. right. Okay. But then they put another button, and it would randomly produce a pellet between one and a hundred. So you never knew if you're going to get the pellet or not. Sure. You might hit it a hundred times and not get a pellet, or you could hit it two times and it'd get the pellet. Right. Yeah. So, and the thing is, the pet chicken would would not would just relentlessly peck, endlessly peck at the thing no matter what. And the reason is, is because your mind wants to transmit patterns into things. And okay. when you have a randomized thing and there is no pattern, the mind doesn't, it doesn't comprehend. It's trying to understand the pattern here. And it may be like, I may never get a pellet again. Right. Yeah. And so you get or in just that the next one will do like the next one's got to do it. Next one's got to do it. And I've, so you don't know, you're trying to figure out what's the plan. What's the system here? I'm going to figure it out. And so they get wrapped up. And it's funny because my son was in on this conversation with my professor. And um, and he says, and then he went back and played in his video games. And he says, it's amazing how integrated that concept is into everything, into video games. Yep. Because they put these random reward things that you never know what you're going to get. And you got to keep pecking. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, and these computer companies are not dumb and they put a lot of that. He says Blizzard is one of the worst offenders now. They put a lot of that stuff. Oh, the, all these little addictive the new, moves. Uh, the new Diablo mobile game. So uh, they, they had Diablo one through three. They're working on four. And then Diablo Immortal is a mobile game with the, with the loot boxes that you can buy. And they, they initially calculated out how much it would cost to max out a character with money on uh on on Diablo Immortal and the initial one character the initial estimate was about $100,000. Wow. But that got revised and it's actually over a half million dollars to max out a character because of the the random nature of the the loot boxes and stuff. And I mean, mind you, that's not just saying I pay $500,000 to have a maxed out character. You still have to like go through the game and play it to get that that's just in like that's just like in because it like enhances the drops that you get and stuff it's insane and um i was talking about this the other day but but the part of the problem is synergizing that 
with the creator economy that we have because there are streamers who stream professionally these games and therefore buy things professionally who will actually pay that much because they'll make more than that in the way that they stream. And that's well, that's the real like the, crazy thing. This Magic the Gathering is another thing my son got into way back. And it got to be so ridiculous because the cards are so expensive. And to be competitive, you've got to invest in these cards. We can't, you know, we looked into it. It's more expensive to play Magic the Gathering than it is to be a golfer. Yeah, it's crazy how how much a deck costs for Magic. Yeah, and so now. it's like we just he he, he we cold turkey that one too but i did not encourage he got good at it but it was like okay that's a moment in time and you know you encourage your kids or you don't encourage them you know we kind of yeah didn't encourage that that uh he was got he got good at it um anyway well what else we got to talk okay. about today we, i got we, i got three more of the big super chats real quick well do, Afix, do as many as you can Avic says this 20 ducats is for Steve to read unbreaded. No, no, no. Also, government is slavery. Look, uh, Steve is a public servant, and I would never ask him to actually read the unbreaded because there's there's just people who will take it the wrong way. Um, and thank you very much. Kyle Bogue says, big ghost fan too. Saw them for the first time in 2016 at Northern Invasion in Somerset. Saw them with my wife at the Armory in 2019. They screwed up my VIP tickets and gave us meet and greet tickets. That's cool. And uh, Rumble username sucks says, what topic haven't we covered? Nick, tell this man the TSA story and ask him the question. You know the one, balls or no balls. Also, did you get my email? I did not get your email. I probably did, but I don't I don't care. Um <laughs> <laughs> the TSA story. Uh, so the other day, real quick, the other day I went to Kentucky with my wife. Um, we had we were celebrating the first Ricada Law baby. So this is a couple who met because of my show. They met initially in my Discord, and then wow. they met in person at a convention that I went to. Indeed. And then they got married, and then they got pregnant, and uh, they're about to have the baby. And they had the baby shower and they invited us out to the baby shower so we decided to go out for the first ricada law baby now while we were there in kentucky uh it's just my wife and i and we decided to go to um to a store that caters to adult couples we'll say um okay. and sells all sorts of fun things and we bought a lot of stuff we bought just a whole bunch of fun things um is the best way to describe this. Fun adult things. Very adult things. Also very fun things. We bought a lot of them. So much so that we had uh, we had to dedicate one of the suitcases to the stuff that we bought coming back, flying back home. Uh-oh, so, I can see where this is going now. <laughs> so we get, we get home and I'm unpacking like our suitcase and I pull this one up and I'm like, something weird about this. And I open it up. And there's the TSA inspection notice inside. And I'm like, oh, my God. Of all the suitcases they They, they did that intentionally. <laughs> they pick the one. This thing is full of some of the worst stuff you could ever imagine seeing. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, no, oh. see, they, you know that there's, there is a sense of humor behind that TSA inspection notice. Oh, yeah. And they oh, probably yeah. ran that thing through some kind of scanner. I and hope And they saw so. what was in it. And they got to, we got to open this thing up, right? Yeah. I'm just glad uh, the one we brought back from the Caribbean that they didn't scan that one because that one was way worse. <laughs> way worse. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Uh, that's a pretty, that's, that's pretty embarrassing. And I'm mean, proud of you that you're willing to expose oh. yourself in such public forums in these uh i'm not embarrassed by this at all i bring the field kit with me wherever <laughs> i go with lady rackets i'm not <laughs> look i've been i've 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 been married for 18 years if i don't have the kids around well that's all hard. bets it's are hard off. to get the kids away well enjoy it while they're there because it's the best thing oh. ever i mean, there's this anti-kid thing in our culture oh People that's are weird told, yeah. like i don't want to have kids these women are like i don't want to have kids or even men i mean that's the best things ever happened to me no i agree i i love the heck out of these little monsters i do <laughs> but like okay so today just today i'm up uh i i i wake up i get the notice from youtube right like oh you're you've got a community guideline strike i'm like 
fucking hell. So I'm sitting in my bed. I'm annoyed already uh, that I've got this thing. And, and all I'm doing all day is trying to like, I'm talking to people that I know, trying to strategize next moves, plan out this thing, talking to my YouTube partner, emailing various other people who might be able to help with this thing behind the scenes. Cause I, I still have some resources that I haven't fully employed yet to try and handle the strike and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm trying to figure all this out and I'm just sitting there and my wife is, uh, she's working on, she's building a, a Lego set uh, because, you know, she likes Legos. She's building a Lego set uh, next to me in bed. And then um, her cousin comes over and brings their kids. So we now have nine children in our house. Wow. Right? And so her cousin's there talking to her in my room. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, I'm just pissed, trying to figure things out, calling people, messaging people, reading emails and, and, and doing all this stuff. And one of my kids comes in. Hey, can I have a soda? Like, yes, have a soda. You can have a soda every day. What the hell are you even asking? So then they leave. Two seconds later, a different kid comes in. Can I have a snack? Of course you can have a freaking snack. We have a snack drawer, so you never have to ask. Go eat a snack. And then another com kid comes in and another kid. And I'm like, I look to my wife. I said, do I even have a bedroom? Like, do I even have a space anymore? Because I'm like, now I'm losing my cool and I'm already mad. And it's like, I love these little monsters, but at some point it's like, damn it. Just go do the things that you do all day. Yeah. But they really want your attention. Well, they need to go eat a snack. That's yeah, I know. I understand, but that's not the purpose of their encounter They're They want to get a little daddy interaction. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's what they're doing. They got they got a whole bunch of that later in the day, but right then I needed a private space and I didn't have one. I, I understand. And, all this is, so that it makes you a better man. That's what I'm saying, though. Is when, but see, when I go on vacation, I know no one's coming through the door, and that's why <laughs> that's you bring the, TSA the field agent kit. package, right? Yes, I got you. Yep. So a TSA agent. Well, we all have our wait. own. We all have our things that we enjoy and you know, you have your zone. <laughs> I'm just telling the next TSA agent who inspects my bag, you better be ready. Cause you're going to need Jesus afterwards. That's, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring intentionally worse stuff just in case they inspect it. Uh, okay. Um, all right. That's, that's all the big super chats. Uh, it's, I know it's really late for you, so I'm going to read the rest of them, but if you need to go at any point, please feel free. You've been, uh, phenomenal hanging out four and a half hours, which you should not do. I, I don't know what's wrong with I'll you. I'll tell you a story. When I was in private practice, yeah, this is, this is nothing, you know, like when I was in private practice, we had a case. It was, a I, I can't even, I still can't talk about it. It was a multi-million dollar, basically a $25 million case. Sure. Probate, probate case. Big, big states. We had three law firms on both sides. And the lawyers, and it was really one of the cases that said, I never want to do civil law again because the lawyers yeah. on the other side were so unethical and nasty and dirty and played it, played it to the hilt. And it was basically about them getting a big paycheck out of their stupid client who they had on the hook for paying them money. Anyways, at the at the settlement conference, we we went in at 7.30 in the morning to their office to, to do mediation, right? Yeah. And we, we were up until 7.30 the next day signing documents. So yeah. we went in there and negotiated. So we had a, a basically a, over 24, 25 hours of nonstop negotiations and settlement negotiations. Yeah. So, you know... I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just say, you know, it's like, so in the scheme of things, and I, I planned on coming on here and, and giving you my best time. Um, I'm probably not at my best. I will tell you that but I don't, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm having a blast and I'm, I was looking forward to this so much. Um, so I, I, if I, if, if I'm incoherent and rambling, it's because of this and the sleep and the alcohol and the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> but as long as I'm being entertaining and you're enjoying it, then, you know, oh, you kick me off. Let me, let me clarify. You're welcome to stay as long as you want. I just, I never want to ask because it's such a, I, I go 
so late and my show runs so long and and I don't want ever, people to ever feel like, oh, I, I don't want to leave uh, if if I, you know, I'm really tired, but I don't want to leave or I'll feel rude. You're, you're fully welcome to, but you can stay. Please do. Well, and I'd um, like uh, what we need to do, and I'm just thinking ahead, mm -hmm. when you get back on YouTube, um, because I'm supposed to grift for Bronco. <laughs> I know, I know that but, me too. And I'm like, damn it, like, couldn't you have waited till after this thing launches and I've grifted <laughs> a couple times? But anyways, I, I, I was the high the idea. See, I'm I'm starting to mumble, but the um the I really I do want to tell you about the Kelly case, but we probably ought to save that for a big YouTube thing. So if you would, you know, allow me to come back and talk about oh, that case anytime when I'm yeah. in a better, like, I'm just not as. No, good. we'll, we'll definitely do that uh, for sure. And cause, cause it really is um, long story short, guys, uh, let, let me briefly summarize the Kelly case outcome. I'm not going to get into the case too much, but a guy got convicted for uh, a, a, a culpable criminal negligence case, similar to Bellamy. Kim Potter. Yeah, and it's a felony case, and the judge, even though people uh, were asking for leniency on this, the judge decided, boom, 10 years in prison plus a huge fine. Um, and uh, he ended up winning on appeal. Full reversal, you're out. No, no retrial, none of that. You go home because this conviction was wrong. And it was like the appeal was extra special because – the appeal was an appeal of the motion for a, a basically a motion for a directed verdict or a verdict, not a judgment, notwithstanding of the verdict where the judge says the jury said this thing, the jury said this, you're guilty, but the law doesn't support the guilty verdict. So you're not guilty. They asked the judge for that. They lost because everybody asked the judge for that and loses. And then they appeal on that and won. That's how bad this conviction was. It's a crazy story. And it's it's seriously, it's like a, it's a it's a miracle that this guy actually got out on this. And it's the right decision. I I didn't read all of the materials you sent me, but I was reading through the the uh the opinion on it, and it's like this is clearly the correct decision because the the question of culpable criminal negligence is did you create an unsafe situation and then act negligently in disregard of those conditions? Well, and, and, uh, and we can, and since we're in it, I'll give uh, the, the, you really need to understand what happened here. Yeah. Because yeah. the facts, what he was convicted for doing it, he, it was four o'clock in like a Saturday afternoon, bright, sunny day. It was a little chilly mm -hmm. and he, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. He was walking his child to a public park. And he was in the he was drunk and he was in the middle of the street holding the hand of the little four year old walking an off duty cop. It's a 25 mile per hour road that goes next to the public park. Co uh, off duty cop comes up behind him, honks his horn. The guy does not hear him. Honks it a second time. He looks around, sees that he takes his kid off the road. That is it. Do you have an alarm going off? Yeah, I have to get that. <laughs> yeah, go grab it real quick. Like, okay, I think that's the wife. Something going on there. Hold on a second. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I can hear that. I, I'm like, I know that sound. Let's see that. Let's that like a phone call or what? You know what? That that's that's his wife. Going, Where are you? I thought you were on some stupid lawyer show. Like, what? You're still on? What kind of idiotic lawyer is still awake at this hour? Okay, but uh, so here's so here's yeah here's what happens this this guy's walking his four year old down the middle of the road he is drunk he is intoxicated but there's no one on the road it's a it's a sunny day off duty cop comes up honks guy doesn't hear him he makes more noise the guy leaves the road with the kid nobody gets hurt uh, at all uh, in this scenario uh, oh here we go he's he's back the oh, only uh, yeah the only thing about that. The only time the kid was upset was when they arrested the dad and the kid's like, right. where's my daddy? Yep. The mom comes into the, uh, to the judge at sentencing, pleased with him. He's a good dad. This kid is bonded with him. He's a stepdad bonded with him. This is daddy. He just wants daddy to come home and take care of him. And the judge looked him in the eye and gave him maxed him out 10 years, $180,000 fine.
How many priors does this guy have? It's like he doesn't have a bad record. It's 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 well, of course, I'm a public defender. Right, right yeah. A bad so record for you is record. only like seven murders. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, he you know, he had prior record. Um and he, but it's he's not a bad guy, you know. Yeah, he's somebody who has an alcohol problem who's trying to get their life together. He's just an average guy with yeah. some criminal record on, you know, alcohol, mostly alcohol related. But, you know, it's like, why are you slamming this guy? And and it, it's not even, what did he do? That's he the walked thing. down the street with his kid and he's drunk. Yeah. Like that's the thing. Okay. We're, I, I get that there's, there's a possibility that an intoxicated person might put their child in danger, but was the kid in danger? Like that, that seems like a pretty, pretty important question. And just being in a street is not actually in danger um, at, at all. And it's a, uh, it's a 25 mile per hour. So it's a bright, sunny day, yeah. no traffic. I don't, I don't know. It was crazy. That That's um, I, I will, we'll talk about that one at a future date when I'm a little bit more coherent, but thankfully my client, you know, he's out and he's happy. He's with his family. He's looking for a job and he's, um, you know, it, it's, it's really, it was, I mean, I hope he changes his life, turns his life around, but yeah, you don't want him to be a guy with alcohol problems, but that no. having alcohol problems and making a potentially questionable decision, like if something had happened to the kids, suddenly we've got a different discussion here. But, but what it is, people project all of their worst fears right. into the situation. And it's like, well, the government, so we're going to help out this family by taking away the father for the life of the child? Yep. I mean, it's it's insane. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that one in depth at, at, a, at a future time. Um, what was I going to tell you about it? Oh, and my, my client is really nice. He did waive attorney-client privilege on this. So he was allowed me, he allowed me to talk about this case. Um and so that that's one of the reasons I and it's it's actually probably the biggest victory in my appellate career I've had. I've had big ones in trials, but you know you just don't want to win on appeal. I, yeah. I had I had another one that I had a guilty to not appeals guilty. are for losers, says Brian. Yeah, right. And I had another one that was a guilty to not guilty, but the person was on probation, so they didn't. But this guy walked out of prison, but he did a year in prison. So yeah. it's not like he got away. I mean. In fact, I, I've got this part of my module is getting off on a technicality. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Because, you know, he, he did a year in prison and suffered. I mean, with no, oh my God. Yeah. Face. All right, here we go. Let's, uh, we're going to go through the rest of the rest of the rumble rants that are here. Thank you to everybody who has contributed, by the way, through the rumble rant system, which is rumbles version of super chats. It's much appreciated. Uh, we'll, we'll read the rest of them. We'll probably close out the show after that. Emorsk says, screw YouTube. I agree. P PWH, the grifting must continue. Vote for rackets at grifties.com. Yes, correct. Vote for me at grifties.com. When does Still this trying uh, to be number poll one. end? I have no idea. Okay. It's just, yeah, you just got to really keep like, going. What is the, what is this grifties.com thing? What is, is it Anyone like can nominate a grifter. And uh, and then they're crowd stars. I guess I could pull it up real quick. You just get so a, we... you get an award or a trophy, or is this like a, a golden raspberry where it's like it's supposed to be dishonorable, but we're actually driving it to be for a position of honor? I would never do that. I'm only honored by being called a grifty. So um, the grifties are here. The second annual grifties awards this is by Hotep Nation. Uh, who is doing it? I am still. Oh, I'm gonna vote oh, for man. myself. I'm still number one. Uh, Chili De Castro, he he came up hard. This dude came up. He he knocked out the quartering and sticks Hex and Hammer's cat today. Uh, this guy's brand new. Uh, we got Tim Pool, Anthony Fauci, Amber Heard of Vladimir Zelensky, Justin Trudeau, Bobby Law, Viva Fry, Jesse Smollett. Wow, Donald you're Trump. beating some big figures here. This is oh, pretty yeah. impressive. Oh, they can't even. Th th when you're the when you're the king, man. I mean, I'm I'm a little worried about this. Uh, this Chili De Castro guy, um, but but it doesn't gonna... tell you how many groups he's got. No, I have no no idea how many votes are going on. All I know is I need to remain at the top, and uh, I will I will fight I will fight to win the Grifties. Um, but oh, uh, I got a question for you. I now now I got see yeah. I'm, brain is not working this late at night. But you watched the whole Amber Heard trial, didn't you? 
Yeah. You are a glutton for punishment. You are a beast. I, I don't understand how the, the longest trial I've ever had is four days. Yeah, that's see, that's uh, the, the trials that I've covered, especially when Bronco's on. We keep talking about that. Like people are getting a, a, the wrong idea of trials from these media trials because these things are lasting like two and three weeks, seven weeks for Johnny Depp because there was a week off. And it's like most of these trials four days three four days tops like you a lot of that, trials that trial you're in and out in a, a day that was a first degree felony i had 35 witnesses including expert witnesses there was everything in that trial and i got it done in four days but i'm very efficient as a trial attorney kind of yeah. get to the point but i don't know how they can do it i mean i don't and i don't know how you can even watch that stuff that is like but the one thing i did watch, well there there are lots of an reasons answer, right huh there are lots of reasons, uh, oh, yeah. like well, a hundred reasons, right? Grifter reasons. 120,000 subscribers, a whole pile of money, you know, like that's, uh, uh, I hate to put it in those terms, but like when, when your business is doing this, then True. that it's really good for business. But I appreciate that. No, I, it I was, get it. I get it. It's, but not my bag. Right. But here's the, here's the question I have for you, because yeah. I think, and I don't know anything about this. This is completely pulling it out of my rear end, right? I have no clue what I'm yeah. talking about. But I've always been a fan of Kate Moss. And I think Kate Moss testifying for two and a half minutes was the best thing that ever happened to Johnny Depp. What do you think? Oh, it was great. It was really good for him, actually. And uh, when when Amber Heard brought up Kate Moss, like this is how you know how good it was. Amber Heard brought up the Kate Moss story and his lawyer, Ben Chu, is on camera going, yes. And he like turns to his other lawyers and they're like, we got him because they knew they had Kate Moss as a uh, rebuttal witness right. waiting, but they had to have a reason to bring her in. And um, she's likable. She's pretty. She's well-spoken. And she was going to come in and talk about how Amber Heard literally made up the story out of nothing. And it wouldn't. And the, the best part is they'd already recorded that deposition like, so they knew exactly what was there and all they need. That's what made that trial really kind of interesting to me is because they had all these recorded depositions and they know what both sides know what's in all of these depositions. And so the question is, are they going to bring it out? And then some of them, they bring out these depositions and you're like, why would you have this come? Like, why would you have this as your witness? This was terrible for you. And then other ones, you're like, okay, this is really just boring and dry and, and pointless. But like the, the video depositions were the hardest part of that trial though. Cause they were really boring because hmm. they get trimmed down. But the live so, testimony was great. Like the, the Kate, lawyering. I, that I, was just, all was I know is that I, I definitely watched the Kate Moss testimony for two and a half minutes. And I was just like, why would you ever open the door to let this come in? Because she's like, she's beautiful. Yeah. She's got that angelic voice with the English accent. Uh huh. She's dressed to the T. Yeah. Everybody, in, and she's saying, he's my hero. <laughs> he we dated so for a while. We're not together anymore, but he was so lovely. He and was the so lovely. He took care of me ever. I mean, yeah. What a what a ridiculous moment. Well, I and the other thing I, I've watched, uh, we've watched some of the popcorn murder trial. That I don't know if you remember. I was yeah, on Curtis Reeves. Them. Yep. Yep. In fact, I trained one of those defense attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. One of the defense attorneys was one of my. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I train all the appellate attorneys when they come through, and I trained him as an appellate attorney. And now he's in. The, he was there. Now he's moved on. He's actually in a Miami firm now. But oh, he, okay. I, I don't know if you remember him, Matt. Which one? What he wasn't? Uh, was he one of the younger guys or one yeah. of the two old? Yeah, yeah. I he was the guy who was sitting there next to the le, next to the attractive other lawyer. The whole yes. time. <laughs> no, that guy was good. Uh, the um, someone I know is like, uh, oh, I think uh, Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know, he knows uh, one of the 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 lead defense attorney on that case, and. Um, yeah, because we had talked about my my criticism of his closing arguments was that it was just way the hell too long, and it got it got he got the he got the acquittal right, so he wins. But man, his closing argument was was a mess. And uh, Peter Tragos had talked to him about it, I guess, and if I remember right, and he he said, yeah, the guy just kind of like got in the zone and just kept going. Yeah. <laughs> it was like. Like no, you need to uh, just end it. Love to talk. Look how long we've been talking. You know, I mean, it's like I know 
but four um, hours and 40 minutes. Ooh. Uh, is that you, what it is typical though? Right. It, it depends. It all depends. I've, I've had much shorter shows with much less interesting people. <laughs> okay, no, but thanks. okay. But this brings me to one thing though. Do, okay. So do you remember the, uh, the Anthony, not Anthony, Sanjay Gupta of the CNN uh, medical doctor yes. expert guy who went on Joe Rogan. Yes. It's this yes. big thing. Yes. One of the things that struck me that he said, and I want, I, I'm kind of curious to your feedback on it. Now that we've talked for over four hours, he said, <laughs> so he was on Rogan for three hours. He's like, that was a three hour long conversation. I have never had a conversation of that length in my entire life. What? Can you imagine like your entire life you go through, you've never talked to someone for more than three hours ever? My Well, actually, I will tell you my my wife, how I met my wife. My wife's from the Philippines and uh, I was visiting there scuba diving <laughs> mm. and got distracted. And we went off to a place called Baguio City, which is up in the mountains of the Philippines. And I remember th there was this basically eight hour bus drive from Baguio City back to Manila and we're driving down the this winding muddy road going maybe 25 miles an hour in traffic and smog and heat no air conditioning and it was an eight hour drive down this road and um and we talked the whole way and at the end we were so happy and it was like I could have turned around and done another eight hours and talked to you and then I was like you know, if here we're happy after this, this drama, <laughs> I was yeah. like, this is marriage material. <laughs> and I, that was yeah. one of the moments when I'm like, really like, this is my, so, I mean, I know I have office, we have office conversations because, you know, in law, when you're in a practice, right. I have people in my office that I'll sit down and talk to for hours about all kinds of things. Yeah. And a lot of it is um is fleshing out ideas and fleshing out like when i write my papers we discuss them they read them they edit them and then we then we'll talk about whatever politics and um no i have long conversations with people all the time and i and i, I don't how could somebody a doctor i i i don't know i don't know how you can do that like uh That's just a lie my just my buddy lie. my buddy drexel who's been on the show plenty of times he and I spent an entire summer, um, one of my first years of college, and we we would go to Perkins every night and talk for, I mean, four to eight hours every like every single night. We would we get done with our day, we go to Perkins and just hang out and eat and talk and and just figure out like life and in society over and over. And it's like we did this all the time when I was in college. I'd talk to people for hours on end constantly just these types of conversations talking about that's what i love about my show is when i have someone on I'm like this is just what i've done my entire life is just have conversations with people that go all over the place i never know where they're going that's great um well actually that's where i was going i, I was brought yeah. up that trial for a reason um and i had this thought and i write my little thoughts down on yellow stickies that pile up <laughs> like this you see but <laughs> what what um what my observation was, was that how bad the judge was in that popcorn trial. And oh, she was awful, awful judge. And, and the thing is, is that I, one, I, one of the things when I was in trial division and doing prosecutions and some other stuff, I had one of the greatest judges of all time. I practiced in front of, I did 20 jury trials in front of him. His name was Richard O. Watson. And he was, um, the courthouse up in St. John's County, which is St. Augustine is named after him. Right. And he was kind of one of my mentors and he was somebody that I got real friendly with. And he, he respected me like you wouldn't believe I've got stories about that, but and we tried cases together a lot, 20 cases. I had jury trials with him. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was used to a certain level of judging. And when I went out and practiced in front of some other judges, I was shocked. Oh, we man. had a judge. In fact, the judge, and I'll name him, Judge Wolf. <laughs> Getting late. I can just say his name. He's the late <laughs> Judge Wolf. So the he's, late Judge he's, Wolf. He's not slandered anymore. He was terrible. And I, I yeah. couldn't, I wish it was shocking to be in front of somebody that bad. And like, and this is what I'm seeing these judges around the state. 
somebody had commented in the chat what I think about the Cruz trial and like, and I haven't been watching this stuff. I don't watch trials generally. That's the greatest like, judge in your entire state. Don't you dare. Don't you, you dare besmirch the good name of mommy judge. <laughs> you think that judge is good, huh? I've not watched a single second of it, but I've seen pictures of her. Oh, well, she's pretty. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, I'm, yeah, she's pretty. I, I haven't watched the Cruz trial at all. I but was going to cover she's it. She's awful young to be a judge. How is she getting that judgeship? I, I don't know. I mean. I have no idea. I, all I know saying, is that that was a that's a four month trial on death penalty sentencing. And I was like, because I was going to cover it. I was like, oh, this will be great. This will probably be like a week or two. It's like, oh, my God, four months of this. I can't I can't do that. No, 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 no. You don't want to be involved in that trial. And, and actually, I'm I'm sort of on the the list serve on the death penalty stuff in Florida. So there's a lot. Of, believe me, we've got some very good defense attorneys. <laughs> and and this is the, this is what you're seeing is that the defense team has outclassed the judges, mm. and and they can't handle what we're putting given to them. The 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 defense team is prepared. They know the law. They know the facts. They know the evidence. They know what they're supposed to do and what they should be doing. And the judges are out. She's this is her first death penalty trial. Yeah. And well, it looks like it's her them. first trial. It looks like she shouldn't even be a judge. I mean, she's is she 40 yet? Like not not that age super matters, but she's she is really young looking. Here, I'll, right. I'll pull her up. Uh, just because uh, you want the chat to <laughs> No, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm I'm educating the chat here. Okay, this That's is an educa doing. for educational purposes strictly. Yeah. Uh let's see. Here we go. Uh this is a this is an okay one. Uh here we go. So the chat, this this just so you understand what the judge this judge in this trial uh that we're talking about. We just want you to be able to see. Like, look, I'm just she's very young looking, right? Like, am I crazy? Yeah, and, and really, like, how many years out of law school is this person? And and the defense, I, I know this defense team. I know what they're doing. I know what they're prepared to do, and I know how they're doing it. And I'm telling you, they're running circles around her. Now, I'm not saying they're going to win. They're not going to get a life sentence. They're not doing all that. I mean, that's I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that she's being outclassed by the defense team. And, I just... And I don't see how he doesn't get the death penalty. Right. Well, that's a big story. And there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, I don't know. This is a very tough case. I'm against death penalty. So um, yeah. I don't believe no, I in am, it anyway. I am too. But I when I when I look at the, like, I'm against the death penalty. But at the same time, I go, okay, like, I'm pretty, I'm reasonably convinced that this guy is the guy who walked into a school and shot a bunch of people. If there is a death penalty that, that can happen. The reason I'm opposed to death penalty is because I don't trust the government to do their job correctly, but I'm like, I'm reasonably convinced that they got the right guy on this one and that there's not like ambiguity. So I'm like, well, I get it. I don't know that I like, I'm not willing to throw my stance on the death penalty in the garbage. I'm just saying I don't see how he doesn't get the death penalty. Well, that's a long discussion, and probably there's a lot of stuff that I probably can't say <laughs> about. Okay, right? We, we yeah, go, we extensive training on on the on the death penalty, but there's a lot of a lot of consider that. This is a whole long discussion about why it's not just one reason. You know, where you don't live in a perfect world. And there's no perfect solution. One of the one of the problems with the death penalty is it's a lie. And what I mean by that is it's a lie to the victims and the victims' families. Because these prosecutors go to them and they say, if you get the justice is if you get the death penalty. Right. Life in prison is not justice. Well, neither one is justice. Something evil happened and there's no bringing those people back. And you will not be satisfied if that person is given a death sentence or put in the death chair. That yep. is not going to bring your family member back or make you happy or bring give any kind of resolution. It does, it does give you a sense of vengeance and it does appeal to vengeance, but it does not, but it's a lie when they say this is justice and this will, and then the prosecutors say, yes, we're championing for the victim. And then they get the death penalty and they're like, yes, we've done what we've done for it. I'm great victims then left and then they're left behind and they've still got to deal with the tragedy and the death and the destruction. 
they haven't really done anything. They've lied to them to say this is this is going to satisfy you, right? The right. second thing, the second thing, and this is another part of it that people don't understand, is that we live in a culture of death. Our society is very death oriented. We should be focused on a life oriented society. And now, what I mean by that is that we got good prosecutors and good a, attorney general's office, right? And their job every day is to wake up and think, and how can I put this person to death? And so how does how does that affect your morality? Because you've got these top criminal defense lawyers, criminal prosecutor lawyers mm-hmm. who think they're a good person and yeah. they are a good person, but their morality gets warped because now their job is to put somebody to death and that's their job. And so that's got to be good. Yeah. And so their their whole value system gets structured around this and it it really corrupts the system. It makes people then all the judges, you got to have a pro death penalty judge. And those are the people that have this morality of death that that's the answer. There's another thing, there's a foreign policy question that people don't also talk about. Most of the civilized world doesn't have the death penalty. It interferes with our international relations with Mexico a big example. Now you'd say, well that's not a big deal, right? We're the United States and it's our constitution. Okay, maybe so. We're island America, right? But the problem is, is that we do have relations with country. We do exist in a world. And is the benefit, whatever benefit that you may think has to do with the death penalty, does that benefit rise to the level of the cost that it's costing us in the foreign policy? I don't really see a great well, benefit. And the, and the real cost, because people are under like the way we do death penalty sentencing is it's far more expensive to have a death, uh, a death row inmate than to have a life in prison inmate. Um, It's, it's more expensive over the course of the incarceration. And it's actually, I believe on average, more expensive over the life of a life, uh, a life imprisonment inmate as well. Um, Well, Because another, another people don't realize they think it's a deterrent. A lot of our clients that are yeah. death clients are called, or we call them volunteers. Have you ever heard that? No. <laughs> you ever heard of a death penalty volunteer? No. What's that? Would well, they rather that, have a death penalty, you're saying? Yes. Yeah. A lot of our clients, you know, we we on the public defender's office are fighting for their lives. They want to volunteer. They want to go to the death chamber. In yeah. fact, we have, there's even something we say called trading your roommate in for a television. <laughs> because <laughs> in Florida prisons, you get a roommate and you got a communal TV that's usually tuned to the rap channel and it doesn't work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, in death row, you don't have a roommate and you get a TV. There you so go. What they do is they kill their roommate. So they train the room. They trade their roommate in for a television set. So the, uh, so judge sure here, she's actually older than I thought. Um, I don't know how old she was, but she was assistant state attorney from 2001 to 2012. So we're talking, she's, uh, she's older than I am. Um, I thought, I thought she looks like she's in her thirties, but she's, she's well into her forties. So go her. She's got a good, she's, she's well aged, but I don't think her demeanor, I think she's not being nice to the people in the courtroom. And I don't think she really has a good handle on death penalty law. Death penalty law is ridiculously complicated. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, like when I when I did my first death penalty appeal, it's like it's like start going to law school again. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, a, it's a highly niche area of law. And it's it's um, but I think it's complicated because it's so important. Right. Like this, this is the state killing a citizen at the at the end of the day. Right. And that's that's one of the problems that I have with with police shootings and with death penalties in general is like that is the ultimate deprivation of liter uh, of liberty is the state removing the life of the citizenry and like if the state's going to do that i want them to be really damn sure about it and i know that this gets this gets in the weeds with some people and 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 they run at odds with me on some of this stuff but like when i see a police shooting i'm like did the guy desert like i get it but and i get that there may be like the legal justification but the state just killed this guy and I don't want the state to kill me. Right. But I don't want want the state to have the power. That person is immobilized 
and segregate that life and without parole is a thing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, that's the thing. Life without parole sucks. It's not a soft, it's not being soft on crime to say you're for life without parole. Yeah. You know, it's like, Oh, well, you're a softy. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Life without parole is pretty bad and there's no perfect system. And I'm not hundred percent. I mean, I, you, I'm, I'm a hundred percent against it, but I recognize the people I'm not, I mean, I know that I'm in the minority and I know that people have good hearts and are for the death penalty. Yeah. And most of the people, in fact, that's one of the things they found in death penalty research is that about 80% of people are not qualified to sit on a death jury because, because you have to be able to, you have to have a certain mindset and most people cannot weigh the consequences and cannot do the proper job. What is legally required. That's why death penalty jury selection takes so long because right. most people are disqualified. Uh, SC medic 71. I came here. I come here because YouTube doesn't get any percent of my super chats rather support rumble. Hey, thank you. Um, spatula. Don't forget to vote in the grifties. Keep rackets. Number one, just revere top video on rumble. Fuck YouTube. Hey, awesome. That's great. My lifestyle says, hope you don't go back to YouTube. We'll see. We'll see. SC medic 71 says, feel the rumble. The main thing, by the way, guys, on, on going back to YouTube or not going back to YouTube Right now, there's 469,773 people on YouTube that I can't communicate with directly. I can only communicate with those, the subset of those people who have followed me on another platform. And that's very frustrating. Um, I cannot wait to be able to communicate with them on YouTube and uh, and talk more about the about Rumble and, and, and what we're doing. But that's that's probably 14 days away. Hopefully less, but probably there. So we'll do you see. Know, do you know what the penalty is? I mean, do you know that it's going to be 14 days or do you just suspect? Well, that's a funny story. It's funny you should ask, Steve, because <laughs> so your first strike is a quoting the terms of service, a one week suspension. What does one week mean to you? That's seven days, but you got 10, didn't you? I got 10. Uh, so I got did they 10 deduct days. the extra three from this one? Wouldn't that be nice? No, in fact, uh, apparently my YouTube partner manager has an explanation about my seemingly longer suspension. I replied to her, that's funny. It wasn't seemingly longer. It was demonstrably longer. <laughs> it was 10 days when it says one week. So I don't know if my two-week suspension is actually 14 days or if it's going to be, I don't know, 20. Uh, we'll, we'll see at this point. But um, I, I've... Like, uh, I, I, well now, and also, isn't if you get three strikes, your channel gets deleted three strikes within a, a rolling 90 day window of the first strike. Okay. So, um, so I yeah, mean, that's what, a dangerous thing for a business. It's a very dangerous thing for and a it's business. It's rather arbitrary. Wouldn't you say it's very arbitrary. It's also why I'm like, I, I still think. Uh, I think that my first strike is definitely completely bogus. Like, because I'm, I'm actually within their policy on my first strike a hundred percent. And um, I'm still actually working on getting that one removed prior to the 90 day thing, because it, it's so incorrect that it makes me angry. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm still working on that. This one, I don't know the exact reason, so I, I don't know. But I have a feeling it's in, I have a feeling I'll think it's incorrect. But I know the first one, like legitimately, uh, they changed their policy on showing violent imagery after the George Floyd, uh, after Derek Chauvin and George Floyd. And they basically changed it from you can't show dead people to you can't show dead people for the purposes of causing shock and alarm in your audience. But you can do it as, as like news commentary and stuff like that, which is, that's what I did. I showed a video of a guy getting, he got his neck cut in a mall. It's security cam from really high. And the, the gross part of the video is two things. One, after he gets his neck cut, he's standing there. Like he doesn't even know what happened. And he puts his hand over his neck and like, there's some red spray that hits the ground. And then he, he just falls and dies, right? It was an Australian mall fight. And, and this happened. I've reviewed tons of videos of people getting shot, stabbed, killed, dead, or whatever. I didn't think this would be a problem at all. It's 40 seconds out of a five-hour live stream. 
And YouTube said that I did that for the purposes of shocking and disgusting my audience. That's the policy, which I did not do. And I have no, tons it's... of commentary saying that this is bad. The pride of young men gets young men killed. They need to not, you, you, not engaging in violence is the better option. There's nothing worth this guy dying in this stupid fight that they had. That That's the commentary that I had about it. Hmm. Well, you know, and who is it like, I, I, I know I don't really know anything about this stuff. So this is all neophyte yeah. questions. So if I'm stupid, tell me. But like who is it that you communicate with? I mean, is there an appeal board? Is there a person, a yeah. lawyer? Is there a department? Oh boy. The, so the communication part of it's really interesting. So you write an appeal to a faceless community guidelines entity that uh that reviews your appeal and makes a decision. That's one thing. I have a YouTube partner manager who just said today that my well-being is their priority. So um, so it's very nice. Uh, so I can talk to that person, but they similarly have to talk to the community guidelines group. The community guidelines group is an isolated pillar within YouTube. And the reason it's relatively isolated is because they don't want people having undue influence over community guideline decisions typically in the negative against other creators. Um, but, but it's this insulated thing. So my partner manager sometimes can talk to them and sometimes uh, just can't. It seems, it seems like there's really gotta be some law here. It Wouldn't it be like nice? A law free environment. It is. It is a completely arbitrary environment. And that's, that's just what Which we, is another argument against the death penalty, by the way. <laughs> oh, very, I see what you're doing. It's very arbitrary. Yes. Because where you get the death penalty is completely dependent on geographic location. And it's completely random. The, in Florida, especially, and here's an, this is a legal argument, actually, that we pr pr promote in the public defender's office against that I think is one of our best arguments against the death penalty legally in my appellate briefs. And that is that um, it's called aggravator creep mm -hmm. because you've got, you've got a, a slew first degree murder. You have to have first degree murder in order to have the death penalty, right. but you have to be able to distinguish between regular first degree murder and death penalty qualified first degree murder. You can't just say all all first degree murders are death penalty. Okay, that's under Florida. That's under U.S. Supreme Court case law, right? Well, if you brought me a hundred death first degree murder cases and right. said pick which ones of these are death qualified, which ones are not, there would be no way to distinguish objectively which one would get the death penalty and which one would not, or which one would be eligible for the death penalty and which one would not, because they would all qualify under the aggravator system we have. The aggravator system is supposed to distinguish between death penalty cases and non-death penalty first-degree murders. But if they all qualify because we have aggravator creep in Florida and everything's an aggravator, every death penalty qualifies. So therefore, it's constitutionally infirmed, our current system in Florida. So that, that, that just gives you a taste. That's one of the arguments that we're making. And I think that's the best argument against the Florida death penalty right now. So we have everything's an aggravator. We have too many aggravators. Everything qualifies. And there's no distinguishing between death penalty cases. That's a short, brief version of the big constitutional problem with Florida's death penalty scheme right now. It's good because the constitutional question is that things that are arbitrary and capricious are unconstitutional. You right. have to have a reason for things to occur under law because remember that any application any application of law and every application of law is a deprivation of liberty and uh and they all have to be justified by reason not by random and another um, another issue and right and so that you've got that even if you solve that you still have the arbitrary nature of the geographic location another thing that people don't realize and this is a really strange thing that nobody thinks about OK, but all mm -hmm. this effort we put into appeals, trials and appeals and stuff, and then they load them up on death row. Right. Yep. Now, here's my question to you, Mr. Lawyer, uh Oh, <laughs> or for your office or for your or for your uh, chat people. How tell me what the system is to get the person from death row into the chair? How does that happen? Shoot, I don't know. Uh, exactly. Some. 
some guy comes in uh and he he says all right you're going and then they they walk him to the uh they walk him to the thing but how do they pick who goes first you got 300 people on death row oh shit that's a that's a whole mess i have no idea you know my uh my mom i grew up in texas in houston my mom actually was on a jury that sentenced a guy to death he's out now um mm. and he definitely did it and was definitely guilty like 100 percent uh 100 percent did it 100 percent guilty he he put his he used to work at a mcdonald's he um he robbed the mcdonald's he had his manager go down on his hands and knees put his hand or down on his knees put his hands behind his head and shot him in the back of the head right in the store on surveillance camera uh he was trying to flee to mexico to get in a plane to fly to iran to join the iranian brotherhood or whatever and uh and bring allah to the to the unreasoned heretics in iran that was his whole thing what they used was his um like eventually he was supposed to get executed but then he got stabbed in a prison fight and so they want you got to be healthy before you can get killed by the government so they had to bring him back to health it delayed his execution and then in after that delay they used his pri uh, these uh poetry writings that they had read at trial to prove that he was um that he was crazy but the guy wasn't crazy like he had he had written poetry about joining his brothers in Iran that's that's what he did and uh they then used those to determine he was insane but no but but the this guy like we're talking this guy was in prison on death row for like 20 years who determines who goes first is a really good question well and the answer to this now that you've pondered it and thought about it yeah the answer is it's completely up to the governor so when the governor wants to kill somebody he signs a death warrant. Now, now think about that. That that's pretty sick. I mean, you know, and in fact, remember Governor Clinton, Bill Clinton in Arkansas, wanted to be tough on crime. So Look, he signed I'll a execute death all these motherfuckers. So he pro signed a death warrant on somebody who is mentally disabled, just retarded. Remember that? I don't, but that's yeah. amazing. And so, because he wanted to show how tough he was, so our politician is showing his appeal to bloodlust. Yeah. By signing people that are just lined up on death row, waiting their turn, they could sit there. Like in the most people on death row is in California, but yeah. nobody, but nobody's getting sent because the governor, nobody's going to execute him because the governor's not going to sign any warrants. So right. it's a completely political act. Now think about that: killing people that are all lined up on death row is your governor's political statement to you. Yeah, that's a problem. That's pretty sick. I mean, it I'm, should I'm just, just be a, an F F I F O, right? Like first in, first out. And if if they get an appeal that gets a delay, that puts them farther down the line based on their appeal. But like, it's not the appeal that stops it. Appeals are cut off. They're just sitting there rotting. What happens? The the appellate process happens at the end. There is a post conviction appellate process. As opposed, right. there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of process. But that's not why they're they're just sitting there rotting because the governor hasn't decided to kill anybody yet. So when the governor decides to kill somebody, then he signs a piece of paper. Then, then the appellate office gets involved and they do federal, you know, blockages and try to get injunctions and stuff like that. But really, the fact of the matter is, it's completely arbitrary. It's a political act by your governor. Uh, you know, I'm just yeah. I'm just telling the reality. I mean, this is it's no. a sick part of the system. Which uh, which Clinton signed the death warrant on Seth Rich? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Joe K84. YouTube can go on the wall right next to the other groomers and pedophiles. <laughs> That's right. SC Medic 71. Yes, Rumble is small. And the UI can definitely use some update upgrades, updates, but they are only a baby compared to YouTube. The more we support, the better they will get. That's true. And Rumble's making big improvements. And hey, if uh if if Rumble is willing to listen, I have much insight as a as one of the one of the top grift streamers on the planet. So happy to help him out. And you get a bitter, bigger percentage for rumbles than smart. What do they call them? Then super chats. Yeah. Super chats. Yeah. Mike's Voboda. Don't forget to subscribe on rumble. Absolutely. Subscribe on rumble. Rumble username suck. Hey, Nick, can you use your poll with rumble? I have a poll with locals. I don't have pull with rumble yet, but stay tuned but guys. So, uh, j again, a brief aside on this, um, People who are like, oh, you should have been on Rumble the whole time. I, I've alluded to this multiple times. When you have, 
and this is weird to me to say this. this is not an arrogance thing, but I have a show that generates a shitload of money, not something I ever planned for or thought would happen, but it, I, I just do. And it's valuable and desirable to a streaming platform because it brings people who bring money to it. Okay. When you have that, you have leverage and lawyers always think in leverage. Uh, you have leverage to do something bigger than just showing up. And so that's, I've been working with Rumble on things for a very long time, and you may see some movement on it very soon. It's just sick, though, that, I mean, that this Google can, can like, you know, this is your business. It's, it's like, okay, so let's assume that you've got Google, well, Microsoft Word, and Microsoft Word doesn't like what you're writing on their software program, so they yeah. shut your software program down because yes. they, they, you know, it's like, and Word's the only word processor. Yep. It's you know, how does that work? It's it's a utility, and you've based your your business model on it. They can't just rip that. It's probably a better one would be, or uh, you know, what would be like a software? You've got a CNC machine, and you've bought this big CNC machine that has AutoCAD on it. Yeah. And AutoCAD doesn't like it because you're making ghost parts for guns. So they shut your CNC machine. Well, you bought the CNC machine, you invested all this money and set up this warehouse to build mill receivers for ARs. And now they just set up, we don't like what you're doing. We're going to take your software away and you can't run your machine anymore. Did you see, uh, this isn't politically related or anything, but did you see that BMW is now having a, you have to pay a monthly service subscription for I your heard, heated I guess seats. I did see that, yeah. That's crazy. That is crazy. That's, that's crazy. Rumble username suck. Hi, Nick. Can you use your, oh, wait, yeah. To get them to improve the chat, I expect they'll earn way more money if it's easier to engage the chats. Yes, that will be, uh, as as I talk more and more with Rumble, and um, that'll, be, that'll be a priority for me, of course, because that helps the grift. Critical. Your Rumble viewers are almost as high as YouTube. Rumble is taking off. If Google removes it from the app store, any chance of an antitrust suit? Yes, because YouTube has such a high video market share. It would be an antitrust suit because, yeah, they're direct competitor. And uh, and removing them for some sort of – what what app store uh, term has Rumble violated? Like what what thing would it be? They might be the perfect catalyst for it. I hope it doesn't happen, though. Roy Rat, Nick, congrats on the huge numbers on Rumble tonight. Can I get another push for my channel? It's tarantula feeding time, and I need 100 subs to go live. That's rumble.com forward slash user forward slash Roy Rat, R-O-I-R-A-T-T. -T. He feeds tarantulas on videos. Check it out. Apprende con flowers. Keep up the great work. Let me know if you want me to make you something for your little ones. Instagram.com uh, forward slash naughty flowers. Uh, a Prende Con Flowers, I think knits or crochets, really, really fun stuff, guys. Check her out. Jay Cornman, 24, can we give some love to Rumble for giving us a true free speech platform down with the YouTube Monopoly? Yes, we can. Spatula, don't chop off the little guy. Great advice. Don't chop that off. You like him. He likes you back. Roy Rat, Nick, tonight's vid is my friend Becky firing the five, uh, 50 cal Smith and West or 500 Smith and West and Magnum when I lived in Alaska. It's funny. Need 100 subs on Rumble so I can do a late, late live stream. Rumble.com forward slash a whole bunch of shit. I can't read all that. That's too many letters. Great loner. I declare that Lucar Roberts is a faggot and is as worthless as their cock and balls are not just to their family, but to society at large, to all the trannies watching this, cope, sneed, and dilate. Damn, great loner. That was a very offensive super chat that you just sent, or rumble rant. Uh, can't, couldn't read that one on YouTube. Airplane Arm says, thanks, Nick. You're welcome. My Lifestyle says, wish for a better future. Uh, Revenant465, St. Stephen was also the first martyr of Christianity. Yeah, you mentioned that. Apprentice on Flowers, are we going to do an unbreaded tonight? Yes, we did. Uh, Joshimo one of three. Thankful to see two men with chests, according to the C.S. Lewis definition. Congrats to Steve on his college kid. Yeah, congrats, by the way. Thank you. Nick's gay lover. You get a larger <laughs> cut of Rumble rants compared to Super Chat, so I can only tip a dollar, and it's pretty much the same for you as a $2 Super Chat? No. <laughs> Everything's coming up Millhouse. No, it's not it at all. Nick's hacks. 
a bit late on this, but check your bad IM ear for uh, wax. No, there's, there's, uh, I did. I've had the same pay, uh, pair for five years, and the only time I've experienced complete mutinous is wax buildup. Cleaning it, fix it immediately. I have fully cleaned it. Um, there's, there's something on the inside, but I'm gonna get new IEM soon anyway. I'm not super worried, and I'll get these. Uh, I'm gonna send them to Sherry and get them fixed once I get my new ones. Crusader says, "Allah's peace be upon this public defender." He also says, "When you give Branca's book to Binger, make sure you scream at him. Where's your shame? Where's your shame in the face of Allah?" Joshma one of three. Steve took a nap for Nick on breaded wrestler town at 2000 likes. One shot of military special for each binger. Uh, we're not going to get there guys. We're not even going to get to the 1500. I am a little sad about that. We're at, we're at almost 1200. Uh, SC medic 71, Nick Olback, John Lieb, Liebart. Biden's speech was so awful. Pedo Hitler is trending with 124,000 tweets even some mainstream media tweeted out concern about the divisiveness. John Liebert, Nick's like Nick likes power metal. Steve likes metal core. Check out Hannaby and Crystal Lake if you like ginger. Okay, wait, wait. I want to read that one again. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to I'm going to spell them for you. Hannaby is H A N A B I E, mm -hmm. and the other one is Crystal Lake. All right, thank you. I love I love good suggestions, so I appreciate that. I will check it out. All right, here we go. Mendelssohn Violin can, uh, from Roy Rat. Mendelssohn Violin Concerto Movement 3, metal slash electronic arrangement. This is the most metal classical composer ever. And he has a YouTube video, but I'm not going to read the link out. That's weird. <laughs> Joe Schmo, one of three, says Gosney is the base is the based lower. Base, like B-A-S-S -S based. Oh. <laughs> uh, wrestler town. I'm going to bet that the lack of likes or people watching on rumble apps instead of browsers. My TV app has no way to like or see chat. No, that's fine. I'm just disappointed in all of you. Uh, no one to use as the word communism is a derogatory term co coined by a socialist named Louis Blanc. Mark used Marx used it later. Later. Lieutenant Hobbit. Yo rackets. Was it the stream with Duncan that got you canned? Nope. It was my stream stream talking about Keffels and Kiwi farms. If so, guess monetizing map sympathizers isn't great for the grift. Down but far from out. No, the Dungan stream is still up and it's fully fine. It's, it's monetized even. It's uh, it's great. Afix. Steve needs a masked alter ego for real talking. Lucha Libre style, I vote he's called Speeve. What? Like you wear a mask, so it's not oh, you? Oh, yeah. Like, no one yeah, can... Like the, the, remember the Super Destroyers? Yeah, you're... Like the, uh, rest, old wrestling... Right. It's it's like that, but you'd have plausible deniability to say what you want to say and, and say all of the racial slurs or whatever. No, I, actually, this is pretty much, I mean, I, I try to be, this is pretty much. I'm I'm completely, you do not strike me as someone who walks around screaming slurs. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no, I don't believe, well, I don't know. It's, you know, people that are race obsessed. I had somebody tell me like the other day, <laughs> well, I, I, a couple years ago, when my son was 15, they were talking about something. They're like, well, you would understand. You have a biracial child. And I said, I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because you said I had, your wife's from the Philippines. For 15 years, I hadn't realized it. You know, it's like, for, for and, and the thing is, is that if you've got children, you have, what kind of parent? If you were going to say, if you're going to list 100 qualities about your child, would race be on any of those? No. It's like, come on. When I look at my friends, do I say, oh, that's my black friend, my white friend, my green friend, my, you know, it's. Well, I, I do only because people accuse me of being racist. So I have to count the number of black ones that yeah, I Yeah, well, see, that that's the thing. How do you prove you're not guilty, right? Prove yourself <laughs> innocent. No, but it's ridiculous because um, well, oh, the racial thing is such garbage. Oh, yeah. It's, it's equal protection under the law. That's what I believe in. Well, Individuals. See, I, I was born in Houston, Texas and grew up not, not in the wealthy areas of it at all. And I was in my elementary schools, I was the minority, like very much the minority. And then when I moved to Minnesota, I'm like 98% majority, but it, it was weird to me to be that way. Like it was, it was strange. It was a new encounter. And I've always like, I, I don't care what anybody looks like. Well, unless they're fat, I do care about that. But uh, other than that, like, I've, I I don't care what color people are. I don't care anything about that. I'm like, are you funny? Are you, are you in engaging and entertaining? That's, that's it. Um, 
Lieutenant no, Hobbit. If somebody's, if somebody's a thug and a jerk and not nice and they've got a chip on their shoulder, I don't like them. Right. Well, oh, be like me, though. Lieutenant Hobbit says, time to become the biggest grifter on Rumble Nikki. Crusader says, oh, Allah, the most high, find your enemy, the corrupt Soros prosecutors and destroy them. Oh, Allah, the most merciful, count their heads one by one and do not spare a single one of them. Thank you to Crusader. And CL Hunter says, hi, Nick, here's my first Rumble rant. Thank you, CL Hunter. Well, there you go, Steve. That's the end of the Rumble rants. Let's, well, that's let's wrap awesome. this thing up. It's let's way wrap too it up, man. I'm, you know, my wife just got up for work. <laughs> Oh, uh, tell her my humblest apologies and my greatest gratitude for her uh, being understanding about you coming on here and hanging out with us for so long. Hey, it was a blast. And I really look forward. I'm really glad I got to kind of get to know you. And I know Bronca speaks highly of you. And um, and we'll we'll do it like what we need to do is once you get back in operation, um, we'll do the Kelly case in full. And it'll give yeah. us another another reason to grift <laughs> well and and that and like you're you're a welcome person around here so if you have if you have anything that you ever want to talk about just let me know because uh happy to, i'm always happy to have guests and i i i'm bad about reaching out and saying hey will you come on and spend hours of your life uh on my stupid show but um but it's it's a, it's always a blast so if, if anything ever comes up and you're like you know what this is a florida case or a florida law or whatever or not that I really want to talk about, or you just want to talk about heavy metal for a while. We can do that. Hey, too. now we're talking now. Now we're like, we're like, actually, I want to hear some ginger. I'll watch your things. And I want to hear a ginger report and some future rumble video. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll do a ginger report. All, All right. right, guys. Uh, Steve, thanks for hanging out chat. We'll see you um, probably Monday here on rumble and probably on odyssey on Monday as well. Y'all have a good night. Peace. Good night. Peace. Oh, he drinks a fair bit, but you realize that it just helps get his noggin jogging along with his glass by his side and his kids asleep tight. We'll hear some lost planning tonight. With his microphone muted, we'll laugh at this boomer until he explains it's all part of the plan. Watch his face become redder as he becomes madder. Raging at idiots from Twitter and Berlin. From the white shores of Maine to the hills of Glenlivet, there's no one who's playing the law better than Nick. So pour out a glass for the ones who have passed to make the law what we have now. His lady is fair, and she handles herself with the grace of one who has borne many children. As the wife of a lawman, she makes sure that he has the time and the place to provide for them there. So pour out an art bag of Balmor and Lovebrook. The spirits flow as the ones who get on a new boat. So pour out a glass for the tea post on Twitter, as we hear us planning tonight. From the white shores of Nan to the hills of Glen Levitt, there's no one who explains the dawn better than me. So pour out a glass for the ones who have passed to make the law what we have now. Oh, the guests are all plentiful, from Doug Tate to Drexel. They bring their perspective and spice to the mix. But the reason we're here and the one that we cheer is the one who is showcasing us his career.
Pour out a glass for the ones who have passed To make the love of 